Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 12 p.m. session of the March 23rd, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are, you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Here. Kalantari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Um, Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? And I am here. Thank you. I want to start today with uh, some mayoral proclamations. And I'm going to start off with uh, the mayoral proclamation declaring March as Red Cross Month. And I will go ahead and just read a few lines from the um, proclamation here. All right. And I believe uh, Megan Irk is here from the Red Cross. So hi, Megan, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Whereas American Red Cross Month is a special time to honor the kindness of our neighbors who aid families in need every day in Santa Cruz County, across the United States and around the world, their dedication touches millions of lives each year as they carry out the organization's 140 year mission of preventing and alleviating suffering. And whereas during the trying times of the coronavirus pandemic, people have stepped up to help others in need whether it was responding to this year's record-breaking disasters across the country or rolling up their sleeves to give blood when our country faced a severe blood shortage. And whereas here in Santa Cruz County, local families have relied on Central Coast chapter volunteers for comfort and hope while coping with wildfires and floods. As a recent example, in response to the evacuation of some 15,000 people in the Central Coast area, due to the dangerously wet and windy storms, the Red Cross mobilized 100 disaster responders to support those in need. And in the following days, following the evacuation orders, the Red Cross and its partners provided more than 1,200 total overnight stays in hotel accommodations for those that were displaced, provided 2,655 meals and snacks to those who forced to evacuate their homes, and made more than 100 67 individual care contacts to support the health and mental health needs of those affected. And whereas the Central Coast chapter volunteers also helped 18 whole households affected by home fires in Santa Cruz County by addressing their urgent needs such as food, lodging, and recovery support. And whereas this life-saving work is vital to strengthening our community's resilience. Nearly 200 years since the birth of American Red Cross founder, Clara Barton, we dedicate this month of March to all those who continue to advance her noble legacy, and we ask others to join in their commitment to care for people in need. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2021 as Red Cross Month in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all Americans to reach out and support its humanitarian mission. So Megan, thank you for being here. I don't know if you have any words or any anything today to add, but um, we just want to, of course, honor the work of the Red Cross. You're an incredibly important organization in our community and have been um, for, for as long as I can remember, I think my first interaction was after the earthquake. So um, the work that you do is tremendous. And uh, I know also many Red Cross volunteers who provide, you know, find working with as a Red Cross volunteer is one of the most rewarding volunteer um, uh, 
you know, experiences that people can have in their lifetime. So I see a number of people nodding. I'm not sure if anyone from the Red Cross would like to say anything today, but please do. Thank you, Mayor. And I also um, am joined by the chair of the Central Coast Board, Dan Loeb, who would like to say a few words, and Camilla Bulletin as well. Um, just want to thank you so much for your kind words, and um, we are honored to be able to work in, in the Santa Cruz community. Thank you. Dane? Thank you, uh, Mayor, for acknowledging the Red Cross Month. This is a, a huge compliment to our organization, and we really appreciate being partners with the city of Santa Cruz. Every year, year in, year out, we have volunteers from the city who step up in people's time of greatest need and commit their free time to help their neighbors. And I, I'm grateful to be a volunteer for the Red Cross and honored to be the chair of the board. And I can tell you from the board chair position, the city of Santa Cruz means so much to the Red Cross and all the citizens in Santa Cruz matter. And I, I also recall back, uh, in the 89 earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, how important the Red Cross's role was during that major disaster. Uh, but it's the, it's the home fires that uh, affect people, and the Red Cross is gonna be there to help those victims uh, on a daily basis. So when someone is displaced, uh, whether it's a single family or a multiple family, we're gonna be there for them and we really appreciate anyone from the city of Santa Cruz stepping up and volunteering, volunteering to be a member of the Red Cross, whether it's a blood donation or joining our uh, disaster preparedness group. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dave. And Camilla, did you have some words to say as well? No, basically I'm just here because we have the most amazing volunteers and we uh, are just so fortunate because there are 90% of the, uh, the people that participate with the Red Cross, they're volunteers. So our workforce is 90% volunteers and this is just an example of the wonderful people that we have and they're people that live in our communities who are there during the most tragic times in people's lives and we're so grateful that you're honoring us but we're also grateful for all the amazing people that step up day in and day out to support our community and we're so grateful for your support thank you thank you and thank you for being here today and definitely for everything you do for our community thank you thank you thanks for joining us also we appreciate it thank you bye, -bye. take care Okay, we've got two more folks, uh, I mean, excuse me, two more um, proclamations. Um, I'll just read from these as well, just very briefly, because um, they're fitting with uh, Clara, Barton, Clara Barton's uh, legacy as well. So uh, next we have a mayoral proclamation uh, declaring March 30, excuse me, March 24th, 2021 as Equal Pay Day. Um, and this uh, proclamation is, whereas more than 50 years after the passage of the Equal Pay Act, women, especially minority women, continue to suffer the consequences of unequal pay. And whereas according to the U.S. Census Bureau, women working full-time year-round in 2018 typically earned 81.6% of what men earned, indicating little change or progress on pay equity. And whereas according to graduating to a pay gap, a 2012 research report by the American Association of University Women, the gender pay is evident one year after college graduation, even after controlling for factors known to affect earnings such as occupation, hours worked, and college major. And whereas in 2009, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was signed into law, which gives back to employees their day in court to challenge a pay gap. And now we must pass the Pay Check Fairness Act, which would amend the Equal Pay Act by closing loopholes and improving the law's effectiveness. And whereas according to one estimate, college educated women working full term time earn more than half a million dollars less than their male peers do over the course of a lifetime. 
And whereas nearly four in 10 mothers are primary breadwinners in their household and nearly two thirds are primary or significant earners making pay equity critical to the family's economic security. And whereas a lifetime of lower pay means women have less income to save for retirement and less income counted in a social security or pension benefit formula. And whereas fair pay equity policies can be implemented simply and without undue cost or hardship in both the public and private sectors. And whereas fair pay strengthens the security of families today and eases future retirement costs while enhancing the American economy. And whereas March 24th symbolizes the time in 2021 when the wages paid to American women catch up to the wages paid to the men from the previous year. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim March 24th, 2021 as Equal Pay Day in the City of Santa Cruz. And um, I think after all of the, um, the data that's coming out about the number of women who have lost their jobs due to COVID-19 and the shift, um, really a decadal shift that will impact women um, from COVID-19, um, probably the most we've seen in many of our lifetimes. I think that is uh, an especially important proclamation to spend a few minutes reading through. We have still have work to do in so many ways. And then finally, we have a proclamation today to um, recognize in um, Women's History Month, and I'll just do very quickly, uh, whereas women of every race, class, cultural, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to our communities, nation, and world in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. And whereas women have played and continue to play a critical role in every sphere of life by constituting a significant portion of the labor force, both inside and outside of the home, as well as sustainers of tradition and social cohesion. And whereas women have served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive social change movement, not only in advancing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist, emancipation, labor, civil rights, peace, and environmental movements. And whereas there is a long, impressive record of local activism to support the rights, opportunities, and contributions of women from the early appearance of suffrage activist Susan B. Anthony in Santa Cruz in 1869, to the development of the Feminist Studies Department at the University of California at Santa Cruz, along with outstanding contributions by local women in virtually every area of human endeavor. And whereas despite these contributions, the diversity of women's achievements and importance has been consistently overlooked in most mainstream approaches to history. And whereas history helps us understand who we are and recognizing the achievements of women across the full spectrum of endeavors, science, community, government, arts, sports, medicine, environment, education, economy, and more, has a huge impact on the development of self-respect and opportunities for girls and young women. And on March 8th, International Women's Day is observed to honor the achievements of women throughout history and around the world, and to serve as a focal point in the movement for women's rights and gender parity. And whereas annually since 1978, the month of March has been observed as Women's History Month in the United States, this year has also marked an historic milestone of women's leadership 232 years in the making with the inauguration of America's first woman vice president. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2021 as Women's History Month in the City of Santa Cruz. So thanks, Council, to uh, let it give, in us a few, give me a few minutes to read through those. I think it's a really timely set of, um, of uh, proclamations and uh, the, the stories actually interweave quite quite nicely, and obviously we're really thrilled to have our first woman vice president and our first woman and our first woman vice president of color, which is also an amazing feat in, in this year, 232 years later. So um, I will move on to um, the uh, few announcements that we will have. Um, I'll, a few announcements and then we'll move into the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only for items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. 
The items that will be open for public comment during today's meetings are numbers 10 through 26 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. None, okay. I'd like to ask the city clerk administrator to announce any additions or deletions to the agenda. There are none. Okay. Um, for oral communications today, uh, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item 26 today. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 26. Uh, next is our city attorney report on closed session. I'd like to call on, city, on the city attorney to provide rep a report on closed session. And I believe uh, Ms. Bronson is here today. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm here today in place of Tony, who is out of town. Uh, for the first item on our closed session agenda, public employ employment, um, the city council met in closed session with Terry Black and company, the recruiting firm that will be assisting the city with the city manager recruitment process over the next few months. The council discussed the process and timeline for the recruitment, which will include soliciting community and stakeholder input and public outreach. More details will be made available as the process moves forward. Uh, the second item on the closed session agenda was uh, number two, real property negotiations. Uh, the council met with its real property negotiator to discuss potential sale of city-owned property known as parking lot 11 and a small undeveloped parcel on the corner of Laurel and Front Streets. Designated in the Santa Cruz County Assessor's parcel numbers 005-151-48 and 005-151-35. Uh, for the third item, which was a conference with legal counsel, uh, existing litigation, the council received a report from legal counsel on two items of pending litigation. The cases are Santa Cruz Homeless Union versus the City of Santa Cruz, pending in the United States D District Court, and Don't Morph the War versus the City which is pending in the Santa Cruz Superior Court. And there was no reportable action taken on those cases. Thank you. Next, we'll have the uh, city manager report. I'd like to call on Martine Bernal, our city manager, to report and provide updates on city events and business events. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Item. Thank you, Martine. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. I wanted to uh, actually have uh, Lee Butler and Jason Hyduke, our uh, planning director and the homelessness director and uh, our fire chiefs to do updates on the pandemic and also to talk about the Highway 1 and 9 uh, situation. I'll first have, have uh, Lee uh, provide an update and then uh, Jason can follow. Thank you. Thank you, Martine, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, just quickly, we are continuing to coordinate with Caltrans and um, CHP, as well as the county, on the Highway 1 and 9 situation. The, the Caltrans crew recognizes the safety hazards that are present in that area, and they are taking the lead in the approach for making sure that everyone um, can be moved to out of that, that dangerous location. Um, we have been um, working um, in coordination with Caltrans and the uh, county, or excuse me, Caltrans and um, the CHP on uh, trash removal out there. And tomorrow we have the next in that series of um, shoulder closures and um, dumpsters being available. Um, we have paid staff out at that location to assist. And um, we've also been fortunate and appreciate the um, number of volunteers who have uh, been out to help make those uh, cleanup efforts a success. And finally, um, the vaccinations um, of unsheltered individuals has commenced. Uh, the county has started um, offering those vaccinations, including to um, individuals at Highway 1 and 9. So that's it for the update at this point, and happy to have questions after Jason's completed his update as well. Thank you, Lee. Welcome, Jason. 
Chief Haidu. <laughs> Mayor, City Council, uh, Jason Hyduke, and I'm uh, going to give a brief presentation on COVID. I'm um, going to follow the format that I've been using for the last uh, uh, couple of meetings. Um, so as you can see, this is from the County Health Department uh, website. Our case numbers continue to drop dramatically, and uh, that is really good news for the entire community. Um, this will be updated um, daily in the afternoon, but uh, from the call this morning, we are headed in the right direction as far as our overall cases uh, within the county, uh, and that is a continued trend that uh, we want to keep up. Next slide, please. And as part of that uh, trend, uh, one, of, one of the reasons that um, all these restrictions and the push to get vaccinations uh, out was to reserve our healthcare capacity. And the good news is, is we've gone from uh, close to 100 people in the hospitals with COVID to single digits. Um, and so the, the ability to care for people with COVID um, is there, but just as importantly, the ability to care for people who have non-COVID related healthcare um, that could have been displaced is there. So uh, currently uh, within our county, we're doing very well with the overall number of people that um, are being treated for COVID and hopefully we can keep that up. Next slide. So this is also from uh, the county as well as the state. And if you look at the overall state uh, metrics, uh, they have a 2.3 positivity rate for the last seven days. Here within the county of Santa Cruz, we're at 1.2. So we are doing very good in comparison uh, to our counterparts uh, across the state. And this is gonna be a significant uh, driver of what happens next when it comes to moving from one tier to the other. Uh, currently, uh, we are in the metrics of uh, the red, red tier, and all indications are that next week we will move into the orange tier. Uh, I believe today that San Francisco and Marin will be moving into that orange tier, which is less restrictive. Um, it doesn't mean we can let our guard down, but it does mean that we can get back to a little bit more normal than what we've had. Uh, one thing that is changing a little bit within these metrics is it's not just the overall positivity rate or the case count. They are also balancing this against, against the number of vaccinations that have been distributed. And so as those vaccines, that number rises within the community, the metrics that they're using for the positivity rate and the case counts will actually grow because they're uh, drawing from a smaller sample size. So we're getting close to having uh, that ne next metric of uh, moving toward the orange tier as vaccinations are rolled out. Um, and that's really good news for um, all of us. Next slide. So really the path out of this, um, besides our current practices are going to be vaccines and the vaccination process, um, I'm sure all of you have shared some frustration, uh, both in the rollout and the communication of it. Um, so what I'm going to tell everyone here on the city council as well as, as, well as the public who are listening is go to santacruzhealth.org. Um, it is uh, the best collection point that I've been able to find for communicating who can get vaccinated right now, but just as importantly, where to get vaccinated. And it has all the different mechanisms, whether that's through public health, through Kaiser Permanente, through Sutter, Dignity, Salud, Salud Para La Gente, uh, the, home, the uh, HP, HP project. It has a listing of all the different outlets, uh, including you know CVS and Rite Aid, and soon to be potentially Costco, of where you can go to get vaccinated and the parameters for who's included in that. So again, santacruzhealth.org, uh, and they have uh, a really comprehensive listing uh, that can show uh, where you get those vaccine. And I would urge everyone uh, to um, regularly check that, uh, depending where you fall within the community, age, underlying health conditions. Next slide. So again, uh, we're not done with this. I know we're all tired. Uh, we're at the end of a very a grueling um, year, and we have a little bit more to go. Um, so we need to continue to do those things that will prevent this disease so that those graphs that we that I showed you at the beginning keep going in the direction that we want them to go. So wash your hands, wear your mask, keep your distance, stay home if you're sick, and just as importantly, go to santacruzhealth.org and uh, look at where you can get a vaccine. Um, there's a number of places that are not requiring that you're a member of that um, healthcare organization, and you can still get vaccinated if you fit within the guidelines that are put out by public health. Great. Thank you, Chief Hedrick. Um, Martine, is there any other updates today, or can I take questions from council members? Uh, yes, it, the questions would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Questions? 
from council members. Uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for uh, that presentation. I was just wondering if there's any update on any potential reimbursements that we might be able to, that we might be eligible for for the management of the Highway 1 and 9 encampment in particular, uh, just given that that's on Caltrans. And I, I, if I heard correctly, I know there was a fire there last week and there's like the ongoing management maintenance, you know, um, uh, refuse uh, collection and just wondering if we're gonna be able to recoup any of those funds um, for having to manage this for such an extensive amount of time. I can speak to the, the trash collection services. We are um, tracking our costs. We don't have any updates in terms of whether or not Caltrans um, will um, cover any of those additional direct costs. Um, and um, I'll, I'll let Jason speak to the fires and any applicable reimbursements there. So council member uh, Cummings, uh, my understanding of the FEMA reimbursement, uh, this is uh, one of the challenges of being a city that has um, issues uh, that are larger than our municipality, but not large enough to fit within the reimbursement process. A lot of what you hear about FEMA reimbursement for COVID um, is directly related to uh, healthcare uh, for COVID. And the fact that someone is homeless or housed uh, doesn't necessarily fall within that uh, equation. And so our ability to get recruitment for that would really be at the direction of our county health officer and it has to be specific to COVID. Um, as for fires, uh, we, we had another fire incident in that location yesterday. We've had uh, a number of uh, fire incidents, um, some more significant than others. And it's obviously a concern uh, not only for the um, people that are there, but also the entire community. Uh, we are trying to work with our partners uh, to mitigate those uh, within the confines of the COVID restrictions for displacing people. Great, and then I one more question. I'm taking some notes and not sure if I missed this, but um, is is there anywhere on the, the county's website or state's website to see how many vaccines have gone out in, in Santa Cruz County? Yes. And I just asked so that we can have an understanding of you know how, what percentage of our population has been vaccinated. Yeah, so um, th there's two different numbers uh, that are shown. One of them is on the health, the health services agency, the Santa Cruz Health, and it shows the number of health uh, vaccines uh, given to the health uh, department and then the number of distributed. Um, that is a smaller percentage of the overall vaccines that have been given out because of the multi-county entities like Dignity, Camp, Sutter, um, and then uh, the last time, the last number I got was we're well over 110,000 vaccines distributed here within the county, and uh, per capita within the state, we are number six uh, of the of the 58 counties for vaccine dis uh, distribution. Um, I don't have a specific count for you, but I do believe the county or the uh, state website for COVID you can uh, drill down to each county that shows those overall numbers. Um, the healthcare agency is showing what they've distributed and the state is showing what has been distributed within that county as a whole. Great, thank you. Any other council member with questions? Yeah. And Mayor, I did have uh, actually one other item that uh, I forgot I, we we're gonna give you an update on and that is the sidewalk vendors. So I was gonna ask Ralph uh, Demericut if he could just do a brief update on that. And what I might maybe do just real quick, Martine, also just so council and the public listening, um, I do wanna also just recognize that um, Senator uh, Laird's office has been also very helpful with the one and nine encampment. They are part of the team that is in regular con con uh, conversation weekly with Caltrans. So I just wanna recognize our, our uh, help with Senator Laird's office on the one and nine issue as well. And Ralph, thanks for being here, Ralph. Um, and I will get my PowerPoint uh, slide up. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Myers and Council. So it's the update um, for you guys on um, how we're doing with the sidewalk spending um, on Beach Street. Um, it's gonna go over the timeline and summary really fast and um, where things are currently and the next steps we're planning on taking. Um, this was the uh, original direction of staff, and it was to work with community bridges to find a more structured and equitable system that would accommodate beach area vending. Here's um, the timeline um, of the um, actions we've taken. The gray is um, the actions um, I shared with you at the previous update. Um, 
in blue are new um, actions that have been taken since then. And um, February 9 was the uh, last update to council. Uh, about a week after that, um, vending prohibited signs were posted along Beach Street just to um, inform um, the community and um, those who were planning on vending at the beach foot. Um, the regulations were with executive order that was passed. And then we have a meeting scheduled with community bridges um, in a couple of days. Um, this is a signage that's been posted along Beach Street and it's in both English and Spanish. Um, so currently we're finalizing an administrative process with planning and parks and rec. It's uh, a new process for us and um, we're working uh, closely with community bridges to make sure that the process is fair for everyone involved. Um, we're continuing our outreach efforts and um, making sure that everyone will um, have a really good understanding of what the application process will be, when they'll be due, and all of that. Um, and we're also working with PD and multiple departments on um, on-site outreach efforts to make sure that um, you know vendors that are going up, that are popping up there right now understand that it is prohibited and that we have an executive order in place to um, uh, to really um, uh, make sure people's health and safety are prioritized. And um, what is new is um, we're working with the um, ideal uh, barn grill down, down there to finalize vending sites. Um, and so um, we realized uh, in the process that the city actually had a 25-year-old agreement um, with ideal barn grill on that patio. Um, so that was new that we were working with. Um, it, in, um, Ideal Bar and Grill contributed to the construction of the um, public deck. And um, a part of that agreement um, was for the city to um, not issue any permits uh, or licenses or business licenses um, on that um, patio deck. However, the Senate bill does override um, that. And so we've been in communication with Ideal Bar and Grill to let them know that you know they are um, legally um, able to exercise this. And if they do, we won't. Um, issue any permits or licenses at this location. However, if we do that, then um, we may not be able to regulate, you know, any vendors that may want to pop up there. Um, so um, they uh, have been, um, we've been in close communication with them and we're going to work on some kind of compromise that works for both parties and um, make sure that um, we have a really good um, path moving forward. Um, this was the original um, sort of sketch as to where the vending sites would be. And um, sites six, five, and four, um, we're working with Ideal um, to find a new location for. Um, one, two, and three, um, they felt comfortable moving forward with. So um, I, I'm very confident that we could find a compromise with Ideal Barn Grill and move forward um, this season. And this is sort of just zooming out as to uh, the location we're, we're talking about. Um, so the next step is to really communicate the process and current regulations to the public, um, navigate through a new administrative process, um, and working with community bridges on um, the whole application um, situation with um, vendors, and um, then issue permits for sign spaces. And this being a really new process for staff and, and the public, um, and the state even, um, we wanna to continue to evaluate and respond as necessary. And um, we understand that this is gonna be changing as we go along. And it may look different next year or even this, this season, but um, we're definitely just moving forward and trying to make sure we find a, a better process for both the public and um, the city uh, this summer. And uh, that's my update. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ralph. Is there questions from council members? Council member Cummings? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just curious, is this gonna come back to council at some point for final adoption of the ordinance that would allow for people to, to sell in certain areas or is this just gonna be something that um, staff will approve and then we'll just have to get the word out to the public? Uh, currently, um, we have Unicode that allows the um, park and rec director to determine um, bending on park and rec property. And um, that allows us to move forward without having to go, having to go through council. Um, you know, but I will leave it up to um, maybe our city manager and the council to determine if that's something you guys do want to bring back and have a, 
have a discussion on. Um, but we do have a unit code right now that does allow staff to, to move forward with determining the sites. Okay, I think um, maybe, I mean, just a recommendation from just what we've heard from the community over the course of the past couple of years, it might be, even if it's an informational item, to have a standalone informational item so that the community can see that that topic's gonna to be on our agenda and, and get a sense of where we've kind of gotten to with it. I know that we, um, you know, get communication still with people asking what's happening and um, given that it's kind of a topic that comes up within the city manager report, um, it's not clear from any community members when this is this topic is coming up and when it's being discussed. And I know at one point a couple weeks ago there was murmurs of protests going on um, in in front of council member houses who um, voted for us, who voted to go in this direction of creating this community process. So just to, I think as a way for us to engage with the community and demonstrate that we are moving forward, we are creating a process. You know, we have not forgotten about this. It might be good if there's even just an informational presentation at some point on this topic. And then uh, the other question I had was going back to what I've brought up in the past, which is around uh, the Salsa Santa Cruz and is, has anything been worked out with them? Because I know that they use the site uh, on Sundays during the summer when it's nice out. And so that's a big draw. And I know for many businesses in those areas, um, that draws in a lot of people. And it's a really kind of joyful community event. And so I was just wondering if, if there have been any discussions with them and if they're going to need to move or, or what have you. Um, I, I think currently stand on park and rec are taking a really uh, big um, leadership role in determining um, in, in working with us on the permitting system and that allows us to really look at special events at this site throughout next year and that's something they are including in their um, sort of formula as to um, how the permits will be um, uh, will be regulated and and um, kind of put out there. Um, salsa dancing is one of the major events that they that they do have in their annual calendar and that they're being, um, that we're keeping in there for this season um, to make sure that, you know, permit holders understand that there will be special events at this site and that um, vending during those days may be limited. Um, uh, what, what is um, positive, or some good news about that is salsa dancing usually occurs for a few hours um, on, on one day. So I think there's a, definitely a way where we could still do both uh, and um, have vendors and salsa dancers share the space. Great, thanks. And then uh, just one last point to, you know, having some kind of informational presentation come back. I also think it'd be good for us to be able to thank Community Bridges for all the support that they've provided with this process. And so, you know, as this kind of wraps up, if we can, get, you know, whether we have to provide direction or not, but if we can have some kind of presentation to show the community process that's been involved and really thank our community partners, I think it'd be really beneficial overall. Thanks. Thank you. Any other council members with questions at all? Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Martine, and your staff for that um, update. I'll go ahead and move on to um, call on the clerk to provide any updates to the city council calendar. We have no updates. Okay. Okay, we'll now move on to item number nine, which is city memberships and city groups and outside agencies. And this is the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. For future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred during the last council meeting so that the council and the public can be informed. So I will go ahead and I'm just gonna call on you from my perspective of seeing you on the screen. So um, I'll start with uh, council member Watkins. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I'm trying to find the notes that I have. I'll keep my... the takeaways from that meeting. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around different, uh, different policy changes that could be instituted countywide, particularly as it relates to equity and 
trust building, training, um, race relations, et cetera. And um, just as somebody who's been connected to the CJC for, for a very long time through my other position in education, it was it's really delightful to see an opening to want to explore how this body can uh, take on uh, different topics uh, in addition to always in the past prioritizing and continuing to prioritize gang prevention. So we had an opportunity to hear from the various jurisdictions about what they are doing in terms of some of the um, kind of de-escalation and 21st century practice policing and some updates and then some potential suggestions and efforts to, to move forward. And, and I will encourage our other council member, uh, council member coming who's been really involved in this to share any additional updates as he sees fit. Um, I believe Councilmember Calentar Johnson will be reporting on our community programs committee and there's an agenda item in the packet today that really, I think, covers most of what we did. So um, that you probably already know about. Uh, lastly, our public safety committee meeting and we will be bringing forward a um, kind of a work plan item to the full council for input and suggestions and hopeful um, approval of as we move forward with thinking about how we as a committee can um, best, best move forward with some of our public safety efforts. And in addition, we had an opportunity to review some of our uh, crime and activity statistics report. And then other than that, I'd say, you know, the farmer's market continue to shop there, shop safely and support our farmer's market and our vendors. And, um, and they have instituted similar policies as others who serve us in essential services in terms of uh, wearing masks and, um, and really respecting some of the guidelines that our uh, health department has put out and we can shop and participate in these events safely. And I think that covers my committees at this time. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Watkins. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, I will report on the two by two committee that I attended with Mayor Myers and some of city staff as well. And um, we had a, a, a updates on large encampments at one and nine and um, updates on staff coordination with county and Caltrans and county updating us on the reservation of vaccines, 150 for the population at that location to begin after March 15th, which I think was brought up in the city manager's report. Um, also on uh, response uh, recommendations, we had an update on requests for FEMA hotel support and um, long-term locations and financing for temporary and permanent housing. Um, there will be a second round of project home key um, and we, uh, briefly mentioned and talked about the armory and current hotel sites as well as other locations tied into the update of the county's three-year framework and six-month plan. And I don't know if Mayor Myers has any additional uh, reporting on that item. I will uh, leave I'll, it I'll, I'll look at my notes and see if I have anything when I get to, to my report out. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other um, committees on your end? Vice Mayor? Nope. Okay. Nope. I have this week, but not before this meeting. Okay. Uh, Council Member Brown, please. Um, I actually don't have uh, anything of import to announce on, uh, from the um, boards and commissions that I am on. Uh, and uh, Council Member Colin Tyre Johnson is going to talk about the CPC, which is the, the one that. Great. There were, there's some action, so next time. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings? Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Mid-County Groundwater um, group met last week, and I guess two of the big takeaways. Um, there was a um, presentation of the 2020 annual report um, to the board, and um, from that, one of the 
things that came, or a few of the things that came up is that, um, you know, sustaining our groundwater is, uh, continues to be an ongoing priority. And um, although some of the management actions have reduced, um, have resulted in demonstrating reduced chlorophyll concentrations, which is a metric used to measure uh, seawater intrusion. In some areas, we've seen reductions in those concentrations, and in other areas, we've seen, seen increases in those concentrations, which suggests that there may be some inland movement of um, seawater intrusion that may lead to undesirable results in the future. And so um, they're continuing to monitor what are going to be some triggers uh, that might result in reduced pumping to kind of um, ensure that uh, the water table, that we that we don't have too much saltwater intrusion and we're maintaining uh, the freshwater water table. Um, some of the projects to reduce the net groundwater pumping include, as many of us uh, are aware of, the Pure Water Soquel project, um, the aquifer storage and recovery, uh, the water transfer and in lieu groundwater recharge, and then uh, distributed stormwater management recharge. Uh, in addition to receiving that report, we also spent um, a, a, a good amount of time uh, discussing uh, amendments to the government, the governance documents and agency staffing. And those are some of the, the major uh, items that were discussed at the meeting. Uh, in addition to that, AMBAG met. Uh, we received an update on the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Management Plan, uh, which is, has been an ongoing effort and is getting close to approval. Uh, we received an update on the Monterey Bay Regional Overall Work Program and the budget for that program. Um, we also received an update on the 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan and Sustainability Sustainable Community Strategy, which included the draft revenue um, and constrained project list and land use. Uh, for LAFCO, <clears throat> uh, we approved the extraterritorial service agreement uh, for the Atkinson Lane and Brewington Avenue um, so that they could receive water and sewer service from the city of Watsonville. Uh, we also adopted a service and sphere of influence review for the city of Scotts Valley. And um, to provide an additional update, I'm, I'm uh, I've been invited to the Criminal Justice Council ad hoc uh, committee as a community member and have been working with the chair, uh, Supervisor Zach Friend, to produce a survey that, um, that will go out to law enforcement agencies here in Santa Cruz County. And that survey is gonna really be looking at trying to see, um, based on eight can't wait and some of the other policies uh, to mitigate and reduce uh, use of force and uh, bias and discrimination to really see where do we align as law enforcement throughout the county and where are there opportunities for us to improve our policies and further align our policies. And so we'll be um, sending that survey out in the near future and hopefully based on those results, the ad hoc subcommittee will meet again and um, provide updates to the Criminal Justice Council at their next meeting on May 13th. And with that, I think I'm done. Uh, the revenue, I can't find my notes for the revenue subcommittee, so I don't know if one of the other members can maybe speak to that, but we did meet with uh, Seal Cirillo, and we had discussions with Seal about uh, the efforts that were taken after the 1989 earthquake around how the city, what were some measures that the city took to try to generate revenue after that um, disaster that our community faced. And we're also gonna be meeting with uh, uh, former council member and former mayor Cynthia Matthews to discuss with her some strategies and approaches that might be worth considering for the city around revenue measures. And so that's all I have to report. Thank you, council member. I mean, uh, next I have Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Meyer. Um, we had the first Community Programs Committee last month. And um, as my colleague mentioned, this is an agenda item um, later on in our meeting today, so I won't go into the details, but we did discuss staff recommendation for the CDBG and home funding allocations. Um, and we also discussed the core investment fund that we will be looking at reissuing the RFPs this coming fall of 2021. And but this round of core investment may look a little different from last round and, and we will be discussing the process in, in our um, community programs committee. 
So that's it for that one. And um, I also attended the Metro Board last month. We have another meeting this coming Friday. Our last one was February 26th. And Mayor Myers, if there's a lot there, so if I forget something, um, please add. Uh, I'm gonna look at my notes, because it's a lot. Um, so the Metro installed splash pass ticket validators for Highway 117, um, excuse me, Highway 17 buses. Um, they have um, put in COVID precautions, um, including plexiglasses in buses. Uh, these aren't new, these have been here, but um, just to reiterate the COVID precautions that the, the Metro buses are taking. Air ionizers uh, have been installed in buses and in the offices. Um, soap dispensers in all the facilities, and they've updated face covering flyers to reflect the federal law. Um, there's been a partnership between the Paracruz program and Sutter Health to provide free rides for individuals for vaccinations. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, they have, the Metro has reopened customer services in Watsonville. As of, as of um, February 15th, the Metro qualified to um, not do mandatory weekly testing, um, but the Metro decided to continue weekly testing to have extra, to take extra precautions for the staff and the riders. Um, the transit workers were included last month for vaccinations. Just recently, they were included in a priority um, by the state to be vaccinated. So in the process of vaccinating the um, Metro workers, uh, we have a new Proterra bus that has arrived uh, several weeks ago and um, hope to be in circulation in Watsonville in the fall. And um, I think, you know, most of you know this, but the American Rescue Plan um, passed, and this will provide for uh, $30.5 billion for transit across the nation, um, and will provide funds for COVID emergency relief through 2023. And in the last Metro meeting, we talked a lot about um, other funds that will come through. Um, after the American Rescue Plan, um, we foresee um, other relief bills uh, that focus on infrastructure, potentially $2 billion. And uh, we anticipate getting some of this for the metro um, districts. And, and there's a theme that was highlighted of climate change and racial equity and opportunity for our city and the metro um, to look at funds for water, broadband, affordable housing, um, school construction. So we'll keep our eyes out for that. And we also uh, discussed a recommendation that was approved to, um, to do a temporary fare reduction. And this would be a fare reduction to last up to six months, consisting of a 50% discount on adults and youth for the 50% discount on regular fare for adult and youth, and free fares for riders with an eligible discount card. Um, the staff projects this proposal could increase ridership by 20% uh, while lowering the financial burden of transportation for customers who need it. And um, it, it would decrease revenues by around 56% over the six month period um, of implementation of a fare reduction. But um, the staff felt that this was a, a, a worthwhile um, temporary project to put into place to really get the riders up um, uh, and into, the, uh, into our buses. So I'll stop there. There was a lot there and I tried to summarize the key points and Mayor Myers can add if I missed anything significant. I think you caught a lot of it. Um, Thank you. I'll look at my notes. I do. Um, I do sit on a lot of committees with my colleagues. So I, I will um, just look to see if I, anything was missed. Um, I might also just. Um, I do sit on measure the Measure U committee with Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Cummings. Um, that committee did approve a submittal on the. Um, the EIR for the long range development plan and also submitted additional um, uh, 
letters regarding the LRDP and some pertinent um, decisions and land use designations in that plan. And then finally, that committee has been working with um, Senator Laird on some uh, options regarding um, understanding um, community input, uh, obviously into university growth and what kinds of options and um, especially tied to the mitigation issues that um, have been, um, you know, there's concern with regards to the university growth and whether or not they're really gonna be able to accommodate and accomplish the, the necessary mitigations for increased uh, student and um, faculty numbers that are seen in the LRDP. Um, and that committee uh, meets again uh, next week. Uh, on the two by two, the only thing I would add is that uh, we did receive uh, reports from um, Director M Mimi Hall, um, who also will be helping the city understand um, more about the administrative claims process, which is um, a process that um, entities that do provide some services um, for houseless individuals, um, there is actually um, the ability to potentially look at doing um, an administrative claim process to potentially look uh, retain some of those dollars back into the city. So we are going to, uh, she's going to help the city uh, begin to explore that. Um, there also was um, a discussion around uh, a request for qualifications that the county is doing as well. And uh, looking at bringing new providers or, or providing new providers the opportunity to um, uh, bid on the request for qualifications. And that is going through uh, the general services department. And um, the city took action as well on a similar idea tied to the um, outdoor living ordinance. And so there may be some, some good synergy, synergy there between uh, looking at some additional providers that may respond to that request for proposal. Uh, and then finally, the other uh, was that um, I believe the county is uh, assessing whether or not um, they have the availability and capacity to do um, to move from a twice to, uh, every other year pit count to an annual pit count. Um, and this obviously will help inform some of their planning work uh, with regard to their uh, new effort that was adopted by their board uh, two weeks ago. So um, those are the only things that I would add to the two by two report out. Uh, I'm also a member on the uh, Downtown Management Corporation and we met last week. Um, that group has been very focused on downtown recovery and planning um, around um, how we um, manage downtown uh, going forward. I think everyone saw the, the good news that Regal 9, um, even though Regal 9 is leaving, we do have um, a replacement tenant um, who will be operating that um, soupy theaters for, for to retain that as a theater downtown, which is a, a really great thing that came through last week. Um, the Downtown Management Corporation group looked at a series of about six proposals that have been developed by a subcommittee on activating downtown during this time, and that includes everything from uh, looking at how to deal with vacant storefront windows um, to various other types of programs and projects that we could do over the next six months to a year. Um, there's also a new um, artist selection uh, solicitation that went out um, with, with, I believe, proposals due April 5th, right, Sonia? Um, and that's uh, meant to really bring art back into some of the spaces that currently maybe aren't filled or in the process of, of getting their vacancies resolved. Um, and that um, bringing art into the downtown is one of the main um, focuses of the DMC recommendations. And um, there's some really exciting and really innovative ideas also looking at standardizing the, um, the parklets as they're called or the outdoor dining areas so that there's some cost savings for owners, owners and a little more efficiency in how people can um, stand those up quickly, but have a little bit more of a unif uniform feel to downtown and um, really anticipating that those, that those may be, you know, turn into more long-term um, availability over, over time. Um, so the Downtown Management Corporation is very much focused on um, really putting some things out onto the street very quickly, um, which is really exciting. And I think Council Member Colontari Johnson um, caught all the things on my list for Metro. So um, I think we'll, we'll end there unless there's any other council members that have things to add. No, okay, great. Okay, we will move on to agenda item. 
me look here onto our consent agenda today, um, which will include items 10 through 19 on our agenda today. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now's the time to call in if you want to comment on items 10 through 19. Instructions will be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand, and listen for the cues saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull on any items, excuse me, or pull any items? Council member Brown. Yeah, thank you. I uh, would like to pull item 11 and I have a question on item 13, which might cause me to want to pull it. Um, but so maybe it's better to just do that, but it's, I'm try I don't wanna make it a, a big drawn out conversation. I just have a question about a possible addition. Okay, so, so do you wanna pull 13? Just so you have a discussion? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. 13, sorry. No worries, no, that's fair. No worries at all. Uh, uh, Council Member Contari Johnson. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wanted to comment on 11 and 13, so I'll wait until after Council Member Brown brought up her point. Okay, great. Okay. Any other Council Members? Council Member Cummings? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on item number 17. Okay. Just a comment? Yes. Okay. And any other council members? I will, I'm going to uh, just uh, pull item um, 14 and 15 just for comment. Okay, so I have, uh, we've pulled items uh, 11 and 13, and then we will have comments on items 14, 15, and 17. Okay. Okay, so we will go ahead and, and uh, call, I'll call on the comments and questions from council members um, uh, on, well, on uh, item uh, 14, 15, and 17. I think the first two are mine and then council member Cummings, I'll turn those over to you. Um, so I guess my main thing, um, just on item 14, um, which for the public is um, something called the Next Epic Challenge Grant Application for Pacific Station North Project. And this is really a resolution um, to apply for a grant um, called the Next Epic Challenge, a reimagining affordable mixed use development in a carbon constrained future. Uh, this is a, when I read through the uh, staff report, I just thought that it um, had some really um, important things for our public to understand what this could potentially bring to our community. And uh, one sentence, couple sentences stood out in, in uh, really in, in stood out to me. So one being that nearly 20 years in the making of Pacific Station Mixed Use Affordable Housing and Transit Project, which is at the existing Metro Transit site, is rapidly moving toward fruition through recent policy changes and a renewed commitment by the city and the Metro. Um, and this grant really is about um, uh, obtaining state support for sustainable development coupled with recent changes in the building code and innovations in renewable energy, um, construction technology and electric mobility are unlocking the potential for Pacific Station North to truly become a transformational groundbreaking and climate, climate sensitive project in the heart of our downtown. Um, for those in the public, if you get a chance, take a look at this um, report, it's item 14 on consent. Um, and especially folks who are interested in um, what the city's doing with regards to climate change. I think this is a really exciting and a, exciting uh, project and I just wanna uh, recognize our staff at Economic Development and Planning for bringing this forward to us and I hope you get the grant. It's 
the million dollar hopefully for design and then potential for additional money for construction. But most importantly, it's really um, showing the commitment from our staff and our city to pursuing these kinds of projects in the future downtown, which is really exciting. And then similarly, I just wanna also compliment our economic development department on the Grow Santa Cruz County Revolving Loan Program, which um, we're authorizing them to enter into a memorandum of understanding with um, all the other cities and the county in the and the Small Business Development Center and the National Development uh, Council um, to support the Grow Santa Cruz Revolving Loan Program for the city of Santa Cruz, but in partnership with all those other, other entities. And I think this is a demonstration of when COVID puts you into a, a, you know an extreme situation, uh, extraordinary things happen, and so it's really amazing to see us take the lead and uh, working with the county and other cities to really look economically at how we can bring more businesses um, and especially for businesses that can't otherwise obtain traditional bank financing. This this uh, loan program is really targeted at those folks who really don't have the resources and need that initial capital to get going. So I think uh, this um, program in, in especially really reflects both our interim recovery plan and also the high app goals that we set as a community as well. So, and as a council um, as well. So thank you to uh, economic development's um, leadership on that. And council member Cummings, I'll um, turn, you, turn it over to uh, item number 17 for comment or question. Thank you, Mayor. And I um, just wanna thank the staff. There's a lot of items on our consent agenda that are really um, just in, inspiring. Uh, but this one in particular, I just wanted to comment on because for members of the public, this is the purchase of an electric refuse vehicle and amending the fiscal year 2021 budget and appropriation of funds for electric refuse hauler emission reduction. Um, and <clears throat> I know that since I've been on the council, this has been something that um, council members have been interested in and the public's been very interested in. I think it was our last meeting, we were purchasing a refuse truck and this conversation came up about, you know, when we might be able to have an electric refuse vehicle. So it's really um, just wonderful to see that we're gonna be able to get an electric refuse vehicle and then see how that works with, you know, like what are some of the constraints of it that uh, come with having these electric vehicles, how those can be improved and continuing to move in that direction. And so I just wanted to thank uh, public works staff for all the work that you all have been doing to really um, respond to the, the community's comments for making this happen. Um, and so, yeah, just wanted to express my thanks for, for bringing this forward. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. So uh, now that we've uh, finalized uh, questions and comments, so I'm gonna move on to public comment on the consent agenda, agenda. If there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of the items pulled by council members, and that's item number 11 and number 13 today, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I will go ahead and take a look to see who's over here. Okay, I've got phone number ending in one eight. So Bonnie, let me just um, make sure here. Yeah, this is Garrett Phillip. As to item 11's leftist outrage over shootings of Asians at massage parlors, the FBI says those weren't hate crimes or caused by racial bias. Of course, two white people were also killed. I guess white lives don't matter. All too often now, any act of violence on any person of color invokes a woke tidal wave of call of racism and hate and classic anti-racist racism as the message is always whites are racist, white supremacy is to blame, orange man bad, dredging up the ancient past as if it were yesterday to draw meaningless, ever less legitimate or irrelevant parallels. For your information, when Trump spoke about China, he was referring to the bad actor communist China CCP government, not about race. You have that as wrong as blaming China or the Wuhan flu phrase uh, for the recent shootings. Senseless violence seems more likely. No um, Mayor, I just muted him only because this item was pulled. Right, that's okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, let me just get caught up here on my script. Okay, so I will look for a vote on the remaining items of the consent agenda before moving on to the pulled items. Um, so I'm now looking for a motion. <coughs> on remaining items on consent with the exceptions uh, 
uh, item number 11 and number 13. Mayor Watkins, I mean, excuse me, Council Member Watkins. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Myers. I will move um, the consent agenda except for items 11 and 13. And if I may, just for a brief moment, just really thank my colleagues for highlighting some of those really important items that sometimes get wrapped into our consent agenda but needs to be made known to the public. And then also reiterate your appreciation of the connection to some of these bigger plans that we have in place, like high up in our interim recovery plan. So those are my brief comments as I propose moving the consent agenda absent 11 and 13. Thank you, Councilmember Watkins. Councilmember Cummings. I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember uh, Watkins and seconded by Councilmember Cummings it's on the consent agenda. And all in those in favor, please say aye. Oops, excuse uh, me. I'll do a roll call vote. Yeah, roll call vote. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Watkins. Aye. Calentari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder is still absent. Um, Brunner? Vice Mayor Brunner? Sorry. Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. So that motion passes unanimously. And uh, that is with uh, uh, Council Member Golder being absent. So we will now come back to um, item number 11 on our consent agenda item, consent agenda, which was pulled by Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first I wanna thank my colleagues for uh, who brought this to our agenda. I, I think it's really important that we uh, make a collective statement about what's happening with, you know, that's part of a longer history as you all um, raise in the in the agenda report and the resolution. Um, and, you know, it's, it's disturbing what's happening <laughs> right now. There are, you know, people are scared, they're confused. Um, I know working with my students, it's been, you know, a, a constant conversation. Um, and it, you know, talking about how this fits in with our, our broader history and, um, so I, I wanted to ask if my colleagues might consider, uh, and I know it's pretty dense, um, there's a lot in this <laughs> resolution, but just a couple of possible additions. Uh, these come from a group that has a BIPOC network that has been, um, uh, you know, working on issues, you know, fight, fighting racism in many, in all its forms. And so they asked me to, to bring some language uh, that reflects the the U.S. role um, in foreign you know our foreign policy, how that ha and it's kind of alluded to, but it I just kind of put it in here. We recommended putting it in here um, at the top of page two of the resolution, um, which just references the role that U.S. foreign policy and you know U.S. imperialism. The word isn't in there, but that's kind of what we're getting at here, um, has played in, um, you know, affecting Asian uh, Asian people all over the world, right? So the U.S. actions kind of abroad as well. Um, and so I think that that was one they wanted to ask us to include. And then um, this second one came up in as well from the group, but I've also had several conversations with people who do work in this um, arena, um, who have, ta have talked with me about uh, really acknowledging that what happened in Atlanta was, um, yes, it was a hate crime, uh, you know, against Asian Americans, but it was also, uh, you know, targeting um, sex workers. All right, and um, and to acknowledge that that is a there there's a real a serious vulnerability there, and many of these women are um, not necessarily freely engaging in um, this work, um, and you know because of sex trafficking, etc. So um, kind of just acknowledging that um, you know the, the role that Asian American women face this additional. Um, 
you know, uh, this additional barrier and additional um, level of um, discrimination and, you know, bigotry really um, because of their gender. And so that's the other one that was, that I've been asked to recommend or to propose here. Um, and then finally, I had a question about the, um, not the use of the term immigrant is not really in here. And so we have, you know, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, AAPI um, communities. And I'm just wondering if there's a way to acknowledge that um, we're talking about many people who are, are immigrants who are, who are very vulnerable as a result of their immigration status. Um, so the, that was, um, that's what I've got. I um, am happy to, you know, try to wordsmith if folks want to do that, but these were just uh, the ones that stood out for, for some of us. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, I would, um, yeah, well, uh, if we could maybe keep those up, um, Bonnie, um, I'd be happy to uh, work with uh, Council Member Watkins and Council Member Kalantari Johnson in terms of revisions. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, yeah, thank you, Council Member Brown, for bringing those points to our attention. I think um, these are important additions to make, and if um, Mayor Myers and Council Member Watkins are um, okay with it, I, I would like to accept those um, changes that you um, recommended and suggested, as well as, um, I don't know exactly where, but weaving in the term immigration in here. And, and then if I may, I'll just um, give my comment that I wanted to give earlier. Um, as as um, a Middle Easterner and um, someone who um, is an immigrant here in this country, my community has um, been a recipient of hate and hate crimes, and it's so important and so meaningful for us to explicitly and publicly um, acknowledge the history, acknowledge the current hate, and make a commitment as a community to stand up against it and um, commit to fight against it and to re-envision a different future. So I just wanted to share those words, but this touches me very personally. Um, and, and I'm proud of our city for, for making this statement. Thank you, Council Member. And Council Member Cummings, and I, I would agree, um, I, I fully accept, uh, I fully acknowledge, and, and I think your additions are, are really great, Council Member Brown. So um, I too am, am, am fine with those. And if we can figure out the right spot, um, I have, I'd have to pull everything up on my screen. So if there, anybody has a, um, Council Member Brown, if you haven't, I see, yeah, if you have an idea on where we can put immigration, um, in this yes um so uh, let's see i think further down bonnie if i remember so that i um if i could uh mayor myers please please do uh, it, it might just because it weaving it in you know i was i thought about that as i was um putting together the, um, the proposal, and it is a little bit of a challenge. I'm wondering if um, including an additional whereas, just acknowledging that um, there are, um, you know, many members of our, our communities um, who are, um, all, are are additionally vulnerable or, um, uh, let's see how to say this, um, who, who um, experience additional vulnerabilities due to their immigration status um, might be a way to do it. But if others um, who are better at wordsmithing than me want to give it a shot, please do. And I'm wondering if it, um, I wonder, Bonnie, if the whereas right there at the top, um, sorry, uh, right below the, the, um, the second red line, I wonder, um, is a part of our history of violence of communities of color? Um, and immigrant. And immigrant. immigrant. Would that work there, Council Member Brown? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I have Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Watkins. 
I was just going to aid in the wordsmithing if it was necessary. Um, I guess the only thing I'll point out is that, um, and just for consideration, but you know, maybe if there could be a whereas towards the end um, that acknowledges that these same violent acts um, are committed also against Asian Pacific Islander immigrants um, and their community stands you know, ready to support our Asian immigrant communities. I'm just, I was just putting some, trying to put something else out there to help with the words one thing, but whatever seems appropriate and, and you know, where we can include something to that extent, uh, I think it's, it's fine. So, but yeah, I did want to acknowledge that the, um, that, yeah, that Asian immigrants also face other challenges around citizenship and, you know, um, and that can, can influence how they're able to access resources for their own safety because if your immigration status prevents you from going forward to the police or what have you, that that's another constraint. And so, um, so I just want to acknowledge what's been brought up and, you know, if there's any need for help with that word kind of thing, but I think what, um, what was just brought forward should probably be sufficient um, unless we want to have further discussion around that. And I also want to thank um, council members, Colin Tari Johnson, um, Watkins, and Mayor Myers for bringing this forward during a time when we really need to continue, you know, focusing on uh, eliminating racism from our community. And the last year, we um, made racism a public health crisis in the city and in the county. And I think that we need to continue doing what we can to let people know that it's not tolerated in our community. So thank you all. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Councilmember Watkins, and then Councilmember Collintari Johnson, I'll go back to you. No, I want to, oh. I, I too just want to thank um, my colleagues and thank our staff who was able to really quickly put this together in acknowledgement of the recent violence that occurred in Atlanta. I um, also just want to acknowledge and thank the additions that were brought forward by Councilmember Brown and um, an, an ability to strengthen the relevance of it. And I also, although it's not necessary to include it, just want to remember how the Watsonville riots here occurred as well in our local history. And so um, it's our responsibility to acknowledge our history and to make these types of statements to move forward in a more positive direction. So um, I want to thank everybody who was involved in getting it, getting it to the place we are at today. Yeah, and I just want to acknowledge um, the help of Ralph, um, uh, Democrat, in, in our in our in helping me prepare this, and also our assistant city manager Laura Schmidt, um, and uh, just acknowledge that um, similar to what my colleagues have said, um, it, yeah, it, we just have such a long way to go, and um, any time that we can, as a small community, just reiterate our values um, as much as possible um, and whatever notice that makes um, in people's minds and their hearts um, by us doing these kinds of things, I think it's always worth it. And um, I appreciate your uh, edits or your additions, Councilmember Brown, and uh, really appreciate you um, bringing those to us, um, really good additions. So um, thank you, everybody. Bonnie, do I um, vote on these one at a time then, right? No, you need public comment first, and you don't have a motion on the table yet. Okay. I'll go ahead and, uh, can I take it out to public comment once we've done 13, too? No, this, this was pulled, so you have to do them separately. Okay. So I'll go ahead and take this out to public comment. This will be for item number 11 on the consent agenda, which is a resolution denouncing hate crimes and bigotry targeting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Phone number ending in 1810. Uh, yeah, this is Garrett Phillip. I'll repeat a little bit, but uh, not everything. Uh, all too often now, any act of violence on any person of color invokes a woke tidal wave call of racism and hate in classic any racist racism, as the message is always whites are racist, white supremacy is to blame, orange man bad, dredging up the ancient past as if it were yesterday to draw meaningless, ever less legitimate or relevant parallels. No current FBI data adjusted for demographics exists to indicate white people are more likely to commit hate crimes against Asians 
than other races are. There are many subversive actors at work spewing division and stability, advocating woke Marxism, like the BLM, where isolated acts of police violence is really a cover for a very different agenda that you don't really have to blindly support. Some Chinese progressive associations are reported to be funded by the CCP, and those have then funded the BLM. It is soft-headed, naive, or useful idiot not to know communist, socialist, propagandist, revolutionary, and anarchist subversives are out there infiltrating, instigating, and spewing racial hate as one psyop after another tool to wage war in America and its values and demoralize its people. There is a difference between so-called subjective hate incidents ascribed to racism and official hate crimes. Think about some early reports of the Denver shooter suspect yesterday as a white middle-aged man and then later revealed he was 21 and of Syrian origin. I'm skeptical about race blame finger pointing. Good luck trying to count the endless instances of violence in the BLM riots, riots or with Antifa. 2020 overflowed with violence instances, and when FBI hate crime data comes out for 2020, we'll see how objectively accurate or appropriate the finger pointing of claims are. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, item, uh, member of the public, uh, Minami in the with the last name. Please go ahead. If you press star nine, you should be able to unmute yourself it's on your phone. Six. There we go. Yes, hello. Hi there. Welcome. Hi. My name is Akiko Minami, and I am a resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I guess I can't see you all, but maybe you can see me. So um, I've heard uh, about this resolution, and I'm really, really excited that the staff and council members and the mayor put this together. Um, I have added some uh, comments to it, and it sounds like some of that was incorporated. Um, I have been in touch with a face group, a Facebook group of Asian Americans that is just coming together, um, and a number of them have said that it, the turnaround has been too fast and that we would, uh, members would like to um, have some input into the resolution, um, but weren't able to do it by today. So um, I do want to appreciate that it was put together really quickly and a lot of the points um, are fantastic, but I am a little bit concerned that it's not including very many voices from the community. And um, I know of uh, a couple of other people that sent in emails um, and I'm not sure if their input, um, one woman who is a new uh, friend, um, sorry, I can't, Stephanie Chiang, I don't know if you got her email, she sent it late last night. And so I am requesting that you put it off for the next meeting and include the input from more community members. Um, this Facebook group is going to be putting a vigil on um, at the Santa Cruz County building this Saturday. And a lot of people are coming together that have not been involved in politics. Um, and and are really excited about stepping up and and um, participating and, and having a healing and coming together. And I think if we included more uh, input in this resolution that people will have more buy-in and feel like um, it really speaks to the needs of the community and is not being written by, you know, just the staff that may not necessarily represent Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I will bring it back to council uh, and I will look to my colleagues uh, that uh, participated in the resolution. Um, I personally would be willing to delay action on it if we can bring it back out to more community input. So I'd be happy to do that and look for a, a motion potentially for that. Council Member Brown. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I I would uh, I agree. I'm, I appreciate your willingness to to do this. I think it is really important to uh, really create a space that's welcoming and you know open to community input. Uh, as you know, I say all the time. So I really appreciate that. And um, with that, I would um, I guess I would make I could make a motion to um, uh, let's see. Oops, I just lost my. Um, the agenda, um, sorry. It's item 11. But um, so um, I, this would be a motion to um, continue the item, would it be continue? Um, to continue the item, um, the 
considering a resolution denouncing hate crimes and bigotry targeting Asian American and Pacific Islanders um, in order to uh, engage with the um, AAPI community here in Santa Cruz and to bring back a revised version at a future meeting. And uh, I have Council, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Oh, sorry, Council Member Cummings. Wait a minute, sorry, uh, it was Vice Mayor I was Bruner. sorry, yeah, <laughs> I was muted. Have her hand up first, yeah. Um, Council Member Brown, does that include your additions? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. That's a, a place that I know that's where some of these folks want to want to yeah. go. Yeah, that. so I, I would like to second that motion and I feel that providing that space for further input from the community would be very important to this. So I, I second that. Thank you. Uh, further comments or uh, comments before we vote? Uh, Council Member Colontari Johnson. Yeah, um, I wonder if we can um, set a time limit to it because I feel urgency in, in um, making this commitment and, and having a resolution. So I think absolutely for their community input, but um, if Councilmember Brown, if you would maybe recommend some time limit to it, that would be great. Councilmember Cummings? Um, I just wanted to point out that um, the next meeting, so oftentimes we usually have to, we usually have, you know, a week before agendas are out, but this is one of the few times during the year that we actually have um, two weeks before um, the agendas are posted. So it could, I would imagine there might be an opportunity to get input by for this to come at the next meeting, since we'll have two weeks before um, our meeting on April 13th, which means I think the agenda reports would need to be in by the 1st, and then it will be published on the 8th. So just wanted to put that out there that we have a little bit more of a buffer for the next meeting than we normally do for most council meetings. And so wanted to provide that to, to, to demonstrate that we do have um, a little bit extra time um, that would, would allow us to, to meet that urgency, um, but that would provide that buffer that would be needed to get um, some level of community outreach. And then um, I guess within that motion as well, if, if the friendly amendment to have it come back at the first meeting in April, um, just also do we need to provide direction for those, those the three members who brought it forward to meet with the community or how we want that community incorporation to happen. And so just wanted to put that out there for us to make sure that we, it's clear who, who we're gonna be, who's gonna be in charge of getting getting that community input. And if it's the council members or the staff, I think it's just important that we include that in the motion. As a, maybe one, as, as one of the members that brought it forward, I, I believe the three of us would be happy to accommodate that and have other council members, um, and <laughs> members uh, join as long as we don't, um, you know, Crown Act. So we, but certainly the three of us will absolutely, and, and other council members, please, you know, I'm open. I, I, I shared, uh, I share the urgency component to this with um, council member Colin Tari Johnson and um, had been in, um, had been in uh, receipt of a lot of in, in, in emails uh, uh, regarding this from other mayors around the country that were seeking uh, an urgent declaration by as many um, towns as possible um, in relation to what was happening. So um, certainly we, we were reflecting on um, a nationwide, really a nationwide request that as many communities as possible, as quickly as possible, um, you know, work to get a resolution passed. So, but I will defer to my um, colleagues if they, on, on, the, on the item, if they would like to add to that. Council Member Brown. Yeah, thank you. I um, absolutely would uh, accept that as a friendly amendment, uh, Council Member Cummings. I um, I hesitated at the end of making the motion because I, I know that bringing back a time certain or a day day certain is really important, and I, I recognize the urgency as well. So I think this does give us an opportunity to be able to bring this back pretty quickly. 
um, having that extra time between council meetings. Um, thank you for raising that, uh, council member coming. So um, with that, I would just add, uh, you know, and, and return uh, on our April the 13th meeting, April 13th. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Council member Watkins, did you have any other comments? No, I'm just happy to be part of, um, you know, supporting this direction. And I know Ralph has done a lot of work with uh, bringing this before us and happy to work with my colleagues who co-sponsored this resolution as well as if Ralph has capacity to support us in, in engaging specific community members for input. Thanks, Ralph. Great. Thank you, Ralph. Okay, so uh, we will go, uh, we have a motion by Council Member Brown Seconded by Council Member Vice Mayor Bonnie, Bruner. Remind me. Excuse me? Vice Mayor Bruner. Yeah, Vice Mayor Bruner. Sorry, Sonia, I've been bouncing all over the place. Uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Bruner to, um, to uh, continue the item uh, for our outreach with the AAPI community and to return the resolution for action um, by April 13th. Does that capture it? Okay, great. Okay. So I will go, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote on this, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Sorry, aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Councilmember Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item number 13 on the consent agenda. And I believe that was also Councilmember Brown. Um, I with this one as well, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing this forward. Um, as we know, you know, food ser service workers and, and food service workers um, are at much higher risk of um, the exposure to COVID. Uh, and I, with that, I, um, you know, farm workers are really on the front lines and have been, as we know, um, very vulnerable. They tend to, um, in terms of workplace and and living space. Um, be in places that um, that expose them to more risk, and you know they're obviously a fundamental part of our food system. And you know while we don't have farms in the city of Santa Cruz, given that this is um, in concert with Watsonville, and you know the, our region is really one of the um, you know the salad bowl of the world, um, it seems like farm workers um, it, it would be good to include them. And I it, and I'm just wondering maybe there was a reason that they weren't included, and if so, then. That, that makes sense, you know, I'm sure it makes sense, but if not, it would be nice to include farm workers. Do you wanna make that into a motion? I, I Ms. O'Hara, did you wanna <laughs> clarify? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, um, member uh, Susie O'Hara, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for Council Member Brown. So in my research of the available specific vaccine clinics that uh, the County Department of Public Health is already conducting, there are farm worker clinics already. Um, most, I mean, all of them are in Watsonville and there's a pretty high level of effort already underway to carve out specific vac vaccine clinics for far farm workers. That being said, I think it would be good to engage with Watsonville on if there is an additional level of advocacy that should happen, and I'm happy to do that with um, the council approval of the, and direction to the city manager. Thank you, Susie. Okay, I have council member Cummings, council member Watkins, and council member Colin Tart Johnson. And I'm just gonna make a quick note, we're running about 20 minutes late, so we'll uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, Mayor, I was just going to say maybe we could um, go to public comment before we make motions because I, I know that was mentioned, but maybe we could, if we could go to public comment, I think we could probably incorporate any changes um, and make motions and 
and kind of get moving as well. Yeah, I was just opening it up to see if you had uh, any questions or other uh, comments. I was going to go to public comment. Okay. I thought I thought the the making of the motion was mentioned when after Councilmember Brown made her comments. So sorry if I was. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Uh, no, thank, thank you for, for bringing that up, uh, Councilmember Brown, and uh, for the clar clarification also, Susie. I just also, um, you know, wanted to offer that as we think about this this population of folks who are providing this essential service, that although maybe not uh, farm workers, but um, our you know our farmers market. Uh, our, our vendors too. So I, I think it's implied, and I just, but I just want to, you know, intentionally state that as well. Great. And that we can include that later if we if we get into the motion making. And Councilmember Collintari Johnson. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Councilmember Brown and, and Susie um, and my colleagues who worked um, with me on this. Um, I just a comment that this is this is so necessary right now. It's outlined in the agenda report, so I won't repeat it. Um, but I wanted to quickly share that um, I have some personal impact from this. Um, I know a family here locally, personally, who. Um, whose family member worked at a local um, grocery store. There was an outbreak and their their father um, got COVID and passed away a month ago. And I know there are a lot of other stories like that here in our community and beyond. So um, I'm hoping that our county colleagues hear this and that we can um, immediately move forward with vaccine clinics for this population. It's more important now than ever um, as the community is opening up and it's all outlined in the report, but I just wanted to say it here publicly. Thank you. Thank you, council member. I'll go ahead and bring this out for public comment now. Um, phone number ending in 1810. Uh, yes, uh, as to item, is Garrett Phillip again. As to item 13, my letter has more detail and I'll keep this short, but it's worth reading. The highest vaccine priority is the highest at-risk individuals, but job type is not really the first selector to that to me as age and health are. More importantly, any coming attempts to coerce vaccine after vaccine jab or show proof of vaccination by increasingly restricting travel, assembly, attending sporting events, etc., as some authoritarians plan to, is not freedom and should be opposed. A friend of mine died two days after his second dose. No scientist or health director showed up to investigate. I'm not saying the vaccines don't work, they're brilliant, but there are many health professionals with some serious questions about them and they really have not been tested for their long-term effects and it is an individual decision. Anyway, the COVID response, including the ineffective fear masking, the deadly horrific lockdown measures, the loss of human rights, the power grabbing, the money grubbing, the fear mongering, the risk of long-term effects discounted, the flip-flopping, the political grandstanding, so much fake science, the coercion, endless emergency states, and the epic debt and monetary destruction cannot be repeated for every new virus that shows up. In my work experience, there was considerable effort put into a lessons learned diary. Every aspect of the COVID response deserves to be in one. Thanks. Okay, seeing no other members of the public with their hands raised, I'll return it back to council for a motion. Council Member Cummings. I'll move the um, recommendation. And Bonnie, I'm wondering, could you put it up on the screen? Because I think I can incorporate two um, changes that might uh, that might help us move on. So. Um, where it's food, um, add in, and agriculture. So, yeah, so if you delete the comma between food and and, and then a comma after agriculture. Yeah, and then um, maybe, and then if we could delete the and before retail. Where does restaurant fit in here? Oh, there'd be a comma after agriculture. So food and agriculture, restaurant, and then add in um, frontline and retail, and then it'll be frontline and retail workers. And I just wanted to add that little um, frontline because there are people like bus drivers and um, I'm thinking of uh, people like, there are people who work um, 
whether it's they're outward facing in banks. I have a roommate that works in a pawn shop. You know, there are people who are engaging with the public regularly in these spaces, and those people are going to be the ones who are really most at risk of exposure because they're constantly dealing um, and outward facing for many businesses. And so just really trying to ensure that we're, we're capturing uh, frontline workers who are you know constantly engaging with the public in this as well. And so to clean that up, it would be restaurant, comma, frontline, and retail workers in both, both North and South County. And council member Colin Terry Johnson. I was gonna second the motion. Okay, great. And I just might make one note. Um, I have family that work in agriculture. I know that they have um, to, um, Ms. O'Hara's note, um, they have been, they've been available for vaccinations for several weeks, but I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that we should continue to advocate for that. Um, I do know also that um, our metro drivers and tr transit actually um, was moved up as well, and there was a specialized clinic stood up in Watsonville and Santa Cruz for all metro. In fact, I think we just got a report from the metro director that um, almost everyone from metro, I think, received um, is available to receive the vaccination if they um, if they so choose. So that that is making progress, um, and I really want to uh, recognize uh, Mayor. Um, Mayor uh, Dutra in Watsonville for really uh, spearheading that um, as a member of the Metro Board, and he's been incredibly helpful both in the, um, he has just been a huge advocate for the farm worker community, um, the uh, frontline workers and, and other folks that um, have really um, struggled to get, to get vac vaccines. So he's a, a, an amazing partner in this work. Um, so I will go ahead and call for a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Councilmember Golder is absent. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. So that motion will pass unanimously, and that is a motion to direct the city manager to engage um, in a letter to the Santa Cruz Public Health Officer uh, with the amended uh, additions uh, to uh, include agriculture frontline and frontline workers um, to that list. And so thank you, council members, for bringing that forward. Uh, next up, uh, we will move on to item number 20, and I think I'm going to call for a 10-minute break. Um, we are running about 40 minutes late, um, so. Um, Let's take a 10 minute break uh, and I will try to see if we can make up some of this time. So next item up will be item number 20 for the public. That's the 2021-2022 HUD, uh, HUD action plan. I think we'll be back at 2.10. Council members are back. If you could turn on your cameras so that we can get rolling. Thank you. Okay. Bonnie, did you see if uh, council member Golder's back in yet? I don't see her. Um, I don't see her either. I texted her, okay. but um, she hasn't responded yet. Okay, great. Okay, great. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so next up on our agenda is item number 20, which is the 2021-22 Housing and Urban Development Action Plan. For members who are streaming this meeting, if this is an action you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. So 
we will have uh, Tiffany Lake, uh, Principal Management Analyst from our Economic Development Department presenting today. And uh, welcome, Tiffany. Thank you, Mayor Myers. I think uh, Jessica DeWitt, our Housing and Community Development Manager, is gonna give a brief introduction. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Jessica DeWitt with Economic Development's housing team, and we also have Tiffany Lake here from the housing team presenting the Housing and Urban Development Annual Action Plan today. Every year, the Federal Department Housing and Urban Development allocates community development block grant and home funding to designated jurisdictions. The City of Santa Cruz recently received notification of its funding allotment, and Tiffany will provide more details about this in a minute. While there are a couple smaller subcategories, CDBG funds are largely split into two umbrella categories. One is for programs serving community needs, and the second category is for projects like infrastructure improvements and building rehab that also serve a community need. Home funds are primarily focused on providing new housing opportunities and tenant-related assistance for low-income households. For the city to allocate the home and CDBG funds, a notice of funding availability was issued last November to provide the opportunity for community organizations and agencies to respond with requests for funding. The city has received funding requests from various applicants, and now Tiffany is going to walk you through the funding requests that were received and the recommended funding distribution. As Jessica mentioned, uh, we are a lot of the way through our annual action plan schedule from opening up the NOFA in November and then most recently bringing the estimated budget and funding recommendations to the Community Programs Committee or CPC in February. And that brings us to today, this first public hearing where we're seeking the initial council approval from the full council for the 2021-2022 action plan budget. And that'll keep us in line to hit our HUD deadlines. So with the funding recommendations that we get from the full council today, we'll be able to draft our 2021-2022 annual action plan. So over the years, HUD funding changes. Uh, from year to year, we've seen kind of a general upward increase since about 2015. When we met with the CPC, our Community Programs Committee back in February, we only had estimates of what we would receive for CDBG and home. Now that we've received the actual numbers, we know we have about 15,000 more than our estimate for CDBG and about 4,000 less than what we had estimated for home. So the actual funding numbers for CDBG are 618,000 and the actual funding numbers for this upcoming program year for home are 396,000. So that gives us our total CDBG funding uh, made up of what we know now is our actual grant amount of 618,000, estimated program income of 35,000. So program income is made up of repaid loans from prior CDBG grants in the past. And then also prior year funds for reprogramming of 70,000. This category could be made up of a few things. It could be canceled projects that uh, aren't gonna move forward projects or activities that complete and haven't used all of their funds, but they're done, or in the past we may have underestimated program income and so then not programmed or allocated it to anything. So the majority of the 70,000 we see here is that last category where we underestimated the program income we were gonna receive. So that gives us a pot of about 723,000 that we have available for allocation. So of that 723,000 for CDBG, 20% is set by HUD formula, that's 20% of the new grant and the estimated program income. We also have rehab administration, so this is loan servicing for prior CDBG and home loans. And we have the total remaining for programs and projects of 586,000. So this year we received four applications for community programs are what HUD calls public services. These are all subject to a 15% activities cap, which is about 90,000, but we have total requests of 190,000. Um, but this is okay because only um, these three programs here are subject to that 15% public services cap. This is because Nueva Vista is a community-based development organization, or CBDO, and that means that they have a board of directors that's made up of at least 51% low-income residents are residents of the community served. And in this case, because they are a CBDO, 
The area served is our NRSA, our Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area, which is the Beach Flats and Lower Ocean Area. We also received three applications for projects, our capital improvement. So Loudon Nelson had an application for the senior studio. So this would be a concrete slab foundation, ADA accessible ramp. Uh, ramp and other hookups to install a modular unit that the Parks and Rec Department already has. They don't have the funds to do the installation. So that 50,000 they requested cannot be um, phased. They need the full amount to move forward. The Market Street Senior Center, this is a second application. They uh, applied for and received CDBG funding last year of 100,000. And they have a total estimate of about 500,000 of needed improvements. So we can expect that we will uh, receive further applications from them in the future. And then the city of Santa Cruz has put in an application for homeless infrastructure that can include uh, encampment response. It could be procurement of hygiene units or other sanitation and cleanup or other CDBG eligible uh, homeless infrastructure. So we have total requests of 425,000 but we only have 396,000 available, so not all of the projects can be fully funded at their ask. So uh, recommendations for program funding, um, the staff recommendation and then the recommendation that we got back from the CPC was to fully fund all of the programs that applied. Um, so that would be at 190,000 if all four programs are fully funded at their ask, and that's without exceeding the HUD public service cap and we received some updates that we requested for um, those who've received CDBG last year um, to give some updates to council for those um, that have applied again this year. Last year, we were able to fund Second Harvest with CDBG coronavirus funding. Um, and with that funding, they've, able, they've been able to increase those served in the city of Santa Cruz because they were doing work before the pandemic, but when the pandemic started, food insecurity has greatly increased. So they've been helping an average of 15,000 City of Santa Cruz residents every month and helping with approximately 235,000 pounds of food each month as well. We also got some updates from Nueva Vista, which operates two locations that are funded with CDBG. So their Familia Center on East Cliff has provided over 700 hours of advocacy and support. They've been able to stay open during the pandemic with social distancing and other safety protocols. And the Nueva Vista Youth Center at the Beach Flats Community Center has provided over 1,000 hours of recreation and 575 hours of homework. So these are just some of the highlights um, of all the work they've been doing um, because it would have been a lot to put on the slide because they've been doing so much. And since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, CRLA, our California Rural Legal Assistance, has seen a great increase in those seeking help related to housing. Um, so they've seen about 87% of those seeking assistance, it's had to do with housing and this has been a great increase. So they, they only had numbers for calendar year 2020, so that overlapped somewhat with the funding they received related um, to CDBG. So in that time, they were able to assist 148 City of Santa Cruz households or 259 residents. So moving on to projects, um, when we brought the funding to the CPC, because we only had our estimates, we were trying to be a little conservative. Um, we thought we had a total of 30, 381,000, but we know now we have a little bit more. We really have 396,000 available to split between the remaining projects after the programs are funded. So the recommendation is to fund the senior studio at their ask as before at 50,000, because this is what they need to move forward. The senior center at 110,000 and homeless infrastructure projects at 236,000. Both of these projects can be phased, so they're able to both move forward if they're not funded at their full ask. So a summary of those recommendations so far of that 723,000 is that we had administration by the HUD formula at 130,000, rehab program administration for prior loans at 6,500, community programs at 190,000, so that keeps us below our cap imposed by HUD because Nueva Vista is excluded as a CBDO, and capital projects at 396,000, so that's the remaining uh, split between those three applications for capital improvements. So moving on to home funding, again, we have our actual HUD funding numbers for homes, so that's 396,000 for home, 
We have estimated program income. So like CDBG, this is repayment of prior loans that the city made with home funding. And we have administration at 10% also HUD formula, which is 10% of the new grant year and the um, incoming program income. And then we have a prior um, pot of funds that are designated for future housing projects. So home funds have to be the last funding into a project and can't be designated to a specific project until all of the other funding is lined up. Um, but this is a pot of money that's growing over time that will be available to close funding gaps for affordable housing in the city of Santa Cruz. So we have a total of a little under 1.27 million here. So um, the, what we propose is that 100,000 go to the security deposit program, which is administered by the Santa Cruz Housing Authority. So this program funds city of Santa Cruz residents with their security deposit, which is paid directly to landlords on their behalf. We have the CHODO set aside. So CHODO is a community housing development organization. So like the CBDO equivalent that we discussed for CDBG, this uh, organization would need to have uh, over 51% of their board of directors being low income or residents serve through the program. Um, so that 15% of the total grant would be 59,000. And the city of Santa Cruz has currently two CHODOs. We have Habitat for Humanity and Mid Peninsula Housing, our Mid Pen. And we anticipate that we'll get an application um, coming soon before our second public hearing from First Community Housing, which is working on a number of affordable housing projects in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, so with what's left over and our prior reserves, our new amount available for future housing projects will be about $1.1 million when a project's ready to move forward um, because it's kind of a small pot um, in the large scheme of things because housing projects need so much. So again, that's a total of a little under 1.27 million. So based on the budget we get today, we're gonna to be able to draft our 2021-2022 annual action plan. And then we're gonna bring that again um, to a second public hearing where we get final approval, finalize the budget. And this will allow us to hit our HUD required deadline. Um, and then if we hit those milestones along the way, funding should be uh, available as early as July 1st. So that's it for our presentation. Please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, Tiffany. I'll go ahead and open it up for questions from council. Are there any council members that have questions regarding this? Really thorough presentation and a really great staff report. Um, very easy to follow um, what, what is a very complicated formula that you guys have to work with, so thank you. Okay, um, I will go ahead and take this out to um, any members of the public that might be interested. So if you are interested in commenting on the 2021-2022 Housing and Urban Development Action Plan, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will be then set to two minutes. And I do see a phone number ending in 5747. Go ahead, please. Looks like you're unmuted. You should be able to go. If your phone number ending in 5747, it looks like we you're unmuted and you should be able to speak. Uh, if you have your phone number ending in 5747, it looks like you're unmuted on our end. Um, maybe try pressing star nine again. Bonnie, do you have any advice? <laughs> there you go. Try pressing star nine again and see if we can get you Hello. online. There you go. Okay. Welcome, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. This is Edgar Londos with Nueva Vista Community Resources. Um, I would just like to take a brief moment to thank uh, city staff as well as city council for the support. Um, and definitely, you know, 
we're very grateful and thankful for all the support that we received last year, as you saw from the highlight. Um, we certainly kept our doors open during the pandemic, and we've been just simply uh, very grateful for the funding to be able to provide services in this time of need, you know, with this pandemic and how everything changed. So simply just wanted to take the time to thank everyone for all their hard work and support. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar, and thank you for all your work for the community. Is there anyone else in the um, audience today, the attendees, that would like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll return it back to Council for deliberation and action. And Council Member Watkins. Uh, no, I just also want to echo your comments, Mayor, and thank our staff and Tiffany for the presentation and just the work and the community engagement. It's always nice when we get more than we anticipated, so, you know, exclamation mark on that, as well as sort of extending our thanks to Edgar and the staff um, who are doing really important work in our community as well. So with that, unless there's any um, further deliberation amongst the council, I'm happy to move the recommendation before us. Okay. And Councilmember Cummings, did you have any questions or comments or second? Um, just wanted to thank the staff for all their work and for bringing us forward and I'm really excited that we're able to provide the support we are for the organizations in our community. It seems like we're almost you know, meeting everyone's funding needs. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for their hard work and I'll go ahead and second the motion. Okay, great. And Councilmember Brown. I just wanted to add my thank you to the staff for all of your work to prepare this uh, this um, action plan for us, but also um, for the, the care that you give in um, engaging directly with our community partners who receive funding and who provide these really critical services. Um, and I know that you, you do that, you know, you go above and beyond the, um, you know, what's necessary to get these plans together and do the formal, um, uh, submission. So um, thank you for, for everything that you do. And thank you to um, Edgar for uh, coming in and uh, reminding us that um, Nueva Vista is one of those programs and um, very important part of our community. Great. So we have a motion uh, made by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Cummings uh, to approve the initial funding awards for the fiscal year 2022 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Annual Action Plan for both Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnerships Program. And could we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to item number 21, which is school district and employer sponsored housing amendments to affordable housing inclusionary ordinance. Uh, our presenters are going to be Jessica DeWitt with the Housing and Community, uh, she's our Housing and Community Development Manager and Jessica Malor, a Management Analyst. Um, I believe Jessica, you are, yeah. So I've got, we've got two presenters and um, I wanna welcome uh, Council Member Golder. Uh, welcome to the meeting. And uh, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to come on out, comment on, um, you'll want to um, call in now using the instructions on your screen. And the order today for this item will be a presentation um, by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Okay. So welcome back, Jessica. Quick, quick turnaround there. But you guys did such an amazing job. You've caught us up. So we're we're now completely caught up and on time. So thank you for your great reports. Go ahead, I'll turn it over to you. 
you, Jessica. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council. What we're presenting to you today are the remaining inclusionary ordinance amendments that staff and the Planning Commission Housing Subcommittee worked on over the last few months. In the first part of the presentation, I'll discuss the employer-sponsored housing recommendation, and then Jess Miller, also from our housing team, will discuss the ordinance cleanup items. Here you have the recommendation for the proposed inclusionary ordinance in Chapter 24.16, and it includes the entire section because the cleanup amendments are scattered throughout. So why are we bringing an employer-sponsored housing ordinance amendment proposal forward? In December 2019, the Council provided direction to explore ways to make the inclusionary ordinance more effective for workforce housing projects. At that same meeting, the Santa Cruz City Schools District raised concerns on the increase of the city inclusionary requirement to 20% and how that would impact the feasibility of their proposed employee housing project. The goal of this proposed ordinance amendment is to help provide more opportunities for affordable housing that retain the local workforce. The dilemma is that several people in our local workforce fall into the moderate and middle income categories, and these households don't qualify for the traditional form of affordable housing, but they also can't afford market rate housing either. This is the case with the Santa Cruz City Schools District where they're having a lot of challenges attracting and retaining their teachers and support staff. So city staff and the housing subcommittee focused on the school district and their proposed employee housing project on the west side as a case study for how to craft an ordinance for employer-sponsored housing. We studied models for developing school district housing in other jurisdictions and looked at what financing tools are being used to fund this type of housing. For example, the city of Mountain View has a project where they're using a public-private partnership to build market rate, school district, and city employee housing all together on the same site. Other jurisdictions are employing ballot measures, certificates of participation, general obligation bonds to finance school district housing, and another source of taxes and bond financing, and one bond financing tool that staff is taking a closer look at and plans to bring back to a future council meeting is the California Community Housing Agency bond financing. So in addition to looking at how these projects are financed, we also took a closer look at the city schools district employee income levels, including those hardest to attract and retain to better understand how they compare with the city's inclusionary, inclusionary affordable ability requirements, big mouthful. Several of the salary levels fall into the moderate and middle income categories. Unlike market rate housing that will charge the highest rents the market will bear, employers providing employee housing are highly motivated to charge affordable rents to retain employees. With a 100% employee housing project, it becomes really challenging to provide affordable rents for all of the employee rental apartments while still needing to meet the city's inclusionary requirements that may not match all of the affordability levels that will help retain local employees. We have also been tracking on recent state legislation focused on school district employee housing, like Assembly Bill uh, 3308 and the Teacher Housing Act of 2016. AB 3308 was just approved last fall and its provisions roll up into the Teacher Housing Act uh, of 2016. So here are a few of the key points from, for, oops, from that act. If you back up one more slide, just, yeah, just two, two on this one and then we'll go to the next one. So for the teacher or school district employee definition section, it, it gets very specific on wanting to be, the, the employee must be from an employee, a, a unified school district as well as um, it, it, through pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and grades one through nine. It could also be an employee school district, or an elementary school district with the same qualifications as a unified school district, but it could go through grades eight, or it could be a high school district with grades nine through 12. So the state legislation also requires that the rental housing be located on school district owned land. So there's, other key points to this Teacher Housing Act are that the school can prior, school district can prioritize and restrict occupancy to school district teachers and staff if local, state, or tax credit funding is used to build the rental housing. 
The district may also allow local public employees and other members of the public to occupy the housing, but the school district employees will always have priority. And then the, another key point is the housing must be a majority serving low or moderate income households. So for the city's proposed school district housing amendment, it mirrors the state law on the Teacher Housing Act that we just discussed. So you can see here, it's for rental, rental developments only. Again, it prioritizes and restricts occupancy to school district teachers and staff. It allows the school districts to rent to public employees or members of the public if they can't find a staff member to rent the units. And then the majority is for low and moderate income households. So for the general employer-sponsored housing amendment, it has the same requirements as the school district, except that at least 75% of the housing must be rented to the employer's employees at all times. The employers may allow members of the public to live or work, that live or work um, in the city or county of Santa Cruz per our code section 2416.045 to occupy the housing. But again, the employer's employees still have the priority. And then the, another difference is the majority, instead of just some, the majority of the rental units must receive public funding from local, state, or federal funds, affordable housing funds, or affordable housing tax credits. Now, Jess is going to talk more about the cleanup amendments proposed. Thanks for the introduction, Jessica. Um, the cleanup amendments are coming before you today in response to city council action that was taken on December 12, 2019, where council directed staff to review the inclusionary ordinance for any inconsistencies and bring any amendments first to planning commission and then to council for consideration. So the amendments we're presenting today are not exhaustive and we do anticipate further amendments to the ordinance will likely occur in the future as we continue to refine the ordinance based on our community's needs. So I've grouped them together um, kind of the way I did in the staff report for these slides. Um, so the majority of, of our amendments today are located in the definition section of our inclusionary ordinance. And the first amendment is actually gonna specify that the definition of affordable ownership cost applies to low income for inclusionary units. And our legal counsel advised us that we separate very low and moderate affordable ownership cost definitions from the low income definition in an effort to be consistent with other sections of our code. And so we're recommending that we cite the very low and moderate affordable ownership defin cost definitions that's actually found in our, in our density bonus ordinance. So that way we'll be consistent between the two parts of code. Um, our next group of amendments pertain to definitions of households at different affordability levels. Again, our legal counsel recommended that our ordinance reference the California Code of Regulations because this is actually gonna direct anyone who is reading our ordinance to the actual income limits that the state releases each year for each category instead of directing them as we did previously to the language that defines how you calculate it. This way people are gonna actually be able to find the, the up-to-date values each year when they check. Um, next, we have the addition of SOU as a type of inclusionary unit. So we currently don't have a reference to an SOU, which is a small ownership unit uh, in, in the inclusionary ordinance. Um, however, our inclusionary requirements do apply to SOU projects. So these amendments will explicitly include SOU as a type of inclusionary unit. And our SOU definition is actually um, coming from a different section of our municipal code. So if there's any changes made to that section of code, our ordinance should be updated by reference. And we also have some clarifying changes that our legal counsel advised um, pertaining to residential development definition and then the applicability of the ordinance. And then we have Amendments 10 and 11, which are for our small rental projects for the fractional inclusionary requirements. So this is gonna be a rental project that's between five and nine units. So currently our ordinance is silent on that fractional requirement for 
those small projects. So if we have a, a 1.7 requirement, we don't say what happens to the 0.7 in that case. Um, but our proposed amendment is actually going to treat smaller rental projects the same way that we treat the larger, which is 10 plus unit rental projects. So this is gonna make it more clear for staff, for developer applicants when they come in, they're gonna know what their requirement is. And it's gonna be more clear for the public as well to understand what that requirement is. So they can kind of get an idea before you know we have our public meetings. And this is, this is for the fractional uh, requirement only. It's not gonna change how we apply for the, full, the whole unit component. Um, and then there, you may notice there's a second number 11 that we've marked with a star. And that's because this change was cited in our staff report under the employer-sponsored housing section, but it's really more of a cleanup item. And this is from our legal team advising us to add language that ensures affordable units are constructed in a development project, making sure that that funding is secured before the council would approve any alternate method of compliance. And then our final amendment was, again, a suggestion from our legal counsel in response to some litigation uh, pertaining to the Housing Accountability Act. It's just making sure that we have the authority to have implementation guidelines, which are complementary to our ordinance and help explain things in a more easier to understand manner for staff for developers and for the public. So today we're recommending that you take the action as outlined on this slide. And then before we turn it over for questions, um, Jessica and I wanted to thank the Planning Commission and, and specifically the Planning Commission Housing Subcommittee because they spent a lot of time and effort helping us craft this recommendation and the language that's before you today. They did a, a great job and we just wanted to publicly thank them for their efforts. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Jessica, both Jessica's. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. It was very clear. I'll go ahead and see if there are any questions from council members on this. Council member Brown. It's just a quick question. Thank you for bringing this to us. And I know it's been a long time in the making and a lot of effort has gone into it. And so I really appreciate staff and the planning commissioners who um, rolled up their sleeves to, to get us this, <laughs> this new language. Um, I'm just wondering about, it, could, could you, I'm not sure who this is for, your team, somebody on the team, um, why the, um, the ordinance changes aren't um, specifically targeted to public sector workforce housing. Um, you know, it kind of came up as a result of the school district, um, you know, case, and there, there is state law around that, but I'm just wondering um, why uh, not just public sector, given that those are jobs that tend to be, um, you know, uh, lower, um, waged and and the need is really great. So just if, if you could explain where, how that decision got made, thanks. Yes, happy to do that. Um, and actually this was a, a topic of a lot of conversation with the, the uh, housing subcommittee. Um, we actually brought in outside legal counsel who are experts in um, discrimination and fair housing law. And what's really happening is for us to be able, for us to limit this to just public employees, it's, it's a, it creates a discrimination issue, a source of discrimination for income. And so we were highly advised to not do that. Um, but, but in that vein, we have, in the language of the ordinance, really, really tried to uh, promote having, you know, funding that's coming from a public funding source that supports affordable housing. And so we're hoping that we're really focused on, you know, getting to those, those income levels and getting to those folks who need it. Are there other council members with questions? Not seeing any. I do have a quick question, um, Jessica. I'm, I just want to understand the um, the change um, in the code. Um, it's reference. It's on twenty one point page twenty one point six in the packet. Is that it's the uh, number ten and number eleven on the cleanup um, list? Um, yeah. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So. 
And I know this fractional inclusionary requirement uh, goes with the larger. So this will, um, I'm just trying to understand, is this adding that fractional requirement to five to 10 dwelling units proposed projects? So what this change is actually going to do is we're going to remove, so if there's a fractional requirement of 0.7 or less, as it states in our code, for larger rental projects, there's no requirement for that. So if it's uh, 2.7 or 3.7 or 3.5, there's no requirement for the 0.5. But if there's a requirement of lar more than 0.7, so if it's 3.8 or 4.9, we'd round it up to the next whole number for inclusionary units. And this is really just a way for us to be consistent between the two different sizes of projects. The subcommittee um, last year was um, really supportive of trying to treat the rental projects the same because we wanna try and encourage like dedicated rentals um, in our city instead of just having rentals in small uh, ownership projects because that way it's a little, um, there's not that confidence that that unit could be there long-term because there's always the option to sell those units that are rented in an ownership project mm -hmm. as we allow in our code. So this way we're trying to incentivize um, dedicated rentals that will be you know, recorded in a, in a map that they won't be sold later. Um, so it, it's not necessarily doing anything, doing away with a fraction, it's just treating them the same. So anything 0.7 or less, there's no uh, fractional requirement for inclusionary units, but anything above 0.7, we're gonna still require that additional unit. So this isn't adding a new, this is not a new requirement for the five to nine units, it's just consistency now with the with the other part of the ordinance with that, the way the fractional, the way that the answer when you end up with that fractional interest. Got it. Exactly. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> okay, that's helpful. Okay, any uh, last call on any other questions or from council? No, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and take it out to the public. Um, Mr. Phillips. Uh, yes, uh, I discount previous approval of this ordinance going to the subcommittee for revision since two of the four three voting ayes were by members soon after recall booted by the public. Item 21 is red line, expends public monies or properties to develop housing creating special interest exclusion exclusionary housing for priority exclusive use by government employees to make those affordable at public expense or property. This is ethically problematic as government employees are subsidized then by the taxpayers in perpetuity, low rents regardless of salary. Why government employees at public expense are so special in this regard is mythically justified as to me some government employees make the jack compared to the same jobs in the private sector. I realize the state originally allowed this kind of thing and the essence is not all your idea, but assuring some even highly paid government employees don't have to compete for low cost housing with the public is indefensible. The government getting into the housing ownership biz is not just a little bit Calizuela socialist. Just because the state has allowed this kind of self-serving corrupt special interest pseudo-socialism doesn't mean you have to pursue it. Teachers here make 65,000 average base wages, which per capita is not low income. Most low income earners are under 25 or retired or female no husband or almost no income single men or huge six plus member family households, not teachers. Santa Cruz actually has a higher median household income income than the state and has widened that in the last 10 years to almost 91,000 per household and per capita income also remains higher at 42,000 but uh, over the same time frame uh, 10 years or so uh, the, the gap between the state and Santa Cruz is closing rapidly. SC is bifurcated though in that a higher than state percentage 20% of households earn less than 30,000, 36% earn less than 50, bit of a gap to 75,000 then a greater percentage of the state at 41% earn 75 to 200k and has a higher percentage percentage of rich households earning over 200K at 16.2%, possibly, I suspect, owing to the fact eight of the top 10 employers are government entities and the other two are healthcare providers. Most all the rich people are married couples or men. Single women dominate the medium income brackets. Seems to me promoting marriage with fewer children might do more for household affordability. Ideally, you would allow the free market to address the low cost um, housing and not with more regulations or unqualified self-serving subsidies. Uh, with the kind of monetary debasement going on now, a delayed inflation surge like the 2012-2018 surge is a common. Okay, thank you.
And next up we have a uh, phone number ending in 9951. You're unmuted, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, there you go. Welcome. Hi, this is Kristen Rowe, Superintendent for Santa Cruz City Schools, and I want to express my gratitude to the city staff and the Commission for working with us on this really important project to ensure that we can recruit and retain the best possible uh, teachers and educators to support the youth in our community. 42% um, um, of our employees spend between 30 and 50% of their income on their rent. 25% spend more than 50% of their income on their rent. Um, we have continued to lose teachers every year to the high cost of housing, them leaving to higher paying districts over the hill or in the Carmel or um, Pacific Groves. And um, our ability to recruit and retain teachers is definitely tied to being able to house them. The other issue we've had is we've had numerous teachers who have declined job offers because they haven't even been able to find a housing unit that, you know, no rentals available. So we're super grateful to the city for your support in our efforts and um, we are, are looking forward to seeing these amendments made so that we can move forward with a, a housing project that will help us bring the best possible uh, teachers to serve the children in our community. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you for everything you're doing um, for everyone in our community and their children. Um, and I agree, this is a really, really important action by the council today. So thank you for your leadership in working with our staff and the planning commission and others to, to um, bring this forward. I know that you've put a lot of time in as well. Okay, I'll bring it back over to the council and I see uh, council member Golder. I also just wanted to thank everybody that's worked so hard on this over the years. I know it's been a long time coming and having served on several interview panels for the Santa Cruz City School District over the years in my capacity, um, as a professional and as a parent representative, I have to echo what Superintendent Monroe said and that it's really difficult to recruit and retain um, teachers and staff for certain positions, you know, uh, especially in um, science and math in the high school district and for special ed as well. And so I think that this is a, a really important step in, in, um, in keeping the teachers here and keeping them part of our community. And so I'm happy to move the item. I just saw a couple colleagues pop their hands up. So um, I don't know if you have comments or questions or but if, if, no, if I'm happy to move it. Muted, my dog's barking, so I'm muted. Um, I have a count, uh, uh, motion by council member Golder, uh, council member uh, Watkins, I saw your hand go up next, and then vice mayor Bruner. Thank you, um, Mayor Myers and Councilmember Golder and to the Planning Commission and the staff and to our school partners for bringing this forward. And um, I just, I am happy to second the motion. I just wanna echo the comments that were made in regards to really just sincere appreciation to getting us to this point, but also hopes and that we'll be able to support more teachers being able to um, be in our community, be part of our community and see these types of projects move forward. It's, it's really essential for all the reasons that were brought up. And um, we do know that we have a huge need. And so this was a concern when the ordinance passed prior and having this as uh, the direction moving forward to really ensure that we're not um, having any unintended consequences of, of our policies to not support these types of projects is really critical. So thank you very much and happy to second it and um, looking forward to seeing more movement and traction as a result. Great. So we have a motion on the table um, and Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, thank city staff on this and especially the Planning Commission Housing Subcommittee for the time spent in going through those cleanup updates. I wanted to call out uh, the cleanup number two. Um, really important to actually call out the current numbers of income limits rather than the calculations. I think um, overall, um, 
I think it's great to have the options for making the ordinance more effective and prior, prioritizing the flexibility for the workforce housing projects and um, really in, intending to meet the needs of the workforce. Um, so I'm happy that there is a first and a second um, and uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So we have a uh, motion by Council Member Golder, seconded by Council Member Watkins to introduce for publication an ordinance amending Title 24 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, the zoning ordinance, part one of chapter 24.16, affordable housing provisions, including sections 24.16.010 through 24.16060. And could I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Did Councilmember Boulder get kicked off? Did she get booted off? Oh, her, her internet crashed, yeah. Um, do you want to, she's trying to get back in. Do you want to wait so that you have a Yeah, full let's give her a minute. Vote? Yeah, I don't, I'd, I'd like her vote to be recorded. I can text her. I see her coming in. Are you on your screen? Yes. Yeah. So I'm just going to start with the votes again. Um, Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? I apologize, my internet stopped. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you so much to staff for that. I know it's a lot of work and I really appreciate all the work you guys have done on that important item. And next up we have item Number 23, oh, excuse me, 22, our annual housing element and general plan progress reports. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now's the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, today we have Catherine Donovan, who's senior planner with our planning department as our presenter. Welcome, Catherine. Welcome. Um, can you see the presentation here? We can, yes. Good. Sometimes I don't get it up there right. Um, good afternoon, Council. This is Catherine Donovan, senior planner with the Advanced Planning Division. Um, every year, the all jurisdictions within the state are required to provide two reports, one on the general plan and a, the second on the housing element. Um, and they are uh, information on the progress that we have made in meeting our general plan requirements and our housing element requirements. The, re the general plan report has no specific format but it should include information on general plan amendments, ordinance and policy amendments, um, information regarding uh, intergovernmental cooperation and on how the city has promoted infill development as well as general information on major development projects. The housing element report is um, on a form that is provided by the state and in the last um, three years since 2018, 
significant new requirements have been added every year. Um, the reports are due to the state on April 1st, and um, if we don't submit the reports, we are not eligible for certain state grant opportunities. So it's not that the reports make us eligible, but if we, if we don't submit the reports, we are not eligible. The first report is the general plan annual report. And as I said earlier, um, it covers general information. Um, and um, this year we covered um, specific projects. I did not include all of them on here, um, but um, this represents some of the projects, the nine, 119 Coral Street project the Wharf Master Plan, the Go Santa Cruz Program, our progress on the Climate Action Plan, um, our, our new wayfinding um, program, the Resilient Coast Project, the Circles Development Project, um, our progress on the rail trail, and the um, 818 Pacific, the um, Pacific Station South Project, as well as um, the Objective Standards Project. For our Housing Element Annual Report, um, this report is on how we have been doing on meeting our regional housing needs allocation. Um, and um, for those of you who are not familiar with this um, term, the the State Department of Finance um, anticipates the population growth within the state and um, assigns sh shares of that population to the local um, government organ association, which then hands down specific requirements based on um, affordability levels to all of the local jurisdictions. This reporting period is 2015 to 2023, the, the cycle is an eight year cycle. This year we have, this cycle, we have an additional year in there because they're, um, we're catching up so that, um, so that we can uh, be in, in the same cycle as the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy um, so that those two things are aligned. Um, and in this RENA cycle, Santa Cruz has a total of 747 housing units assigned to it. And this shows the breakdown. Um, as you can see, this table shows from 2015 through 2020. Um, 2020 was a, a, a we, we developed a smaller number of housing units. And I'm, although I don't have uh, specific evidence, I strongly suspect that COVID-19 played a role in that. And as in the past year, um, we have met all of our arena targets except for the very low income housing. And very low income housing has, is always difficult um, to complete, but um, we have some, some new tools that are coming online and we're hoping that we'll be able to um, get more of that, that very low housing built in the city. Um, this chart shows just a breakdown of development activity in 2020. Um, it's divided up by, by the levels of um, approval. So you can see the, the first step in a development project is submitting a planning application. We have, in 2020, we had um, applications for 260 units. Um, in that same year, 126 units were approved. These are not necessarily the same units because they're some that were submitted in 2019 may have been approved in 2020. 
Um, and then once the planning approval has been granted, then the developer can submit for building permits. You can see we had 95 units submitted this year, 79 units issued, and sorry, I can't see that last number. Uh, 218 units were were final this year, um, and because those those permits overlap, you can't add them all together to get a total of of what's in the pipeline. But this gives you a sense of of just how many units we have. Um, you know, there's there's quite a few that are in the pipeline right now, and I'm keeping this presentation short because I know you have a long agenda today. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to help you. Thank you, Catherine. Our, our, go ahead and uh, turn it back to the council for questions. Any, let's see, council member Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the report and for putting both uh, the oral report and this um, this really helpful uh, written report with the charts and all of that. It's, it's really um, great to just be able to walk through it and begin to understand with all of the complexity <laughs> that is involved in where, you know, how we categorize and, um, you know, where things go. So th I really appreciate it. I have um, a question about, I have one that's very specific. Um, and so I'll ask that one first. In the report, I believe it's page four, um, there is a list of uh, projects where a pre-application uh, or uh, um, application for entitlements or request for entitlements um, where the affordability levels have yet to be determined. And I absolutely understand in general why that's the case. I'm wondering if you could just explain what's happening with the Coral Street, 119 Coral Street, um, the affordability levels pending. My understanding was that it's supposed to be an you know, entirely low-income project. So I just it, so it's just affordability levels within the very low, extremely low, low categories. Is that where? Okay. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and then um, another question I have is um, actually it's just really a, a basic question. Why why wasn't the, the planning commission involved in reviewing the document? Um, it, this. As you might guess by looking at the complexity of the form, this is something that I barely get done in time to present it to the council before it's due on April 1st. So we don't have the extra three weeks that it would take to take it to the Planning Commission. It's been our practice that once it's been submitted to um, City Council and you've reviewed it and we send it off to the state that we, that we do take it to the Planning Commission um, for their information but we just don't have time. It's not something that they would be making changes to because it's strictly a factual report. So um, so we do we do bring it to them. It's just after the fact. Got it. And then I have a, a question that's more of a comment around the um, 650 square foot cutoff around the ADU, you know, where they fit with low income versus um, you know, a moderate income, but I'll, I'll save that for when we go into deliverance. So that's all for now. Thank you, Catherine. Sure. Council member Cummings. Mayor, and I, I have a, a similar question regarding the um, 650 square foot. Um, but the first question I had is related to the table. Um, there was the permitted units issued by affordability and arena targets. Uh, one of the things that catches my attention is that, um, you know, for example, with the moderate uh, income units, none of them are deed restricted. And for the low income units, um, it looks like some, but probably close to 100 were not deed restricted. And one of the things that I'm really concerned with, and it's come up in meetings before, 
is that you know we've heard that if you don't deed restrict a unit, then you can't guarantee its affordability moving into the future. And um, you know, given that we don't have any mechanism for tracking rental units within the city of Santa Cruz, I'm really interested in knowing you know how many of these units actually remain in that affordability category after the permits have been issued and after they've been built because. Again, if there's no way, if they're not deed restricted, then they could say we're going to be we're an affordable unit, and then the city, you know, checks it off as meeting one of those requirements. But then, without there being any restrictions, the person could just rent them at market rate potentially. So, what is actually keeping these units within those categories? So, one, we're meeting our goals, but more importantly, so that we we have this stock of affordable housing in the community. Um, those units are almost entirely ADU units. They might also be um, SROs or SOUs, and they're generally the the HTD refers to them as affordable by design. Um, I explained in the staff report how we allocate the ADUs based on the on the on a survey that we've done and on the, the size of the ADU. And um, it, it, similar with the SROs and SOUs, that usually when you have something that's only 300 square feet, it's going to be rented at a lower price than if you had a, you know, a, a 1,200 square foot unit. It's, that's, just, that's just the way the market works. So while I do share your concerns about if it's not restricted, with the ADUs, um, we have not been able to, um, once that, as I again explained in the, in the staff report, we used to offer a program to, um, to provide uh, incentives to build ADUs by waiving the city's development fees. However, there was a legal determination that Waiving fees was the equivalent of um, providing uh, financing for a project, and so that made prevailing wage kick in. And the cost, the additional cost of paying prevailing wage made the fee waivers um, not really an incentive any longer because the, the cost didn't pencil out. If you had to pay a prevailing wage, you were paying more to build it in the first place. So I do believe that, especially our smaller ADUs, even though we don't have a recorded um, affordability on those units, because they're smaller, they will over time always rent for a lower cost than a larger unit. And that's also the same with the SRO and SOU. It, it, the numbers may not be exactly the same, um, but there there may be other units that are. I mean, sometimes when I'm writing in that, when I know the units that are being developed, and there's no affordability agreement, and there's there's no way for me to say that it's affordable by design, and yet I know it's not going to be a high income unit, a higher income unit. I still have to list it as above moderate. So I think it, these sorts of things, um, over time, they do tend to equalize. I wish we could. I wish we could use. I wish we could uh, restrict the ADUs more because we're getting we get so many of them, um, but we just don't have any method to do that. Yeah, that's what I guess that's one of my concerns too because. Um, as someone who's in the rental market, um, you know, I've seen some of these kinds of units, you know, be very expensive for, you know, and, and outside of the range of what, you know, what, I guess it's, it's really not clear what the definition then is of, you know, an ADU that's, that's for moderate income or low income, because even with the size of the units, a lot of it then what ends up happening is although it might be listed you know within our reports as market rate or um, moderate for low income when you 
are engaged in a highly competitive housing market. Um, we hear stories about people who, you know, it just ends up going to, to whoever the highest bidder is oftentimes. So, and with a lot of, um, uh, I wouldn't say restrictions, but um, oftentimes when people are applying for um, these kinds of units, you know, tenants are being asked what their income is and what they can afford, and that can influence um, what people are willing to charge because we hear stories about people who say, you know, I've got this person who's willing to pay more for this unit, so, you know, you're not, I'm not going to be able to rent this to you. And so what we, you know, are listing as being for moderate and low income, um, it's hard to know what that actual reality is playing out because if people can afford it, they'll pay more. And oftentimes, um, without it being de-restricted, it's, it's going to get into that kind of market dynamic of whoever of, of it can go to the highest bidder. So, um, again, I think it's really important for us as a council to consider ways that we can track our rental housing uh, through data. And I think it's really important that if there's ways that we can encourage deed restriction on these units, that we try to do so because, um, well, I appreciate um, how we've calculated that uh, for the purposes of meeting our arena goals. I feel uncomfortable not knowing, um, you know, what these units are actually going for and are they actually um, staying and aff staying affordable or if they're actually, um, you know, going outside of those categories and then we're really not being clear and transparent with the community on, on our affordable housing stock. There's a, a, another twist in there too, and that is, the data that we got back from our survey indicated that a significant number of our ADUs are actually not going being rented to the general public. They're being used by um, family members and often are not charged any rent. Um, so, and and there's sort of there's two ways to look at it. One is that those aren't really even rental units, but on the other hand, they're providing housing for real people who because they're not paying anything, um, you know, they, they are almost certainly low-income people. They're, they're, you know, it's probably relatives who are not making enough of an income to be able to go out and, and rent a place without help. So yeah. there, there, are, there are many factors involved and we, we just can't, we have so little control. Um, we, we do the best we can with the counting, but, I agree with you, and and you know my philosophy, and I think the city's goal is to simply get as much, you know. Yes, we want to track our numbers for rena, for the rena targets, and we do have to meet those requirements or, or attempt to, but really we just want to build as much affordable housing as we can. Right. Yeah, and and thank you for those. Um, I guess one similar question related to this: Is there any financial calculation that's made to determine, you know, you know, if there's a unit that's less than 650 square feet in the community, like what's being charged for that and what units that are over 650 square feet um, are going for? Because again, if there's, if there's a way for us to get at some of that financial information, I think it would be helpful for us moving forward. Yeah, and this was, this was sort of a quick and dirty, the survey we had at um, the, it was a survey that was sent out to the owners of the ADUs, and it, it was, we tried to be as simple as possible because the simpler it is, the more responses we get. Mm -hmm. And it broke the ADUs up into, I, I think it was like 200, I think, I think actually we stopped at 650, so it was, is your, is your unit below 650? And then if it was above, it went up, I think, in about 200 square foot inter mm -hmm. intervals. And then we, um, Ask the price again in in um, I don't remember now what the what the price inter intervals were, but it wasn't a specific price. It was an interval of 100 or 150 or 200. I think it was 150. Um, and then when we compared that, we had to extrapolate because you know the the cost of the unit needs to be based on the number of bedrooms. So. To make it fair, we were very conservative and assumed that they were all one bedroom or fewer and that it was a one person family. And that's probably not true at all. There's there's many ADUs that have two people in them and there's many ADUs that are more than one bedroom. 
but this is a conservative look. So if you factor that in um, and, and accounted for the number of units that we counted as moderate units that might actually be housing more people and so and have more bedrooms so they would actually have qualified for low, we're probably still, our numbers are probably still gonna track in another five years or so. So it's, it's not as bad as it could be. And I have uh, one follow-up question. Is that, are the results from that survey available? Like, is there a way for us to receive a copy? No, they were, it was a, it was a confidential survey. So we're doing everything we can to get people to respond. No, but I mean, in terms of like this, a summary of the results from those surveys that could be available for council so we can see the number of people surveyed, um, square footage, what people are charging, because if the results- I can go back and see if I can find that, yeah. That'd be great. And, and we then, probably have to do some cleanup because it was, you know, we were just doing quick and dirty for our own purposes. Okay. Yeah, and if there's an opportunity for us to provide direction, maybe not today, but, you know, for a similar effort to be done, I think it would be beneficial for us to kind of see where our rental housing stock is at. And then, um, and then I just want to make a point that um, when there are multiple people oftentimes living in ADUs, the unfortunate thing is that the cost isn't shared between the two individuals. Oftentimes we see people charging based on the number of individuals. So mm -hmm. for example, if you have a house and there's a couple that's renting out a room, sometimes they'll get charged more because it's not a single individual. Mm -hmm. And so that also can complicate things and I understand that as well. But I just wanna thank you again for pulling this together. And I think that um, you know there are further discussions that need to be had over how we can collect more data and better understand what's happening in our rental housing market. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Well, I was going to save it for later, but since um, <laughs> this Councilmember Cummings brought it up, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the um, that question around ADUs and how they're designated. Um, and I understand, you know, the survey was, I, I, I remember when we got some information about that survey and it was really helpful in getting a better understanding and not making assumptions. So I appreciate that. Um, it is a few years old and um, it was a survey of existing ADUs and we know that um, the ADUs that are being built are not necessarily going to, ha you know, they're not gonna necessarily be at the same rent level um, for a variety of reasons, right? I mean, the cost of producing an ADU is gonna automatically uh, lead to increased rents, right? So if you have one, it's been there and yeah. you already own your home, it's a very different scenario. So, um, and I'm just in general, I, I don't, I think I say it all the time, I'm, I'm uh, skeptical of the affordable by design concept um, in, in communities like ours in particular. Um, so I'm just wondering if you, the 650 foot cutoff, was that something that was determined here? Um, and I know that's a, that's, a, that's a cutoff that's used for other purposes um, when thinking about ADUs and in, um, you know, permitting, but is that um, something that we could think about reducing the square footage because- Yes, yes. The, that, the survey that we used for this was actually designed, um, Sarah Noisy designed it when she was working on the ADU ordinance a year and a half ago. And so it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't actually intended for this purpose, but it provided us with that information. And it was our intent to um, create a survey that would be specifically for this purpose and to, um, to do it probably every other year, but we kind of got, um, this was not a good year for that. We, we had more work and less time this year. So I'm hoping that, that we will have that um, in place in time for next year. So we'll have a better survey, better information. We'll ask about smaller units. And you know, the, the, the hardest thing is to design it so that people will actually answer it. I, I appreciate your efforts, and uh, I'll just put in a plug for um, you know taking making it a priority to do some of that surveying. We don't have a rental registry, so we're we're kind of we guess a lot. We're you know shooting in the dark. So um, you know as we move forward, it would be really great to hear about your you know from staff about thoughts on how to how to make that survey 
you know, effective, uh, informative, and um, something that people will respond to. <laughs> Thank you, council member. I'm not seeing any other council members with their hands up, so I'll go ahead and take it out to public comment. Uh, and I have a uh, phone number ending in 0030. Press star nine to unmute and we're available. Hello, uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Um, I was just calling to uh, 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 echo what uh, Council Members Brown and, and Cummings mentioned regarding the um, uh, ADU affordability in the, the Arena Progress Report. Um, I, I really, you know, want to encourage the city to uh, produce as much uh, low-income affordable housing as possible, and uh, uh, certainly ADUs could potentially do that. Um, I just worry that that uh, the uh, the numbers of, of new produce, newly produced ADUs aren't necessarily, um, uh, or shouldn't necessarily be um, considered low income or moderate income um, because we are using, you know, a, a rental survey that's a couple years old. I would hope that the city uh, commits to having an annual survey for this sort of thing or a rental registry so that we actually know what the numbers are. And I'm worried that, um, you know, the justification to HCD in trying to, to um, uh, justify using uh, the, uh, there's, a <clears throat> for example, 100 low income ADUs below 650 square feet that we're counting in our uh, low income arena numbers. Um, uh, HCD will want uh, justification for that, and I don't know that we can really say, you know, a two or three year old survey that we did of existing ADUs uh, satisfies this requirement. Um, I don't want to, you know, curtail production of ADUs at all. I, I just want to have. Um, some more realistic numbers. And um, I would hope that, you know, we're able to produce as many ADUs as possible and accurately uh, reflect them in in our, our arena numbers. I just don't know if the methodology that we're using right now uh, to do that is, is accurate or not. Thank you. Thank you. Bring it back to council. Um, and this again is, uh, um, I am to uh, accept the 2020 general plan and housing element annual progress report and submit it to the California Office of Planning and Research and uh, Office of Housing and Community Development. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I had uh, one quick question for, uh, for the legal counsel or maybe for the, for someone else on planning, but, um, to Mr. Sonnenfeld point and to some points that were brought up. I'm just wondering, is there a way the city could create policy uh, that would, policy around deed restricting ADUs that are produced for the purposes of rental housing? Um, I think to the point that was just brought up, you know, one of the things that brings to mind is that if someone builds a, let's say, I'm just gonna throw numbers out there, but 800 square foot unit or ADU and, and they built it in 2017 and someone builds one today, you know, they, that if one was considered, you know, moderate income back in 2018, you know, there is the potential if it remains at that level of affordability that it'll go down over time and it'll help fulfill some of those needs of course showing that, hey, you know, this unit is still being rented at this low rate and therefore it actually is helping us meet our affordability numbers. So I'm just wondering if there's any way to deed restrict these so that we, could, so that some of these units that at one point are for moderate incomes will end up in those lower income categories um, versus um, kind of not having any deed restriction which pretty much doesn't really allow for us to keep those, for those units to stay within those categories and they can be moved up at any point in time. So I, I can jump in on that um, and then Cassie, you can fill in any additional information if you'd like. And thank you for that question, Council Member Cummings. It's certainly something um, that I'm sure many are interested in. We actually don't have that ability under the state law. The state regulates what things we can um, require as part of ADUs. And um, 
the affordability restriction is not one of those. And so um, when you saw uh, Sarah Noisy pop on uh, the screen a few moments ago during that discussion, I think that was the point that she was going to um, raise. Um, but um, I'm not aware of, uh, unless it's a, a voluntary requirement. So, you know, we can still offer the, uh, the fee waiver, if someone wants to have this and wants to pay prevailing wage, um, or if someone wants to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, there have been um, instances where a, um, a developer has offered that, for example, um, as a way to exceed um, the requirements. If they're doing a plan development, for example, and they want to provide additional public benefit. Um, and so um, that's, that's what I would comment related to that um, uh, affordability restriction um, be, needing to be voluntary. Um, and then um, I would chime in and uh, I know that Catherine works very closely with um, HCD um, with respect to what can um, and can't be counted in each income category. So I, I see Sarah might want to add something on the ADU um, and affordability restrictions, it appears, and then I'll ask Catherine to um, highlight some of the comments that she's had because I know that she communicates directly with HCD about um, the timing of the survey and the question that she had there, Councilmember Cummings. Um, thanks, Lee. So I just wanted to add this question about um, ADUs and can we restrict them? How can we make sure that they're actually affordable um, is one that is being had statewide. And um, luckily for all of us, in the next, we recently had some state law come down last year that the next time we update our housing element, which for us will be in 2024, we have a requirement to um, show in there some programs of how we're gonna promote affordability for ADUs. So we will have a whole, you know, put on our thinking caps moment when that comes around. Also, luckily for us here in Santa Cruz, um, the Bay Area jurisdictions are a year ahead of us in that cycle where that's gonna be required. So we'll be able to um, hopefully gather some good ideas from other jurisdictions that have you know, had to cross that bridge before we do. Catherine, did you wanna add in as well on the- uh... um, Yeah, I can just say that uh, the survey was done in, two, in spring of 2019. And the data that we're looking at now is for the year of 2020. So it is not, uh, it, I would not consider it out of date um, at this point. We do, we do want to do another survey and um, you know, we have to, I, someone said that we should do it annually and I'd love to do it annually except that we have to deal with, um, you know, this is something that people fill out voluntarily and we don't wanna get survey fatigue because then we won't get any responses at all. And so that was the thinking behind on every other year. We figured that the data would be up to date enough and it might give help us get a better response rate. Okay, thank you. Kathy, I know you were gonna, I wasn't sure if you wanted to weigh in. Lee's got it covered, uh, nothing beyond what he said. Thank you. Thank you, okay. I'm happy to um, move the staff recommendation to accept the 2020 general plan and housing element annual progress reports, direct staff to submit the reports to the California Office of Planning and Research and the Department of Housing and Community Development. And we'll just express again, um, you know, the need for us to really figure out a way to track this housing because um, I'm just, you know, just in conversations with people who are renters in the community, it's just really concerning that some of these units, you know, might not be staying in as affordable units. And if we really are going to commit to making sure that we have a large stock of affordable units in Santa Cruz that we, you know, have a really good understanding of whether units are remaining in those categories or if they're getting, you know, pushed into other categories. So, um, so that's my motion. Okay, do you, okay, okay. Uh, Council Member Brown? No, 
I'll second that. I think the motion was to accept the report for submission. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I'm just trying to think about a way to include some direction to um, the to staff. And I know you're already thinking about ways to do this and, and planning to do it, but include direction to um, staff to um, in next year's process bring um, bring your thoughts to the, the recommendations to council um, on how to more accurately capture levels of affordability um, for non deed restricted units. So I'm just trying to think about like including that as part of the direction today so that we know that's a goal that we want to pursue. Um, so if my if the motion maker is willing, I'd like to just include that as a second piece. Can I I'll just clarify there. in terms of that? Do you want that as part of the motion or do you want it as um, just direction to staff? I, I, I believe that we can, I, I mean, I, I don't know, putting it in the motion will just, I think, make it more clear. So if we could do that, just um, in, in addition, direct staff to um, return to in preparation for next year's annual report return to council with um, thought, uh, recommendations on how to best capture uh, affordability levels in um, non-deed restricted units that are categorized as low income so the motion will be to accept the 2020 general plan and housing element annual progress report and to submit the reports to the California Office of Planning and Research and the Department of Housing and Community Development and direct staff in preparing the 2021 annual progress report to inform council of uh, calculation, calculation, help me out here. Uh, <laughs> so if I could, uh, Mayor, um, so the, to, pro, to direct staff to, as part of the, um, of next year's planning process, to um, include recommendations to the council for ways to more accurately reflect levels of affordability in non-deed restricted units currently categorized as affordable. Tony, or maybe Cassie, you can weigh in. This is a, so I'm understanding, just trying to understand. So the, the, the action is really, it's basically, we're required every year to submit the annual reports according to the calculations and the, I mean, Catherine, you mentioned that this is really basically pulling data and then entering it into the statewide date, into a statewide form, right? And so I'm just trying to, I don't, Catherine, do you, do we, do we make that decision then on how we calc those, do those calculation and then we just put those numbers into the form, correct? Well, um, I just want to make sure that deed restricted, that is, a, um, if they're deed restricted, there's, there's no, that's just counting the numbers. But for the non-deed restricted, um, we have, you know, we could just call all of the, all, all of our ADUs above moderate income, but that wouldn't be accurate either and that would be detrimental for us. And so we have developed this um, methodology. We, be, before we had done the survey, we used to do a um, online survey of rental prices, but that was not accurate either because that just showed what was available at that point in time and the things that are advertised are generally gonna be the higher priced units because the lower priced units never get advertised. They just get passed on to your best friend. Um, so there, there is a, there is a uh, element in here that, that we have some discretion over um, 
how, how we categorize these units as long as it's a methodology that that we it, that, that passes the straight face test basically and specifically I had brought this to um, HCD um, last year and I noticed in their um, in their directions this year they actually mentioned an informal survey as being one method of, of establishing um, affordability for non-deed restricted units. So this is something that they, they recognize as being a valid thing to do. The data point they want to they want to collect. But to date, so if um, Councilor, I just want I just want to make sure the staff can do you know that it fits with you know. So it sounds. Um, so we could include, so it would be to include um, an updated methodology um, to, uh, rec, rec, uh, to count, um, uh, include an updated methodology to account for non-deed non restricted units re reported. Is that what you're getting at or do you have the language written, Sandy? I'm just trying to make sure I'm capturing it because yeah, thank you. No, I don't have a written, I apologize. Um, this was not planned in advance here, but since we're having the conversation, I'd like to reflect it. So um, so the the what I'm, I'm hoping we can get to is a okay, so direct staff in preparing the 2021 annual progress report to include recommendations. Um, to, so in, to include an, up, an updated methodology is fine if you, if, but recommendations seems like an updated methodology for, um, and you can take out recommendations. Um, I have not spelled methodology before. <laughs> to include an updated methodology. O L O O L O G Y. Um, to counsel. Mm -hmm. For for ways to accurately reflect levels of affordability for non-deed restricted units that are categorized as low income. Um, yeah, I would change four ways to in order, now that I'm looking at it, in order to um, more accurately reflect. Yeah. I don't want to suggest that it's, it's not accurate, you know, it's, it's, so more just, you know, uh, more precise, more accurate to more accurately reflect levels of affordability for non use for non-use. So uh, Council Member Brown? Yeah. This is a principal planner, Matt Fenhua. I was just wondering, could you clarify, are you, are you looking for options presented from staff for this or a specific methodology presented? Um, well, I, I guess that's why I use recommendations rather than methodology to start out with because I, I don't want to I don't want to make this so precise that it, it ties your hands in terms of how, you know how to basically I'm just trying to get at how it is that you know you all are thinking about how to more accurately reflect um, what is low income and what isn't and you know it's the standard based on serving you know other you know maybe perhaps reducing the square footage to you know for the affordable by design category um, I don't know that um, it. So does that make sense? Like, I mean, not necessarily like a, a menu of options, but just what are some of the ways that you've come up with to try to better um, capture low in, the level of low income units available that are non-deed restricted? So I, just, I don't know if this yeah, either update. Yeah, yeah thank you. Do you prefer recommendations if it, it does, uh, makes you feel like it's a little more, like it fits better with what you might do coming moving forward, then let's leave it that way. Yeah, I, I do like that language better. We're, we're gonna be okay. starting on our, uh, the housing element update next year, most likely. So that work in thinking about that, that Sarah mentioned and looking at what other cities are doing, uh, we may or may not have started that at that point, but we can certainly include whatever we have at that point in the report next year. So Bonnie, you would take out an, an updated methodology and just go recommendations to council. Is that clear for staff? Yeah. Okay, thumbs up. Okay, great. One, Council Member Brown, the one thing I would um, 
I would like to see maybe we could change is they're categorized as either the three affordability levels or um, affordable housing because low income just restricted to that one designation. And I think that there's moderate, low, and very low. And if I look at the report, then um, the non deed restricted units, for example, moderate was the one that had all non deed restricted, um, and low actually had some that were indeed restricted. So just really trying to get at ensuring that we're doing this calculations for moderate, low, and very low categorization. So, so Bonnie, if you go back, I think you can put that, you can undo that deletion. And then where it says categorized as, it would be moderate, low, and very low income housing. Under, yeah, the back side there. Say it again. So after as, it would be moderate, low, and very low income housing. Low income, low income, period. I don't, I don't know if it has to be housing. Yeah, uh, you could delete housing. Okay. Okay, so the maker of the motion. Sure, yeah, that's fine. I, I'm just most concerned about um, reporting on low income and very low income. Very low is, all, is pretty much always deed restricted is my understanding, so, um, but, I, but that's fine to include them. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion to accept the general plan with the uh, direction to staff, and I'll go ahead and ask for a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers. Aye. Great. Um, so it's 3.48 and uh, we built a break into the meeting today. So we will go ahead and take a break and reconvene at 4.30. And for the public, um, we will start item number 23, which is the downtown plan exp expansion project at 4.30. So thank you everybody. on your uh, cameras. We'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Before we've got a, there's Sandy. I think we're just looking for Martine. Um, Council Member Watkins, when you are ready, turn on your camera and we will go ahead and get started. Got a few, a few more items today. Okay. Uh, next up on our agenda is item number 23, downtown plan expansion, expansion project. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from city council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Our presenter will be Sarah Noyce with uh, Senior Planner with our Planning Department and Van Matt Van Wa, uh, Principal Planner with our Planning Department. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. And again, this is item number 23, the Downtown Plan Expansion Project. So Sarah and Matt, I'm not sure who goes first, but I'll turn it over to you guys. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, hello, council members, members of the public. I'm sure there are lots of folks that are following this item. I know we did receive uh, quite a lot of correspondence. Seems like folks are really interested and engaged on the project, which is great. Um, I do want to just start off by saying that the um, the action today is really to just set a preliminary boundary so that we can scope this process for the purposes of issuing a request for proposals from developers. We had a couple of comments um, in the correspondence about you know, this being a rezoning action, this is not a rezoning action. We're trying to just sort of set out that preliminary geographic scope of where we're gonna potentially be heading with expanding the downtown. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, this is you know, the, sort of the first step in the process that will be taking our existing downtown plan, which you see here on the right, which currently ends at Laurel Street, and looking at expanding that. So this boundary of the downtown plan was initially the downtown recovery plan, which came in um, initially in the early 1990s and as the downtown was recovering from the um, Loma Prieta earthquake. We've updated this plan you know, several times in uh, the course of its life, um, in the early 2000s, in the mid 2010s, most recently we um, uh, processed some amendments in 2017 that changed some of the height limits in certain areas and the allowable residential capacity in parts of downtown. And we have seen that be really effective in terms of the applications that we're getting for housing production downtown. So um, it's clear that, you know, downtown is a place where housing belongs and that was also sort of part of the um, housing voices process that we went through just a few years ago was about creating more opportunities for housing downtown. So, um, you know, we've been looking, the staff has been looking for ways to address our housing needs. Um, and also you've combined that with grant availability. So we applied for a, a REIF grant last year. The requirement of the REIF grant is that projects uh, that are approved do increase the total housing capacity that can be built citywide. Um, we also have an opportunity because this is next to our downtown to really allow this to create some new economic opportunity for city workers and local city businesses. We were approved for um, the full grant amount of $300,000. And because this is a grant project, we are on a timeline. So um, this project will have to wrap up by October of 2023, giving us you know, between two and two and a half years to, um, to complete the project. So as we started thinking about um, you know, expanding the downtown, you know, when we were here with the, with the REIF grant, we initially thought we would be doing some public outreach to determine this boundary. We were thinking maybe we'll go north, maybe we'll go west, maybe, maybe we'll also go south, maybe we can do all three of these things. And um, so we started by kind of making just a draft list of like what are the goals of expanding the downtown. Um, and you know, we were drawing on existing planning documents. So some of these uh, come out of the beach south of Laurel plan or out of our general plan. Um, and then also just from you know conversations with um, other major stakeholders in the city, the downtown um, business association and um, just some other major, I don't know what to say, stakeholders, <laughs> you know, the warriors were involved, you know, in thinking about which way we want to go with the downtown expansion. So as I mentioned with the grant, you know, we, we do have a specific goal of increasing housing units that can be built in the city. Um, we also, you know, coming out of the beach south of Laurel plan and the general plan is this idea of connecting downtown with the river and beach areas, both to make it easier to, as a resident, to get from downtown to the beach and the river, but also so that visitors have a more natural connection and understand um, how to get from our beach amenities into downtown to have a meal and to visit our local businesses, help visitors see more of Santa Cruz. Um, we also have an opportunity here in any direction that we expand to create more opportunities for public amenities and infrastructure. Um, so things like public parks, public gathering places, um, you know, improving the, the city infrastructure that um, supports all of us and makes Santa Cruz a great place to live. Um, so combining that with wanting to accommodate and sort of take into account the fact that the Warriors existing 
location has always was always intended to be temporary. Um, you know, the existing stadium was never intended to be a permanent facility. So we're sort we're aware that that use is going to change at some point. So it would make sense to plan for that site that may be vacated at some point. We also then have this opportunity to work with the Warriors and set some standards and use allowances to accommodate a permanent arena, which then could really be a public amenity. So it serves the Warriors' needs, and then it also provides another, a modern event venue for the city, which we don't currently have a fully modern event venue. Um, and then, of course, going along with events are economic opportunities. I think every downtown business owner knows when game nights are happening because it does have such an effect on um, foot traffic downtown and, um, you know, having people participate in our economy and visit our local businesses, which then, of course, allows the city to um, generate some new tax revenue, which as we're moving into COVID recovery and always being sort of cognizant of the city's budget, we wanted to um, just identify that, you know, that is part of the goal of the plan is to um, help the city continue to meet its needs moving forward. So in thinking about all of those um, goals, and then kind of looking at the maps that we have around our downtown, it sort of it became obvious to staff that we, we weren't really gonna be looking at expanding north of downtown to really meet these goals about, you know, connecting to the beach and working with the warriors. Like that's not really the place that would meet these goals. And then thinking about expanding to the west, um, we very quickly run into um, a historic district and a lot of really sensitive historic structures and um, single family homes that we wouldn't necessarily be expecting to redevelop or turn over. So the idea that we could create more housing capacity by expanding to the west sort of starts to fall apart under those historic preservation regulations. So that leaves us with the area south of Laurel, which then we looked at in more detail. And um, this is all in your staff report, but I'll just kind of walk you through our, our thought process and analysis here. So we started by mapping out, you know, what are the existing like physical characteristics of this area? You know, where are the historic structures? How far does the floodplain extend? Um, what's the geography? You know, where are the major slopes? Stuff like that. Um, and then we take into account the zoning, um, the, the current zoning and general plan uh, land use designation. And then we also look at parcel size because we do know that um, small parcels are more difficult to develop and assembling small parcels to um, create new larger parcels that could be redeveloped for housing is really challenging and does not happen readily or easily. So we started by looking at sort of this is the universe of options that we might be considering for um, downtown expansion. And um, in looking at these and thinking about this, um, you know, if you go all the way over to Washington Street and start there and thinking, this is great, we could have this big new area of downtown, like there's all this opportunity here for creating more housing, creating more jobs, um, creating new public amenities, because there are some of these larger sites that um, could potentially, you know, industrial sites that could potentially be redeveloping in the next um, 20 to 30 years. Um, you also, when you go all the way out to Washington, you capture a huge amount of um, pretty sensitive uses. So we're capturing a lot of small parcels. We're capturing a lot of, um, you know, existing established neighborhoods. We're capturing some, you know, recently, you know, less than 25 years old apartment complexes. So, so uses that aren't really going to be, um, we wouldn't really be expecting them to redevelop to, to quite the same degree. So we've kind of, we've got this most complicated option of a project without necessarily getting like that really high yield in terms of um, what we would expect uh, the parcels to, to redevelop as. So then we kind of looked at Center Street as maybe that's a good boundary. Um, and again, that has a lot of the same problems. You're capturing this, this um, existing neighborhood with on Cedar, Spruce, and Sycamore that's um, you know, already developed. It is already also identified in our zoning code with the neighborhood conservation overlay zone, which is um, focused on really maintaining investments in the existing structures. So it's it would be a little incongruous to you know come in and. Re 
we zone and we designate this area for a lot of change. Um, and you know, the police station is also on this um, on Center Street here. That's the PF parcel you see on the left side of Center Street. So um, there's just there are a number of uses on Center Street that you still aren't really capturing the you know the bulk of um, sites that might you know we might expect to redevelop and kind of turn over, which then left us with you know what if we just look at Pacific and the existing zoning that's already identified as CBD-E, so adjacent to the downtown plan. And what if we just start there and go all the way over to the river? Um, and when we looked at that, it kind of ticked all the boxes. This is the direct connection to the downtown from the beach. You know, we, we're capturing a lot, we're capturing a lot of these large parcels, which we know are going to be key opportunity sites. Mm -hmm. um, we're also building on, you know, the existing identified zoning that this is kind of adjacent already to downtown. Um, and then we, so in looking at that, we, we um, and bringing the boundary south to the roundabout, um, it kind of made sense to pick up some of those parcels just right at the bottom of um, Center Street as well. And again, you know, this is a preliminary recommendation um, of just simply for the purposes of writing a request for proposals so that consultants can scope, do a scope of work that, um, and a budget and a timeline. You know, are we working with 40 parcels here shown in yellow or are we working with, you know, 120 parcels if we go all the way out to Washington? And that's just a really different level of complexity and like timeline that you would have in a process. So, you know, once we kind of, once we got to this point internally, um, it kind of seems like there are a lot of reasons that we as staff can't really be recommending Center Street or Washington as appropriate boundaries. I mean, this neighborhood conservation district is a thing. The number and complexity of the of parcels and so the, um, the sensitivity of that, I think is just, it's, going to be a much more challenging process and could potentially start to stretch our timeline and our existing budget. So at that point, this option, option, um, I think it's option one, when we lay out the pros and cons that looks at both sides of Pacific um, and goes all the way to the river levee, captures just a couple of parcels down there at the bottom of Center Street. Um, we think this is really kind of head and shoulders above the other options in terms of a project that can really be successful, that can meet our draft goals, um, that can accommodate, you know, the sort of the movement that we are hearing is gonna be happening with the Warriors soon. Um, so this is our recommendation that we select this as a boundary for the purposes of scoping and for, you know, issuing an RFP. And then we really get to work with the community in terms of what is envisioned for this area because we are, you know, we have no assumptions about that right now. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the existing downtown plan has a, a range of land use types, a range of SARs and a range of height limits. You know, there are portions of the existing downtown plan that are still only 35 feet height limit, which is what the existing height limit is through most of this area. Um, so, you know, in no way are we assuming that this whole area is going to go to 85 feet. There's going to be a really robust public participation process focusing, you know, on the existing residents, existing landowners, and also the broader community about how, what makes sense in this area and what kind of change we want to see, um, what kind of development capacity we want to accommodate in this area. So that is all yet to come, and we're just trying to get our proposal out. We're hoping we, you know, we do understand that time is of the essence for some of these, um, you know, property owners and opportunity sites. And so we thought we could save a little time by just getting to that part of issuing the, the proposal. Um, and, you know, we're here for direction from, from the council, so we'll continue to discuss that. I did want to just take a minute because we got so much correspondence. Um, I do want to talk about uh, a couple of things that came up uh, several times in correspondence. So I've mentioned many times now this is a preliminary boundary so that we can issue the RFP and that there, there will be an extensive public process around what land use intensities, what land uses, and what the urban design is of this whole area. Um, we have not identified a specific number of units that would be increased in this area. 
So um, we had a couple of um, notes about, you know, making sure that it was enough to cover certain other things. And, you know, we haven't, we haven't made any commitments like that, and that really would be premature at this point. These are things that we will want to keep in mind as we move into the planning process about, you know, what is the right number of units for this area? And, um, you know, what are the right requirements for inclusionary and replacement units? Does it make sense to have them be different from our existing standards elsewhere? Or do those existing standards make sense here? And we would want to kind of, we want to consider all of that in the context of, um, you know, what's appropriate in this neighborhood. Um, we also got a lot of comments of people really interested in transferring densities. So this is a, um, a concept that comes up because of the state law that we are currently um, obligated to follow, SB 330, the Housing Crisis Act, that says there can be no net loss of um, development capacity within a city. And so the issue with this question, which, I, which is a very smart question to ask. I mean, people really, um, I'm really impressed with the correspondence we got. People were really thoughtful and really um, putting things together, which I love. So the issue here is timing. Like we said when we were here with the objective standards two weeks ago, doing a general plan amendment is a, a lengthy process. Um, and SB 330 requires that in, when, the, when development capacity is transferred, it have, it's a concurrent process. So one place is down zoned and another place is up zoned at the same time. And um, this process won't be complete for two years at minimum. So um, perhaps if the council, if the community wants to pursue a general plan amendment of that um, scope and breadth as we're doing this, um, that is something that could happen concurrently and none of that would be complete and effective until all of it's complete at the end of at the end of this process which is the end of 2023 so that's just the kind of the timeline that we're looking at um and then we also got a couple of comments about financing and a comment we made in the staff report about um how we might stretch our grant funding to make sure that we have enough money to fund the whole project and the whole CEQA process. And I, I just want to be really clear that having developers or property, major property owners contribute funds to the city to support um, full planning is a really common tool that's used by agencies throughout the state to make sure that we have enough money to do a thorough process. So the money comes to the city, the city manages the process, the consultants work for the city, um, and then the um, developers or property owners get, they get a benefit out of that. So because the city has done CEQA on the whole plan, then an individual project has a lower um, sort of bar to hit for CEQA. They don't have to do their own EIR, for example, for a big development project. So they're gaining some benefit out, out of that. So it um, makes it worth it for them and uh, still requires and, and um, allows the city to completely manage and oversee the process. Oh, one last thing I actually would like to mention here. We, there were a couple of um, comments that said, um, you know, approve action one without action two. Um, because this is a preliminary boundary for the purposes of issuing an RFP, that really wouldn't work to do one without the other. Um, and if council chooses that, you know, community input is needed to confirm that this is the right boundary, we're prepared to do that. We, we can accommodate that in our schedule. It won't set us, you know, drastically behind and it will take a little bit of time. Um, and, you know, we want to do this right. So it is at council's discretion to decide, you know, will, is it likely that that boundary would shift a lot through a public process? Or is this, you know, as a preliminary boundary that could be refined through the planning process, is that an okay place to start? So um, with that, we're asking today for direction to issue an RFP to secure consultant services to manage the REAP grant funded project to expand the downtown. And we're asking that we select the areas currently zoned CBD-E and RTC at south of, south of Laurel um, on Pacific and Center Streets as shown in the attached map for inclusion in that plan. And with that, we will I would, be ready for questions. Oh. Yes, Sarah, 
this, this is Matt Benoit, principal planner. I would just, can you go back to the recommendation page? Mm -hmm. I just, I just wanted to make one brief clarification there. Uh, we should add to the recommendation on number two to have uh, at, at the end there, instead of for inclusion in the expanded downtown plan, it should be for inclusion in the analysis and, and general plan RFP scope for the expanded downtown plan. Okay, let me amend that. Did you catch that language? So that would, that, that would just uh, clarify that a little bit better that this, I, is, I that this boundary is just for the for the scope and analyzing it as part of the scope rather than the actual downtown plan. Got it, okay. okay. Great, thank you, thank you. Matt and Sarah. So I will go ahead and um, open this up for questions from council um, and then I will take it out for public comment and then we'll we'll deliberate uh, and take action after public comment. Are there questions from council on this item? Okay. Oh, okay. Council member Cummings. Thank, I want to start by thanking the staff for pulling this together. Um, I'm a little uh, just, well, I want to appreciate too the clarification around the preliminary um, considerations. I'm still a little um, concerned because a lot of members of the public reached out um, expressing concerns about us moving forward with designating these boundaries before there's been any kind of community input process. And so I just like to get a better sense of, you know, one, kind of why that step hadn't been taken to get some community input. I mean, at a minimum, it would have seemed appropriate to at least have this go to the Planning Commission. And I know back in August of 2020 was kind of when the council had mentioned, um, you know, really wanting to work with the Warriors to create a permanent home. So there's been, you know, months of kind of, um, uh, well, I should be expressing this desire to work with the, the warriors and have a permanent home. And so I'm just kind of wondering why um, this at a minimum wasn't able, you know, didn't go to the planning commission for input uh, prior to coming into the city council. Because this is a major, this is gonna be a major rezoning. And so um, just really wanted to understand a little bit, get a little bit more clarification on what this means when, if we're saying preliminary, um, you know, um, approval, because that, I think that this really does need to go to the Planning Commission. I mean, that's like their role, is to weigh in on these decisions. So um, before we do anything that's gonna be permanent, I think it's really critical that it goes to them and that there's an opportunity for the public to weigh in, because <clears throat> that's one of the, the things that's been expressed in a lot of the emails, is that we're gonna make a zoning change and we haven't had any community input. Um, thank you for that question. That is really, um, you know, really important. I, I saw those emails as well from folks really concerned that we were, you know, circumventing a public process. And um, I, I take that really seriously. And that was not at all the intention here. I don't, um, you know, I understand that we mentioned it with the last item when we brought the grant proposal. And, um, you know, the reality of it was we did this analysis and it kind of was like, this is really the head and shoulders better option, you know? Um, so at that point, you know, what are we gonna dread, like bring the public through a process where it's like, hi, this is the best option. And they're like, well, obviously this, I, I shouldn't assume. I, I can be surprised. I'm frequently surprised and delighted by Santa Cruz residents. They're very insightful and they have, you know, know all kinds of things that I don't know. Um, and we really think that this boundary makes sense um, in terms of like taking it to the planning commission. Um, you know, really, we're just, we're kind of getting just a geographic ballpark here. That's really where we're going. You know, is this gonna shrink a little bit? Maybe, is it gonna grow like a little bit? Maybe, uh, probably less likely that it would grow and more likely that it would like shrink a little. Um, and, you know, at this point, we're really just trying to issue the RFP so that we can get rolling and get that good, robust community input. Um, and when we get to the point of, you know, confirming the scope of work and talking about, um, you know, what's 
going to how this plan is going to proceed. I, I assume we are absolutely we are going to be involving the planning commission. You know, this is going to be a big project that we're um, undertaking. Um, and I mean, to be honest, just the analysis that we did didn't seem to warrant any um, very many questions. You know, I mean. I understand that folks really want to be involved and really want, you know, expected to be consulted, and I, you know, I appreciate that. I, I do hear that as a, as a critique, um, you know, and like, what's the other boundary? You know, I, I don't know. I'm kind of, um, I, I heard all of that that they wanted to have a public process, but I didn't see comments about, you know, the boundary should have been here. The boundary should have done this differently. So, um, you know. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for that question to uh, Council Member Cummings. I just wanted to add as well that, you know, this, this project hasn't even started yet. Just this really is preliminary. And we're looking to just get an idea of what to get the consultant to, to come back to with us on a, on a scope and, uh, and a budget. And th those were vastly different depending on the areas that we chose and based on how much money we had and, uh, and what we wanted to give the consultants to get a, a good proposal back from them, you know, really just to get an idea of what, what the order of magnitude is for what this plan will be. And so that's really what where we've come to with this so far. That order of magnitude is is really just this more focused area. And that, that can of course change. And when this project officially starts, you know, that's that's when we're really gonna have this significant public process that's going to involve a lot of a lot of public meetings, going to involve planning commission. And so once we get a consultant on board and, and really start studying this area more and you know get a get a community engagement strategy from the consultant, you know, that's when we're gonna see that kick in a lot more and really engage the public in that way. Uh, so in this instance, it really is this preliminary step before the project even begins. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and you know, thank you for the, the comments. I, I'll just say, um, you know, there's there are recommendations that <clears throat> the council has made on a variety of different policies, and although it seems like you know from the public that you know we're not getting a lot of pushback, that it's likely something that's going to be adopted. I feel like we still send those items to our different commissions so that they can weigh in. Mm -hmm. And it's really important because I feel like, you know, I'm getting emails from commissioners expressing concern that they have, one, they haven't had a chance to weigh in. Um, and the other is that they haven't, it doesn't sound like they've been meeting, right? Like in the, so I don't think they've met the last two times for their regularly scheduled meetings. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I reached out to a number of them and they said, you know, they haven't been meeting regularly lately. And so if the if there isn't anything on that their agenda, this is something that even if they are in full agreement, they could have weighed in on. And it's beneficial for us because when we get these comments from the community saying, hey, there's been no input, you know, we can say at least the, the planning commission has weighed in and here's where they've landed. And it's quite possible that they all agree with staff's recommendation. And I'm not opposing what the staff's recommending. It seems like a, you know, it's appropriate for this plan. But, you know, part of our role as government officials is that we're supposed to be doing everything we can to uphold the trust of the community and the trust of the governmental process. And if the community, you know, if they um, perceive or if it seems like we're trying to rush these processes and especially when it comes to land use and development because if we change the zoning in these areas that's going to have an impact on those property values there's concerns about the people who are, who are living and housing around there and how they're going to be impacted and just getting that that having those conversations and having that opportunity for the community to weigh in just really helps us to, to really know that we're trying to do our best to have the community um you know up, engaged and involved in this process and that we're not trying to kind of you know rezone things or change boundaries without them without giving them and without giving you know our commissioners and our bodies an opportunity to weigh in and so that's mm -hmm. it's one of the concerns that i have with just how we're moving i really hope that we can move um quickly with this process but I do want to, um, you know, just encourage that we're trying to do our best to engage with our different, um, the, you know, the other bodies that are supposed to be weighing in and really trying to increase that public input. And um, and I don't think that, um, you know, 
it would really delay. It would, if anything, it would like demonstrate that we want to hear from the public. We're you know, wanting to have their trust and move forward in a way that brings them with us. So um, I'll stop there, but um, yeah, I, I do want to see how we can help work to bring this forward in a way that um, really demonstrates to the community we're trying to have them engage in this process. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. I've got uh, Council, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, Council Mem Member Watkins, Council Member Brown, and Council Member Kalantari Johnson in that order, please. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for going through that. I think um, my question is also clarifying uh, with the community response we received and input. Um, I'm wondering how much of it um, is in the language of how it was presented and, and even in your report, you started off saying this is not a rezoning, this is for the purposes of obtaining um, an RSP for the project uh, within this grant timeline. So. Um, uh, and just to clarify, so then it's not a rezoning. And in the public process in the future, there is an opportunity for that to happen. The boundaries could change, for example, during that public process or planning commission presentation. Right, yeah. So as we get into the active planning process of extending the downtown plan, um, you know, that is the core of it is what are the uses that we want to see here? What are the intensities of use that we want to see here? Um, and based on the you know correspondence that we get, we we did kind of have a moment of oh we we sort of we phrased some of these things a little wrong. We didn't hit you know the um, the points that sort of we understood. And I can only apologize for that. You know I I, I understand that folks are really interested. Um, I hope they continue to be interested. It's a two-year process, so just, here we are right at the beginning. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I want everyone to like continue to stay involved. That's, I think that's so important. And, um, you know, I can only apologize that we, this wasn't maybe clearer in the written document. And um, I, so I want to be extra clear right now. This action that you are taking today involves no change it is we are setting a ballpark scope so that we can get you know proposals from um, consultants okay so it's a starting point of this is what we determine to be um, the best option to look at in terms of obtaining an RFP and um, okay and then my second question tied to that was um, uh, an RFP uh, with with your recommended boundary, the yellow portion of the map, um, it would be released in April or May and with a deadline in June. So is that kind of like a three month process? And um, if, if there's a, in the staff report it says if if we direct an outreach to public process prior to the boundaries that that's recommended, then um, that would get returned the, the results in the summer, July, let's say, and so the RFP would then be three months from then. Um, what what would that look like? Um, like yeah, August, so September. Yeah, so so if you if. You know, if we you want us to go out and do public process, we're prepared to do that. We certainly can go out and have these conversations. Um, you know, we would expect that to take a few months and sort of wrap up by the end of the spring and, you know, later in the spring, and we would be back with, um, you know, a, maybe a different boundary um, for council to say, go forth and issue an RFP. That would be sort of like May, June. Um, so we would then work on issuing the RFP in July and that sort of puts us into the into the fall of, you know, reviewing the proposals and getting someone under contract. So, you know, it's about three months. It's about a, a three month difference. You know, the city council does take a break in July. So we're trying, if, 
if this is approved today, that would give us a chance to like push through and get a contract potentially back in June and just sort of gain that, you know, not lose that month of July. That That is going to be a stretch, admittedly, um, but it is something that we'll, you know, we think it's worth shooting for. This is going to be a complicated process and, you know, anything we can do to allow a little more wiggle room in terms of time, I think is going to benefit the process ultimately. Okay, those were my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Vice Mayor, for your clarifying questions. And I appreciate the clarification in language, um, Sarah, with um, sort of just really putting out specifically that this isn't um, a, zone, a rezoning, this is simply a, a proposal for a process. My clarifying question is in regards to when um, we uh, did the amendment to the downtown plan in 2017, I feel like this was also identified as the next step in terms of proposal to have a way to extend potentially towards the beach to align um, that portion as a component of the downtown plan. So this didn't really seem to me like really out of the blue. Um, and I'm wondering if we or others want to speak to that because I sort of remember that being uh, kind of the next stage that we anticipated coming with that plan amendment as well. Thank you, Councilmember Watkins. I'll jump in on that because um, that predated Sarah's time with us. Um, and what I'll say is that um, the idea has been in front of the council a number of times. In fact, um, the um, first time um, that I recall, and it may have been, you know, well, let me, let me start by first saying for decades, there's been a goal to um, really better connect our downtown with the beach. And to really, you know, draw so many of those millions of tourists that visit Main Beach and Cowles Beach and draw them into our downtown so that they can experience that, um, that great aspect of our city and um, hopefully, you know, stay for dinner or um, decide to, you know, uh, uh, spend money in our shops. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's been a longstanding goal. Um, what I specifically recall is um, that, and, and so I don't recall as part of the downtown plan in 2017, if there was any um, specific discussion about um, later expansion into the downtown. There may have been, but that's been um, some time. But I do remember that um, when we brought our, um, and, and I may get them confused, this was the, when we brought the LEAP grant, this one's the REAP grant, um, when we brought the LEAP grant to the council um, and we um, identified the, um, the housing element as the preferred project, what we said is, um, and if we've got excess funds from that, and I believe that one was $310,000, um, if we've got extra funds from that, after we go through the housing element process, let's dedicate that towards a, um, a an expansion uh, of the downtown plan. And um, I believe, but I'm not sure that that, uh, that may or may not have specified to the south. Um, when we brought the REAP back, we were more general and we said, hey, let's expand the downtown plan. Um, the REAP requires that we, um, uh, that we uh, extend housing capacity, that we expand housing capacity. And so that's when we um, got the, the green light from the council to um, expand. And at that time, we were thinking, you know, oh, we're gonna go, we might go north, we might go west, we might go south, and we'll engage the community um, to, to figure that out. Um, given the multitude of things that Sarah's talked about in terms of timeline, the amount of budget that we have, um, the, the process that um, we need to undergo, um, which will likely be um, an environmental impact report after an analysis of various alternatives, um, alternative um, uh, development scenarios. Um, and growth patterns in that in that area, then we would conduct an environmental impact report. Those those are you know significant periods of time, and the farther out we go, the more complicated um, that gets. The more and, and the less opportunities that we have to do in depth. Um, community outreach if um, you know we do because the, the end timeline is set 
um, you know, we have to get it done by the time that the grant is there. So all of these things factored into our consideration, but you're right, there has been some discussion. I can't remember the initial parts, but um, the, the council has considered this at, at points in the past. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Yes, I. so I wanted, most of my questions have been asked and answered uh, for the most part. Um, but I, I do, um, I just wanna echo my colleagues' uh, concerns about the apparent speed with which this is coming and a decision is to be made. And thank you very so much, Sarah, for clarifying uh, the, just so everybody's clear about what we're being asked to do here today. Um, I, and I appreciate all your work. Um, <clears throat> but it does seem that, um, we we tend to be we tend to get into this pattern. I feel that is um, it's it's difficult to reconcile with you know the public in, public input and public engagement and interest in the decisions we make. So we what I find happens often is we make decisions where they say oh it's just like this is really just the beginning and you know we're we're going to work on this later. But then it doesn't really end, <laughs> I'm not sure quite how to say this, but mm -hmm. um, though that public engagement and openness doesn't seem to really come afterwards. And so then we, the council or the public is presented with a proposal, either a ordinance change or a pro particular project that is pretty fully baked. Mm -hmm. and, so, and people get frustrated because the only thing they can do at that point is either oppose, potentially take legal action, um, you know, or support. And so making this more of an iterative process seems like it would be to our benefit. So I really um, just wanted to echo what Council Member Cummings was talking about in that regard. Um, in terms of the role of the Planning Commission, it seems to me that um, this, is a, this is a pretty uh, traditional role for the, the Planning Commission to be involved in uh, these kinds of decisions and these kinds of processes. And um, I, I'm just wondering about the, the concerns about the delay being, you know, potentially three months to do a community engagement process. Mm -hmm. Couldn't the Planning Commission perhaps put it on their agenda, have a public hearing, have some discussion, make, create a more open process for a limited period of time so that we don't delay, but there, there is a space to have some of that conversation. Um, Pro and help people understand what's coming next. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if that would be a possibility, like a middle way to maybe have a little more time and put it out there. Um, so, that's, so that's just a kind of a question comment. Uh, and then my other question is if you could, or someone could um, just give us, a, just encapsulate what these changes would allow, might allow us to do, or the city to do, or developers to do, businesses, um, that is not allowable under the current designations. Because mm -hmm. I think another thing that I've heard is the, um, like in particular with density bonus, we're already talking about potentially 50% increase mm -hmm. over the current zoning. And um, so it, do we really wanna go there, right? I mean, we kind of did that in the downtown along the river in certain places to have increased that height, but do we really wanna go there? And I think that's a question that, that the public really needs to be involved in. So just wanted to, if you could just kind of help us understand what those key um, differences are. Um, I know it's complicated, the zoning rules and all of that, and so I'm not asking for an overview of that, just more like, you know, we could have, you know, seven stories or we could have more mixed use or, you know, we could have these other functions. Just a little rundown. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for those questions. Um, so I will, I'll respond to your first, you know, question comment first about like, could we involve the planning commission in, you know, having some of this outreach to, you know, mitigate the delay. And the only word I would change there is delay. It, it's not really, I wouldn't call it a delay. We have time, we, we can do, public process, if that is the will of the council. Um, we ha we thought perhaps this was such a clear and obvious choice, I we made a mistake. I don't know what, I don't know what else to say. Um, so 
there is time to engage with that and you know we will do our best to make up that time throughout the rest of the process and it is is merely a trade-off if we think we're going to end up with some something that is different than this boundary or if we think there are other reasons to take this boundary out for more public process so that's the only thing i would change about that first comment um and you know we could involve the planning commission that might be a useful way to do it um you know, the planning commission will be involved with this planning process as it moves forward, um, for sure. And, you know, when we're thinking about outreach and really reaching people, like sort of formal meetings aren't necessarily the greatest way to do that. So I don't know if that would be my first choice. Um, I probably would go more along the lines of like doing some focus groups, reaching out from the people we've already heard from, um, making sure that we got contact with the existing residents, maybe doing having some online survey about like concerns and looking at these three options of boundaries and like thinking about that. So, and, um, you know, we haven't laid that all out yet. We could get that together right away if, if the, that's the council's wish. Um, we could involve the planning commission. I don't know if that would be necessarily be my first choice in terms of doing effective outreach. Um, and, you know, the planning commission provides useful insight and they're, you know, smart folks who volunteer to um, advise on land use issues. So involving them does, you know, have some benefits. Um, Sarah, I might, before we go too much further, I, we have a number of council members that haven't answered questions. So I'm just hoping we okay. can maybe just instead of yeah. trying to kind of solve each question is maybe there may be, maybe we can get through questions and then we're going to deliberate afterwards. So, you know, I just don't want to get too much out before we're really being able to yeah. deliberate and also okay. respect the public. Right, so keeping an eye on time. So then um, just in terms of like what could be included here in this plan, um, well, so the existing downtown plan that allows as base, you know, sort of base density and base development up to a five floor area ratio, which is, you know, measurement of bulk and intensity on a site and up to in some places as much as 85 feet of height in some places up to 50 feet of height, in some places 75, and in some places 35 feet of height. So, um, you know, the design standards that would apply down here south of Laurel would be determined through this, you know, planning process. We would work with the community to figure out what the right intensity was. And you're very, you're absolutely correct, you know, the density bonus does allow for up to a 50% density bonus. Um, when you're providing a high level of affordability with the project and that's true throughout the city um so in terms of you know what we might what we could see currently under like the current state law and um city guidelines you know we have we just got a proposal at you know at the end of center street for a pretty large building that's um, mostly sros and it has a higher affordability component so it is a density bonus project so that's um, sort of one example of what could be done currently and um, you know there are pros and cons to <clears throat> having standards that can only be developed out under the density bonus and having standards that really allow um, conforming projects with our you know base level of inclusionary to be built without the need for a density bonus um, and weighing those trade-offs is part of this process it's part of the objective standards process the density bonus is absolutely a component that we have to take into consideration and that we can't necessarily control um, I'm gonna, uh, let's see, uh, Martine, I just, Martine Bernal, I saw you, did you wanna comment also, Martine, on this? Sorry, I just saw your hand come up. So if, if council members don't mind, I'll, I'll shift it over to Martine for whatever his comments might be. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to uh, just uh, jump in with respect to the, uh, the timing uh, issue and question. Um, obviously the, the uh, the, the intent uh, of staff is to go through a thorough process and to have you know appropriate uh, uh, community input uh, into the process. However, uh, it's also important to recognize that um, one of the most significant reasons for wanting to move forward with this is in order to facilitate any kind of uh, warriors uh, project moving forward. And so, um, as you may hear from them later, they have an urgency in trying to move forward with respect to a project. And so that is really what we're trying to balance here. There's no 
uh, project that's pending, any particular project or anything that's waiting for this. However, the process for moving forward with any kind of project, private project, particularly for a warrior's uh, facility, uh, there's a timeliness to that. And this would uh, this is one potential tool that could facilitate moving them forward. And so the longer this process takes, the, the more difficult and challenging it'll be to be able to move forward with any kind of project with the warrior. So I just want to point that out, that that's a significant uh, issue uh, and a reason for wanting to begin the process and to uh, you know expedite, uh, again, in a way that uh, is as quickly as possible, however is appropriate and, and provides the all the necessary uh, requirements that uh, and public input that's needed to, to move forward. Um, anyway, so I just want to highlight that. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson is next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for the presentation and um, clarifying all our questions. Um, and thank you, Martine. That was actually a question I had, is if, if we could um, really clearly articulate the urgency for an expedited um, decision-making process. And then also to go back to, um, I, mean, I think you clarified, Sarah, but just to reaffirm and maybe hear from Lee that, that this is not circumventing a public process. Um, this is putting forward a preliminary plan so we can move forward with this grant proposal. Um, so I want to just hear that from both of you again. And then my follow-up question to that is, could you speak to what the public process would look like? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and, and reaffirm Sarah's statements um, from earlier, uh, Councilmember Calantari Johnson, that yes, uh, this process will undoubtedly have a very robust um, public outreach and engagement component. Um, one of the things that I would expect to happen, which is often the case in terms of the early um, stages of the RFP, uh, the whoever is selected through the RFP process, that consultant will, one, do background research right at the beginning, and two, will come up with an outreach and great and engagement strategy. So I don't want to presuppose what those elements would be, particularly as we're emerging from the COVID era and you know, we may or may not have in-person um, opportunities for engagement and uh, creative ways to, to meet people where they're at um, in the community as uh, you know we would uh, encourage in a non-COVID time. But um, certainly, uh, you know, there will be a, a strong outreach engagement component, whether that is uh, uh, electronic if we're if we're still in social distancing mode, or whether that is um, able to occur in person. Um, and um, oftentimes, when the um, when the um, community engagement strategy is developed, it, it specifies, you know, before these key milestones, we're gonna go out and get community feedback so that we can build that into what our initial um, alternatives that we're considering are. And then once we've got alternatives put together, understanding what that initial feedback is, we go out to the community again and we say, hey, here are the alternatives. What do you think is best about this one and that one and this one? And then oftentimes what we'll find is it's not one one of those alternatives that's selected, but a sort of a mishmash of those and say, you know, the community liked this part and they didn't like that part. And so then once that is brought together, um, they'll often be like, okay, community, we heard what you said. Here is a, um, here's a plan that we think kind of best encompasses what we've heard. And you get feedback on that. Then there is the CEQA component. Um, and through that CEQA analysis, there is environmental review of all of those components, uh, including alternatives. So, you know, the, the initial alternatives that were uh, considered oftentimes become the alternatives that are plugged into the EIR. And so then there's an analysis of all of those um, where there's additional opportunities for community feedback. And then, um, it, it, you know, how that happens, you know, electronically or, you know, through uh, uh, surveys or online, you know, we, that's yet to be seen. But, but I would expect those as kind of the general checkpoints. Okay, thank, thank you for providing that. And just, you know, thank you to you, Sarah and Lee and the team for um, doing all of the work that you do to, to bring it to this point to, um, for us to consider launching some process. Of course. Thank you. Great. Seeing no other council member hands, I'm going to take it out to the public now. And I see two hands there. 
Um, and I do want to, yeah, thank um, Sarah and Matt. And if you guys can stay on the line, I'm sure there'll be additional additional questions. And um, just from my comments, I would just say that I I, uh, I understand sort of the the thinking that's going on uh, going in be behind this and. Um, also understand um, the interest in the Warriors is something that's obviously really important to the community. So um, tr trying to trying to look at that balancing of, of um, hopefully um, working with them into the future. So um, thank you for the presentation though. Um, okay, I'm gonna go out to the public. Uh, first person uh, has the phone number ending in 5724. and we can hear you. Thanks, sorry for the dog. Good afternoon, my, my name is Chris Murphy, President of Santa Cruz Warriors. Uh, first and foremost, wanna say thank you to council members, city staff for the time and hard work serving our community during these times and in this issue. Um, you know, just wanted to say, you know, the Warriors are committed to the Santa Cruz. We wanna stay in Santa Cruz long-term. We just need a long-term arena solution. Um, you know, the Santa Cruz Warriors are about a lot more than just basketball games. We've worked hard to support the community through countless events and programs like Read to Achieve in our local schools. Also recently donating over 50,000 meals to Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, you know, we've also supported numerous civic projects like river levee beautification with the Coastal Watershed Council, community serving missions like the Resource Recovery Center, post the wildfires last fall, and the current COVID-19 vaccination center at Kaiser Permanente Arena. A permanent home in Santa Cruz will help us continue and expand the work. Um, our arena project expectations are to form a primarily privately funded project that hosts basketball, music, arts, entertainment, other community benefiting events. Um, we look forward to sharing ideas and collaborating with the community once we fully know what the possibilities are for the site. We wanna stay in Santa Cruz, we just need to move with some clear momentum forward toward a long-term long -term arena solution. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next up, I have uh, phone number ending in 0030. Go ahead, please. You should be able to press star, uh, star nine to unmute yourself. It's star six. Oh, I'm sorry, star six. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Hi there. Yeah, this is Ralph on the field again. Um, I was just, uh, you know, uh, I, I think the city has an opportunity this evening um, to basically what you're doing is you're selecting uh, the scope of, of the community homework assignment, which is to uh, figure out what are going to be some of the best options for the downtown to expand south. And I think you know the most responsible thing to do is to make that homework assignment as robust as possible, and that means um, including scoping out all the way to, to Washington Street. Uh, whether or not Washington Street is ultimately selected, that's you know a very long process that will involve uh, lots of community input. Um, and but I think it, it's it's uh, the responsibility of the city to to have that on the table as as an option, um, so that uh, you know there are just there's more opportunities for the public to be involved in the process. Um, uh, I think the the larger area will probably have uh, receive more you know um, uh, press coverage and maybe generate more controversy, which is actually a good thing if we want public participation. Um, and, and so I think it, we, we, even if you know, it's not ultimately selected going out to Washington Street, I think it's still worthwhile you know, doing the work to figure out you know, what, uh, what the public wants and what some of the, the feasible options are. Uh, so that's why I would uh, suggest uh, having a, as robust of, of a uh, community engagement process and as robust of a review of the various options as possible and, uh, and include uh, as an option going all the way out as far as Washington Street. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Next uh, public member is 0193. That's your end of your phone number. Press star six, please, to unmute. Phone number ending in 0193, we're ready for you. If you press star six, you'll be unmuted. Hi there. Thank you. Um, it happens that the previous caller pretty much said what I was going to say, so I'll be brief, which is simply that the planning director has pointed out that this whole area of land is the logical place connecting the downtown with the beach. Um, and and it's, a, it's a very long, laborious, extensive, time-consuming pro process, and we should take advantage of it to talk to all of the people in that area, particularly, about what they would like to have happen, because it's, it's an area that just makes sense for the city to expand in, in the downtown. And uh, to say that, and I understand that the short-term thing is to get the warriors uh, into their place, but the long-term thing is really to uh, deal with that area in a way that makes sense for everybody and for the long-term growth of the city. And, um, and now is the time to do it because you're doing it and uh, good to do it. Thank you. I was muted. <laughs> Next up is uh, phone number ending in 5652. And you're unmuted. Go ahead, please. Hi, thank you. Um, Lyra Filippini here. The importance for community engagement and input from the public has come up as a priority to council a number of times today. This boundary decision would undoubtedly affect a large portion of the community members who have not been informed about it, let alone asked for input on it. This agenda item is a big deal, and it's nice that public input is being promised by staff for further down the process, but it was also previously indicated for this part of the process. When it came up before council on October 13th, it was tagged on to the REAP grant application for funding toward affordable housing. At that time, staff made it abundantly clear with repetition that there would be community engagement before the hiring of a consultant or the establishment of boundaries for any downtown expansion associated with the grant. Reviewing the recording confirms this. The original language up for motion today is expressly circumventing the process that was originally delineated by staff and accepted by council in your previous motion. Passing this without that necessary community engagement would threaten community trust in the current city council, as Councilman Cummings has brought up with rightful concern. Sarah has indicated that you do have time to engage with public input process at this stage, so please do so. However, if you consider this motion today, please edit the motion to state explicitly that it will not include boundaries for expansion of the downtown plan, and that it is instead specifically approving an RFP for a consultant with loose ballpark of what staff recommends for expansion zoning, but that any such establishment of new boundaries would include a public input process. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ida, or excuse me, phone number ending in 0836. Please press star six to unmute. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. My name is Ed Porter, and I'm calling uh, to say that I listened very carefully to what staff had to say uh, a few moments ago. And all the question was brought up whether or not this matter would be referred to the Planning Commission. And the answer was, uh, it's not necessary to do that. I think we shouldn't have a Planning Commission if that's the decision. We have a Planning Commission for the purpose of considering matters like this. Staff is saying that we're contemplating a major planning process. Of course, it should be referred to the Planning Commission. There's no doubt in my mind. Furthermore, if we're going to continue in the uh, in the manner that we did in January of approving a uh, building in a 
excess of our building height, we need to have a community conversation about that. And it certainly needs to be on the table to reconsider building heights of 70 feet if in fact the state density bonus is gonna allow higher heights than that uh, in any place in our downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe that is the end of the folks who wanted to speak. Is anyone else in the public wanting to speak to this item? There is one person with their hand raised. Yeah. I don't. Uh, phone number ending in five three six two. Press star six, and you can unmute. Go ahead, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, good evening. Uh, yes, um, this is Judy Grunstra, and um, I could picture you know, a wonderful connection from the town to the beach if it's done right. Um, so, but I do think the public needs to weigh in early and uh, otherwise it could be a disaster. So I think you should have learned by now that the public wants to weigh in and it's not a good idea to cut corners at the start of a process. So um, I'm looking forward to something that public can participate in fully and um, right from the start. Thank you. And also, um, yeah, we don't know. The Warriors could be putting pressure on every other uh, community that uh, is making them an offer, and we shouldn't be held hostage to that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I will go ahead and go back to council for additional questions of staff and deliberation. Uh, council Member Watkins, please. Thank you, Mayor, and um, thank you to the community members who were able to call in and express their concerns and um, opinions about this item. I, I have uh, a couple comments and then one question, and then I think I'm prepared to make a motion at this point. I, I think um, a couple things. One, I wanna just say I appreciate the clarifying comments made by staff to help us better understand what's before us and really the instituting of uh, an RFP that will essentially kick off the public process. I um, also recognize the timeline and the uh, end date that's essentially in place and how to expedite that and also do our due diligence in terms of the process. And the, what I took away was also a, kind of a rational, deductive approach to why you landed in the recommendation that you did and um, trying, what I heard was not trying not to create some dis disingenuous type of process when you already had a predetermined understanding of what that would look like, but then to kick off the process knowing that that could be the approach for the community input is sort of how I was able to take that away. I also wanna acknowledge the um, contributions that were brought up by our uh, lawyers in terms of their stepping up and partnering to support our community amongst some really challenging times. I've frequently seen partnerships that have been um, really geared at giving back to the Santa Cruz community and the timeline associated with the permanency of the location for them. I had a, a one sort of question and I'm wondering maybe this could be in the RFP is that if the first uh, aspect of the process would be to go to the planning commission essentially to get their input as well as the community input uh, as sort of that first step and um, wanted to see if either Sarah or Lee wanted to speak to that. Sure, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, yeah, that that can be um, is certainly a uh, approach. Um, is you know with the um, uh, initial kickoff going there. Um, as Sarah said, um, the um, 
you know, that isn't necessarily the best approach for hearing from the community, but that would be a good opportunity for hearing from uh, the commission itself. Um, it, with the issue being, um, you know, it's tough to have dialogue with the um, with the format of a formal meeting and you know sure. three minutes, uh, and so um, that would that could certainly be an early uh, component to to go to the planning commission and hear back from them um, and welcome public comment at the same time. But um, I would say that you know that is that would not, um, and I don't think this was your intent at all. Um, but just for the members of the community, that would not. Um, supplant any of the other um, community outreach efforts that we would do that would um, allow for additional engagement. That's right, yeah, it would just be sort of the preliminary first step to have their input and awareness around this as well. And then while I have you, you know, I welcome if there's any corrections to what my statement was in terms of what I took away at the high kind of level of, of what the presentation and clarifications have been. And I thought you yeah, summarized it really well. Yeah, just okay. not wanting to have sort of a process where we already kind of knew what yeah. the outcome was likely to be. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thank you for affirming that I was correct in my thoughts around that. I'm wondering if I could see the recommendation, and then um, I want to give that one more read, and then I, I think in terms of moving uh, our deliberations forward, I'm happy to make a motion. Um, so let's see. I, I uh, so Sarah, um, I emailed Bonnie um, so the uh, some tweaks um, just to clarify um, that that second part. Bonnie, do you have that, or I could share it if if that's easier. Mm, I do have it. It might be easier for me if there's changes. Okay, great. So it's just a, a couple of suggestions to really clarify for the community. Um, what um, we're, what step we're taking here. So um, the, there's a number one. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was like, where's number one? Okay. Yeah, so number two would change there and, and I'll let you read it. Um, uh, so I'm not reading over folks, but essentially establishing a preliminary boundary. Okay. I can go ahead and read the motion as shared if that's helpful. So the motion would be to issue a RFP, a request for proposal to secure consultant services to manage the regional early action planning grant funded project and to select the areas currently zoned C, C, D, dash E and R, T, dash C south of Laurel Street as shown on the attached maps for inclusion in the analysis in general plan RFP scope for the expanded downtown plan. Alternative two, let's see, were you, okay, so the, that would be, that was the original proposed motion. Now the alternative that you emailed Bonnie is what I'm about to read next, correct, Lee? That's correct, with the okay. additional text underlined. Okay, and so the other alternative would be then to select the areas currently zoned CBD-E and RT-C south of Laurel Street as shown on the attached maps as the preliminary boundary that could be refined later for the inclusion in the scope for the request of proposals for an expanded downtown. So I think I'm more comfortable with the alternative two language um, and I appreciate you coming up with that. So my motion would be to uh, move forward with number one and the alternative language for number two. And then maybe it doesn't necessarily have to be um, kind of a component of the motion, but to direct the staff to have as a component of the RFP to essentially have the planning commission weigh in. as a first component of the outreach process, but not in lieu of other community engagement. So they would be, um, just for clarification, so planning commission would be queued as part of the, uh, part of the, uh, the outreach um, process. Okay. So is this changing, are we adding that? Somewhere? Adding that number two, um, 
Sure, we can add that. You want and that could be that. it could be number three that yeah. the planning commission be prioritized for okay. out, outreach process. How does that sound? Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Okay. Is that clear for your staff, Lee, or? Um, I, so prioritize for the an early consultation um, sure. in the yeah. process is, yeah. is what I think the intent was to go to them sort of right off the bat. Right. right. Thank you. Uh, so prioritize for early consultation in the outreach process. Yeah, there you go. Okay. That's my motion, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have council member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, thank you, and I would be happy to second that motion. And I just had some comments. Um, really appreciate everyone calling. Um, uh, agree that community, a robust community and engagement process um, is what we want to see. And that's what I'm hearing from staff, that that, that, that will be part of the process. And um, should this motion pass, it'll kick off with um, the Planning Commission giving consultation and then we'll move into a robust uh, community engagement process. Um, I wanted to just uh, echo what my colleague, Councilmember um, Watkins said about how the warriors have contributed to our community and the civic engagement. Um, and I wanted to further just point out that um, beyond the amazing um, civic engagement and recreational and entertainment that they provide, there's a significant amount of funding that comes to our community um, from the Warriors being here. Uh, approximately $130,000 in general funds and approximately $300,000 to the public trust. These are, these are estimates that I um, asked uh, staff to give me. So that's significant and, and it aligns directly with our re Santa Cruz, our interim recovery plan in infrastructure, in financial stability and revitalization of downtown. So I think that's really important for us to keep in mind as we um, make these decisions and move forward is that the Warriors are fun and they're wonderful and they, they contribute significantly to um, the vitality and um, uh, sustainability of our community. So thank you. Great, thank you, Council Member. I have Council Member Cummings, Council Member Golder, and Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to start by echoing the sentiments of my colleagues and thanking Chris Murphy and the Warriors um, for their ongoing community support. And, you know, just want to express that we, you know, we kicked off these conversations last year and these conversations have been, you know, ongoing as well around creating a permanent home for the Santa Cruz Warriors. Um, there's a, a, a ton of people in our community who appreciate them being here. And I think we want to do you know, everything we can to support this effort. Um, I do also want to um, thank my colleague, Council Member Watkins, for the language that was included around directing this to the Planning Commission. Um, I, I understand the urgency, and I think to um, the comments that were brought up by the community, you know, this came before us back in October of last year when we were discussing the re grant opportunity. And uh, I think we really need to, um, you know, stay committed to trying to have community process as a part of this. And I know that some time has gone by and there's a sense of urgency, but, um, you know, at a minimum, having this go to the Planning Commission for their input, I think is really important. I do want to point out that there were um, um, Planning Commission meetings that were scheduled, but then canceled for January 21st, for February 4th, for March 4th, and for March 18th. And these all could have been opportunities where this item could have gone to the commission, come to us, and then we could have, you know, um, in the sense, you know, with knowing how urgent this is to get moving forward, you know, we could have had these uh, these recommendations come to those meetings, get input in it. And while it's not the broadest and most robust um, community input and engagement process. These bodies exist for a reason. There are appointments that are made by council members and we are, you know, um, we vote these individuals in to provide us with recommendations on very major community decisions. And so 
I think it's really critical uh, that we include them in these processes. And in this instance in particular, there were four opportunities for this item to go to the Planning Commission prior to it coming into council because there were no items heard at those meetings. And I think that, you know, if we are to, if we want to maintain public trust, we do need to have some kind of uh, public input process and the Planning Commission is one of those bodies that um, is there for us to get input from. Uh, I would, as part of the motion, um, I'm wondering if this could go, and I'd like to hear maybe from staff and from the other council members, but I think it would be good, given the urgency, if this item could go to the first meeting of the Planning Commission in April. Um, I, it's unclear what level of changes needs to be made if we're, um, you know, directing that these, if we're allowing for these preliminary boundaries to be considered and then sending it to the Planning Commission and that we're gonna finalize these boundaries at another point, is, is it possible for this item to go to the first meeting in April of the Planning Commission and, um, and then receive input on the proposed general plan and zoning changes and recommendations from that group? And then I don't know if it would need to come back then or if, um, those recommendations would be included, but then um, you know come back after we've had more community outreach. But yeah, I think that you know if we can get a sense at a minimum from the planning commission what their thoughts are and you know other input that comes to that meeting. We've heard from other people today, members of the community today, who are expressing extending the boundaries further than what we're recommending. So obviously there's a difference in what. Um, you know, what the community thinks about in terms of the boundaries. So I guess my, I'd like to see if that might be an amendment, but would like to ask staff um, if it would be possible for this to go. And I, I would imagine this report itself could go along with uh, the, some notes on the discussion that we've had today. Sure, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. I think you um, kind of hit the nail on the head um, in terms of your question, your follow-up question, which was when you said, I'm not sure what the um, uh, outcome, what we would do with that is. So what I would be asking is, um, would the intent be for you to, um, for us to come back and um, have the council um, select those boundaries at a later date? or would it be just to go to the, the planning commission um, sooner rather than later, um, meaning you know, as early as possible in April? Um, and I think um, you know, pros and cons to each. Um, if, if you wanted us to um, come back to the council, um, there would be a delay. I can say that you know, we would not get an RFP. I mean, it's a really tight schedule to get an RFP completed and back in front of the council by June. Um, so even if we, you know, uh, jumped on this and brought it to the council, and if, if the council's desire is to not select the boundaries until um, the uh, planning commission has weighed in, the earliest we would be um, back in front of the council would be August with a uh, consultant. Um, if you wanted to um, just, if you just wanted us, if you wanted to say like, here are the general boundaries, but go to the planning commission and get their initial thoughts and considerations, then um, that would not have a delay on the project. Um, we, would, we would be able to go ahead and draft that RFP. Um, and then um, the, the, only, the only negative I would see with that is we wouldn't necessarily have the consultant on board for that um, initial discussion, but you know, they could always go back and view the tape. They, just, you know, they may bring additional ideas that um, you know, could benefit the conversation. So you know, pros and cons to each approach um, and um, you know, timing being um, uh, the, the key consideration depending on whether or not you want this to, if you want to direct us to make the, bound, the, the uh, preliminary boundaries um, uh, known as part of the RFP, or if you want to come back and make that preliminary boundary dec decision later. Yeah, I, I, I guess um, given that these aren't final boundaries, it seems like if we adopt the preliminary boundaries, but then we have the planning commission weigh in on this and we're not gonna finalize the boundaries, I don't see that as being a problem. I think that's also what the community is concerned with is that if we were to, because I because with reading the report, the way it was drafted and prior to our meeting today, 
I think that many members of the public thought that we were going to finalize these boundaries today. And that was the, you know, walking into this meeting, those are the concerns that I came with. So we're not going to finalize the zoning boundaries um, and just preliminarily designate them. That's an if that won't delay us, you know, going through this RFP process, if that will then also allow for these preliminary boundaries to go to the planning commission and receive input, you know, I, I see that that first meeting with the planning commission to really help inform, you know, and be an opportunity for um, our commissioners to weigh in, for the community to, to weigh in even more. And if there's a need to change those boundaries, I would imagine that would come up and that's going to come back to us at some point in time. So. That's kind of my understanding of where we're at. And I guess my concern is, you know, given that the Planning Commission could have weighed in at these other meetings that were canceled, is it possible for us to get this to them as soon as possible? Because it sounds like we really want to get as much input as possible and we really want to have our Planning Commission weigh in on this item. So I, I just have a quick clarifying question about the motion, um, just to make sure I'm clear, and then we've got um, four members queued up. Um, so the question is, is the question the timing of the first of the meeting in April, just trying to clarify for the motion maker, um, is that the, really the intent is that this, so the boundaries are, are not going to be drawn. There, there will be a pub, long public process, a two year public process to basically draw the boundaries. Basically it sounds like over many considerations. So is the intent uh, council member Cummings to try to just get uh, uh, the planning commission involved as soon as possible? Okay. okay. I think so. And then to the, to the motion maker as well. I mean, I think that that's, I'm not sure if that was part of that direction, but it going to the planning commission and be prioritized for early consultation. Um, but I do, you know, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile the, the fact that, that there's community concern because this could have gone to the planning commission and hasn't, and then reconciling that with the urgency of, you know, needing it to go needing us to get this community input because the time's, the, the clock's ticking on this. So, yeah. and I imagine that the input would also be useful as this goes to further community, as we receive more input from the community on um, what the zoning should be. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think we can go backwards. So, I mean, I think yeah. your intent really is to try to get it to the early, to the first meeting in April. And, and Lee, is that possible on your end? Yeah, I'm, I'm checking. Um, our schedules that that agenda goes out um, later this week, um, and I'm just pulling up the info right now. I, while while I'm waiting for this to load, because I've got a, a swirling uh, wait um, here, um, the uh, we we were not able to send this to an earlier planning commission because the item was not ready. Um, I just want to make that clear that um, you know Sarah has been focused on um, the objective standards work, and so um, that's why it hasn't been to a planning commission. Um, and so you know from a, a perspective of RFPs, they're not typically uh, sent to the planning commission. Um, that's not to say that they can't be. Um, and for something like this, you know, we're, we're happy to do that if that's the will of the council. But just in terms of like addressing the comments of like, why wasn't this sent to the Planning Commission beforehand? Um, the report that came to the council specified that, you know, we were gonna go and do outreach and come directly to the council. It didn't say we were gonna come back and go to the Planning Commission. There's nothing that, that requires that we go to the Planning Commission. There's also nothing that says we don't have to, except for that timing aspect. You know, so when we when we do those things, we add in additional time, and um, as as we've heard, you know, the the warriors um, do have a uh, interest in moving this forward um, sooner rather than later, um, and so um, you know we we want to support that. Um, but also, if there was not a clear path, if if we felt that it wasn't entirely clear, um, and we um, uh, weren't sure about which direction to go, we wouldn't have brought this to the, the council at this point in time. We would have gone out to the community and said, hey, you know, what do you guys think about these pros and cons? So I just wanted to, to, to provide a little bit more background on, on why we ended up where we did. Um, and so um, 
I'm not, uh, I, I think that we can, uh, I'm not seeing any issues. You know, we could present this report to the Planning Commission um, at um, the April 1st meeting. Um, and, you know, they could weigh in. Um, and then I would just ask for clarification with respect to um, the intent of the council with uh, regards to, is, are you are you saying move forward with the RFP with the preliminary boundaries and then just bring this to the um, Planning Commission? Or are you saying? I'll, I'll turn this back, Lee, if you don't mind, to the motion maker, because I've got to, she's the one that can provide that direction. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Lee. And I think what I would say is there, I don't, as the motion maker, don't have an interest in wanting to further delay, but do want to prioritize as indicated in, in item number three uh, for our planning commission to weigh in uh, or as, you know, as an early kind of con consultation as, as basically written on the, um, on the motion here. I do think that, you know, I really appreciate also your comments, Lee, in regards to just um, the, the not inten sort of intentional approach to keep out a, a commission body, but the divergent workload needs, right? Essentially, it's what I'm hearing as well as wanting to um, also include them moving forward in terms of this just really being the very beginning of the process. So I um, I think for item number three, I think really covers what I'm reading mainly in the friendly amendment, other than wanting to prioritize that go before them at the earliest convenience, which if I'm hearing from you, Lee, that, that this could be set before them in April, but I wouldn't want that to replace, it's not my intention as a motion maker to replace us moving forward with direction to issue the RFP at this time. So I, um, I mean, at least that's how, I, that's how I'm presenting it. I don't know if, if, if the seconder of the motion feels differently. Council member Kaltari Johnson, I, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're in agreement with Council member Watkins. That's, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. So are you, so uh, the earliest consultation you feel like is providing that direction. So the friendly amendment is, is not being accepted in its entirety. I mean, what it could be is just to incorporate that the early consultation be the presentation of this agenda item at their first meeting in April, but wouldn't preclude us from moving forward with direction and approval of the RFP at this time. Right, yeah. So I think it could be a both, a both and, if you will. I think your your number one captures the intent to issue the, the right. uh, request for proposal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Uh, I will move on to Council Member Brown, Council Member Bruner, Council Member Golder, and Council Member Watkins, are you, your hand still up or are you gonna, you're good, okay. Council Member Brown. Yeah, so I, um, I just wanna uh, thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Council Member Watkins, thank you for um, being willing to, um, you know, to include some additional language around in inclusion of the Planning Commission in this process, I think, um, it's really important that we we do that. Um, I and I don't. I'm not saying this because I want to open up another can of worms about what goes in the motion. But I did just want to add that uh, you know the downtown commission also has a really important role to play in this, and and did in the downtown recovery plan. Um, and so you know I hope that they're also prioritized for, to be involved in this process early on. And um, so I, I want to just say that. And then a couple other comments. Uh, you know, I uh, I recognize the interests that and the need that the warriors have to um, try to get some clarity on where things are, you know, where we're headed moving forward for their own planning process. And I want to support that. I want to support them as much as possible. I absolutely agree with my colleagues, with um, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson and Watkins uh, in their appreciation for what the value added that the Warriors bring is not just economic, um, uh, you know, uh, activity, um, but really, uh, you know, a commitment to our community. So I, I just, and I want to thank Chris Murphy for, um, you know, all the work that you do in, in coordinating and leading that effort. 
So um, I, I do want to make sure that we're not, I, I guess I'm just wanting to say and Claire, be clear that I am not um, looking to in, in asking for additional public engagement or the planning commission to be involved or the downtown commission to be involved, trying to delay this process. I just would like to see it be as iterative as possible so that um, when we, we do get to that point of making a decision, people will feel like they have been heard, that that input has been, um, you know, uh, incorporated. And um, I think it'll just be a smoother process kind of, kind of on the, you know, down the road if we do that up front. So I'll, um, I think I'll leave it there. But thank you everyone for working together to get this motion together. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, I wanted to comment on the motion and I'm glad the friendly amendment uh, that Council Member Cummings um, brought in and it was just clarified my, my question in terms of item three of the motion uh, directs planning commission to be prioritized for early consultation in the outreach process. And I wanted to know if the motion maker intended that to be um, uh, in regards to the RFP, but even though number one states that. So um, it sounds like we are, um, the motion is to go ahead with the staff recommendation of the, the identified yellow boundary for the purposes of obtaining RFPs and for the planning commission to take a look at those um, staff recommended uh, uh, boundaries, yellow boundaries. Um, at their first meeting, is that correct? Yes, that's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a both and. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then just for, for everybody's understanding, um, uh, the, the following next steps um, to that would be um, a community engagement, um, uh, in 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 any zoning process um, moving forward with with these proposals, and um, I just I want to make sure that's clear and understood um, because I really share the concern um, that our community members have called in and written about. Um, I also want to um, firmly. Uh, uh, encourage that we make a commitment to really support the Santa Cruz Warriors um, in their needs uh, with uh, moving forward in in a permanent arena and um, staying in Santa Cruz and um, you know what they've contributed um, to our community to the economy uh, what they bring um, I, I think it's really important for us for them to hear a commitment from us in whatever way that looks, um, that they will be able to move forward with a permanent arena. And um, um, I just think, you know, identifying those six goals um, in this staff report was, was all very um, uh, valuable and um, important. And, you know, number, I think it was number three was, working with the Santa Cruz Warriors to establish those design standards. So I really want to emphasize that we make that commitment. Um, in it's part of this piece, but it, it, I don't know how that, you know, piece can really be solidified in and of itself, <laughs> um, you know, irregardless of the whole picture as we move forward, um, if there was a way to do that, so. Um, thank you for clarifying with the friendly amendment. That was what I had. In. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I have Council Member Golder and then um, Council Member Golder. Um, every time I had a question or a comment, somebody else made it. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody for your thoughtful um, process throughout this. And, and thanks to everybody for uh, your comments when you called in. I did want to acknowledge one more 
contribution that the warriors have made to the community. And I just think it's sort of something that sometimes gets lost is that this investment in our youth that's kind of like a future investment when we talk about prevention of um, drug use or homelessness or other um, other things that we're trying to work on now, when we work on pro-social activities like um, the Warriors provide the, the, the reading, Read to Achieve program they do with the schools and just the, the tickets they give away to inspire kids to um, have access to see these um, athletes in action. And, and um, I just, I can't, you know, thank Chris Murphy and the, and the Warriors enough for um, that future investment in our community in, the, in terms of the youth. And um, um, I do look forward to seeing um, what the, you know, process looks like um, as far as, as community engagement goes um, in contributing to this um, very early process of this, this plan. Um, thank you to everybody, and that's, that's all I want to add. Okay. We have a motion uh, with the uh, accepted friendly amendment, and uh, Council Member Cummings, did you have more on the on this item? Two really quick items. Um, one, I just wanted to clarify for um, Council Member Bruner and some of the newer Council Members. Uh, last, I think it was August 11th of 2020, um, the Council voted to send a letter of support and, and commitment to wanting to, to see a permanent home for the Santa Cruz Warriors. So I just, to the, to the questions you had, I just wanted to let you know that, that we, that's kind of what started this process was that item that came on our agenda in August of 2020. So we've we've sent those letters out to, and just to, the, to remind the community that the council did um, support and made it clear to the Warriors that we do wanna to try to create a permanent home for them here in Santa Cruz. And then the other question I had, uh, I just wanted to get clarification from the, the staff. So what, I know we've talked a lot about the zoning changes and everything today, but what what are some of the next steps gonna be? So, you know, we're gonna secure consultant and then are we gonna, when do we expect something to come back to council with kind of like a timeline and, you know, really the different um, time, the different opportunities for engagement with the public? Sure, that's a great question. Um, what I would say um, is that when we come back with the RFP, um, consult the selected consultant from the RFP, that contract will contain um, the proposed process. Now, it's, it probably won't be very specific, as I noted before. You know, they'll probably say an early task is creating a community engagement strategy, but it will be broad in terms of saying, like, we're going to engage the community at steps A, B, and C um, in roughly these time frames, but it won't necessarily dial in how that will occur. But you'll have a, a decent understanding of the number of touch points, you know, so they'll say, you know, we'll have four community meetings and we'll have uh, two uh, uh, surveys of um, the uh, of survey monkey or, or something, you know, it, they'll, they'll basically set the parameters of, this is what our work scope is going to include. So you'll get a, a general idea um, when that comes back. Great, and then, um, yeah, and then I guess at the end of that, that, that process is when we'd finalize these zoning boundaries. Is that correct? It wouldn't be, right. So, well, a couple things. Um, in terms of the specific boundaries, um, what could happen is as part of this process, um, when we're going out to the community, um, the community could say, you know, well, we would prefer if it was this way or that way. And, you know, they could say, well, if that's the case, then, you know, maybe right here, these parcels, or maybe a property owner comes along and says, you know, I own these three parcels right here, and I would like to be included. And, you know, maybe um, we hadn't thought about including them because there are three small parcels. Um, that we didn't expect to redevelop. So, you know, through that process, it will likely be an iterative um, process where, you know, we're working with the community and we're refining those boundaries. What I would expect to happen as part of this and what is, is typically the case is there will be check-ins with the council. So, um, you know, when, when we get to certain stages in the process, 
steps, we'll say, hey, you know, let's bring, you know, a, a typical one is before we select a preferred alternative um, to go study in the EIR, we'll typically bring that to the council and say, council, you know, this is the direction we're heading. We don't want to go do 10, 12, 14 months worth of work if you're not on board with the direction that we're heading. And so, you know, during those check-ins, you'll get an opportunity and, and we can highlight, you know, here's what we've heard from the community. This is why we made these tweaks. This boundary was here and we contracted it because, you know, this was happening and this boundary was here and we expanded it because that was happening. Um, and what do you think? Um, so so it's, um, it would be an integrated process in that respect. Great, I really appreciate that feedback because I think it helps um, for members of the public to understand that this is not gonna be an ongoing process and we're not finalizing boundaries and that there's gonna be opportunity to engage and if we need to change, there's opportunity to do that as well. So thanks, that concludes all my comments on this item. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Golder, your hand is up. Did you want to, uh, another comment? I did, I had one more um, question I wanted to ask and it was, has there been an attempt already or is it part of the process to reach out to the property owners in that yellow zone and maybe some of the close, um, the other, I don't remember the, there are so many letters, but you know, the ones that are close in there to see um, what their thoughts are in this process. And um, I mean, I know there's some properties that I can think of that just seem underutilized or maybe ready for some re revitalization. And so um, I just was wondering that. Sure, so um, you broke up a little bit. So if I, if I, didn't, if I don't cover a part of your question, let me know. Um, but um, we have, so when council made that direction back in um, August, um, we initiated conversations with the Santa Cruz Warriors. And so we have been in conversations with the Santa Cruz Warriors and some of the key landowners in that area where they may have a, um, a, a potential opportunity for a stadium. Um, so we've had a series of conversations with them. We have not done any broader outreach. Um, we haven't done, we haven't kicked off and outreach other than talking with um, the, um, the Warriors and, uh, and some key landowners there, some of the larger parcels. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I was wondering. And, then, and, and but, the, but through the process, you'll reach out to the other, other um, property owners as well, I'm sure. Without a doubt, both yeah. um, within whatever boundaries, but also you know, from a broader range. You know, one of the, the great things about the downtown is that it, draws everyone from the community and it really is the heart of our community. And so we expect that this will have interest not only from the immediate area and the landowners that are um, uh, directly affected, but also the, the larger community who will be affected by the overall look and feel of our downtown. And I have to say, like I was a little embarrassed that I didn't know this until recently, but I didn't realize that the Sycamore Street isn't really considered, that's not considered part of downtown? Um, is that is that why I was confused? I was like, I used to live on Sycamore Street. I thought I lived downtown. So the it's downtown plan, well, <laughs> is that, is, different people have different visions of what downtown is, but the downtown plan itself um, stops on the southern boundary at Laurel. That was surprising to me. I, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it, it is somewhat confusing because some of the same zoning districts, you know, it's still the central business district um, zoning designation, CBDE, um, farther south. So that can add to the confusion as well. You can blame it on our zoning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, great. Um, Mayor, if I could. Yeah. Um, I, I would suggest one um, clarification in the motion um, under the friendly amendment. Um, the first line where it says, and receive input on the general zoning plan and recommendations. I would say, and receive input on the um, report presented as part of this item and associated recommendations, if that's okay with the council. I think that was, is that what the intent is, is basically presenting this report as the kickoff. That's a good catch, yeah. yeah that's how I read it. And I appreciate you correcting the language to reflect that more accurately. Okay, so the motion uh, was, uh, is before you. Um, it is to um, go with the staff recommendation of issuing the RFP 
to secure consultant services to manage the regional early action plan grant funded projects to select the areas currently zoned um, as designated here in the motion language um, as the preliminary boundary that could be refined later for inclusion in the scope for the request of proposals for an expanded downtown plan and direct that the planning commission be prioritized for early consultation in the outreach process and that the intent of that would be it would be going to the planning commission at the first meeting in april to receive input on the report presented as part of this item and associated recommendations um and bonnie i'll is, ask for a roll call vote is this part um acceptable to council member cummings i did have a question about that the associated zoning that's what i'm wondering about because it's it's the zoning that's in the report is that yeah that's yeah. considered the associated recommendations because um or if it could be the an associated zoning recommendations because that i, I think that, that would capture it um but and and I, I just think it would be clear as well that's that's fine with me um i was just um trying to um and, and i think that that is helpful just in sort of making sure that it is broad um i would anticipate that there are going to be um, conversations about that the concern um is that we we're not really sure what those um what the zoning is actually going to be that's going to be later but i think this is absolutely fine the way that it's worded now because um i think that um, what the planning commission will naturally do is start delving into some of the thoughts that they have surrounding where the project may go with the um uh, updated downtown plan and, and future zoning um, that's associated with that yeah, and, the, and I guess the big thing for me was just that what was brought to us today, there was a large zone that's been reduced. And so if there's any input on that or people are bringing input and they wanna weigh in on those different zoning boundaries, that wouldn't stop them from weighing in on, on what's been brought to us today with all the recommendations. Because the full report would be brought, right, Lee? Yes, the, the full report would be brought. And so uh, can I just, jump in here so when you say zoning you mean the three different options for geography right we're not zoning yeah the report doesn't uh, zoning. okay okay so we, had, yeah. we were understanding that word a little differently so you're interested in having the planning commission see all three options and you know hear this whole same report and talk through why we are recommending the yellow one okay i get it thank you sarah for clarifying that Okay, uh, Bonnie, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. <clears throat> Council Member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. Okay, we've got three more items this evening. Um, that one was scheduled for a half an hour and it took us two hours. <laughs> Off we go. Um, so we have next up item number 24, which is the unified master fee schedule correction and code compliance fee structure update. And I have um, Sarah De, De Leon as um, principal management analyst and Laura Landry, code compliance manager, as our presenters. If um, for members of the public who do want to um, speak on this item, uh, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Uh, the order that we'll do this item in is that there will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to, to the council for deliberation and action. So Sarah and Laura, welcome. Thank you for hanging in there tonight. No problem. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Fantastic. So Laura and I will be talking with all of you tonight about fee schedule revisions. Um, what we will be asking for or from you make sure I can click this correctly, is to essentially adopt a resolution to revise our city unified master fee schedule. Um, there's a number of reasons for why we're asking you to do this tonight. Some of them are listed here um, on this slide. 
We will not go over every single one. We'll kind of give you some of the higher points. A lot of the rationale is explained in our staff report for why we're looking at this how we are today. Um, so just some, a little bit of overview and some general points before we really jump into the presentation. I wanted to point out that we are not recommending any new fees as part of the resolution before you. Everything you're seeing today is revisions to existing fees that we have, fees for service specifically for our department planning and community development. Um, these fees for services are different from taxes, they're different from impact fees, um, so we just wanted to make those clarifying points up front. To put it in some context, uh, fees for services are things, you know, back in the good old days when people were coming in person to our counter um, and applying for building permits. It would be the cost for the plan review, per se, for that building permit, or perhaps a research fee from a planning staff, even, you know, charges for copies. So those are the types of fees for services that we're talking about. Again, all existing, none new. Our presentation tonight is going to be split into two sections. Um, I'll be taking care of this first part that really covers rental building and planning, and then Laura will cover a more specific section of our fee schedule um, for code compliance, and that will be structuring their existing fees to more flat rate fees. Um, it's important to note um, as part of Laura's that, and, and the fees that I'm talking about today, all of these fees for services, their charges cannot exceed um, the reasonable cost to provide the service. So you'll notice some attachments as part of the report specifically for Laura's section that provides the analysis and breakdown of how those costs were established for that proposed flat rate fee schedule. So for this first section, the problem you guys are helping me address really is that I have two different universes I'm dealing with, two different uh, fee schedules. The city's unified master fee schedule, which includes some, but not all of our department's fees, and then our department fee schedule. Um, our department fee schedule was, was initially in its format adopted way back in 1987. There were a few fees on the schedule that were left there on accident and didn't make its way to the city's unified master fee schedule. So this resolution will correct that issue. Um, with the adoption of the city's unified master fee schedule in 2017, there were a couple of minor technical errors related to some of our fees. All of this you guys will be able to see on table A of our staff report for everything I'm talking about in this section. Um, but some of those technical errors really caused some inefficiency, particularly for the admin team when it comes to you know, making adjustments every July and January. So making those corrections will really ease that annual and biannual adjustment for myself and for the folks within our, within our administrative division. Um, there's also, as part of the 2017 fee study, there was a large component that was related to cost recovery. And for those departments that, or divisions I should say, of departments that did participate in that cost recovery study, they receive increases every July to try to get to that cost recovery period, if you guys recall that. Um, unfortunately, not all our, of our divisions participated at that time, so that further split up our schedule and put some of the building fees um, on, on our old schedule where they did not receive their CPI adjustments for their hourly rates. So that's another thing we're hoping to correct through this resolution. Another funky part of it is just the fact that because we have this old fee schedule and the city's new one, we now have two different CPI schedules, which from an administrative standpoint has been a nightmare. The old schedule says that CPIs happen in July of each year, and the new schedule says they happen in January. So those are some of the things, again, you guys can reference table A of the staff report for the very specific ones, but for at least this first section, that pretty much covers and what we're trying to accomplish with consolidating everything on the unified master fee schedule. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Laura for the code compliance section. Hi, Laura, Thank welcome. You. Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon to the council members. I'm Laura Landry, and I will be presenting the fees for code compliance services. As background, the Title IV of the Municipal Code provides tools that staff can use to gain compliance. The tools include notice the violation, cost recovery, administrative civil penalties, and administrative citations, just to name a few. While we prefer voluntary compliance, the tools in Title IV can be used in situations where an owner is unwilling to comply. Today, we're here to discuss cost recovery, one of the tools in Title IV. 
With the current fee schedule, costs are recovered through double fees of permits and a reinspection fee. This is problematic for property owners who are working towards compliance and would require a to go through the permit process. They will ultimately pay more than the property owner who's unwilling to comply and does not require a permit. Also, the current schedule the current fee schedule does not require, does not um, encourage compliance. It does not outline the events and the enforcement process and the costs that are associated with those events. Next slide, please. In developing the fee structure, the following six goals were identified. Clarity, consistency, accuracy, fairness, low administrative burden to track time and to encourage compliance. While the goal is always to gain voluntary compliance in situations where there's an active code case, all parties would know what costs may occur if a case does not move towards compliance. The cost would be consistent and accurate and fair regardless of the complexity of the case. Staff would also spend more time working on cases and less time tracking costs. Next slide, please. In developing the fee schedule, we consider two methods, charging out of an hourly rate and a flat rate based on triggering events. We selected the flat rate method due to the complications with the hourly rate. One was the amount of staff, uh, time staff spent tracking costs, and the other, property owners would not know how much the process would cost them and also, it wasn't a ideal method for encouraging compliance. On the other hand, a flat fee rate, the flat fee rate method provided fairness, clarity, and may improve efforts to achieve compliance. It would be less of an administrative burden and flat fee rates tied the cost to a specific event in the code enforcement process. Property owners would know exactly what increased enforcement actions will cost with delayed compliance. Since the trigger and event are the same for every case, regardless of the complexity, it provides clarity, fairness, and consistency. Next slide, please. Here we have a list of trigger and events that were identified as incurring costs. The fee structure is included in attachment seven of the staff report. The costs of each are reflective of an analysis the code compliance specialist performed and represent an average time spent on a variety of cases, which are included in attachment 10 of the staff report. As a note, the reinspection fee is a range scale fee that is based on the number of violations and possible involvement of multiple agencies. For example, a simple, a single violation with by one agency would be less than a reinspection of multiple violations by multiple agencies. I will now um, hand it over to Sarah. So we've created this slide just for convenience of what the recommendation was from the agenda, but at this point, if you guys have any questions, this is the opportunity for that. Um, and I'll, I'll put it back to you, Mayor. Thank you, Sarah and Laura, for that report. And uh, the, the agenda report was really thorough and very clear on kind of the objectives. At least it's my reading of it um, to try to try to try to sort of gather the ducklings, as we as we shall say, <laughs> put everything in one spot, one timeline, one schedule. So very helpful. Um, I will open it up to any questions by council members. Seeing none. Okay, I'll bring this out to the public for questions. I see uh, there's a question, someone from the public with a phone number ending in 1705. Press star six to unmute yourself, please. Hi, thank you for um, taking my comment tonight. I um, note the staff report says that co-compliance provides an important public service vital to protect the protection of public health, safety, and quality of life. I completely agree with that, and I appreciate the work co-compliance does. However, there are some issues with the way co-compliance is um, run. <clears throat> Co 
currently code compliance accepts any complaint without any evidence and there is no absolutely no um, consequence for a party making a false report i had four complaints filed against me within two years all of which were determined to be non-meritorious the department closed them which i appreciate however the department's default is to um, demand that the inspector go on site and investigate even if the resident do doesn't want that so um, i really wish that the department before they revise their fee schedule they revise their their practice so that this doesn't happen anymore and that they don't waste their time investigating non-meritorious complaints and they don't impinge on the residents who don't want them there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I will take it back to council then. Is there any questions or any um, direction on a motion tonight? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. I was just wondering if staff might be able to follow up to that comment from the from members of the public around false um, complaints about co-compliance and then I'm and then I'm happy to make a motion as well Laura or Sarah whoever would like to uh, answer that one or Lee I'm not quite sure who best uh, in the staff level go ahead Laura if you'd like to respond uh, your camera went off and I was like wait maybe she wants me to reply no um, Yes, uh, uh, Council Member uh, Cummings, that is something that we have already discussed within our division, and it is something that has been addressed. So it's uh, it's something that's recent. Um, I do appreciate the comment from the public, and I just want to inform you that there is something that a conversation that has already happened, and it's also been part of the process now. Thank you, and then um, I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. So this is a resolution revising the United, no, the Unified Master Fees Schedule correcting fees for planning, zoning, and building, moving all planning and community development department fees from the department fee schedule to the Unified Master Fee Schedule, updating certain fees by consumer price index adjustments and changing co-compliance fees from actual costs to flat rates identified in Exhibit A. Great, Councilmember Watkins. I'm prepared to second the motion. Okay, great. So we have a motion to um, approve the staff recommendation uh, made by Council Member Cummings, but a second by Council Member Watkins. And Bonnie, we will go ahead unless uh, Council Members have any other questions. No, not seeing any. Okay, we will uh, go ahead and have a roll call vote, please. I did, I did have one question. Sure. Sorry. Um, I just did, I, I, I know this is, um, Staff brought up in the presentation the differences between and the conflict between, um, you know, using CPI. I think it was from July versus January. So when would the fee schedule be updated for? Like, have there been any updates uh, in January of 2021? And when would the updates, I guess, occur? Yes. Or would they occur yes. after, after this? Would they? Yeah, if they've already occurred. Yeah, I'm just trying to reconcile the alignment of the different schedules and when they would kind of come into effect. Trust me, it's been a doozy for me too. Um, so we have adjusted them for the ones that they've missed through 2017 based on January CPIs that they've missed and so that they can cleanly be updated this January 2022. That sounds so weird. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, that's all my questions. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, so Bonnie, can you do a roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? I think she's frozen. Frozen, yeah. Um, Texture. Uh, do 
want to wait or? Uh, oh, here she is. Oh, here she is. Hi. 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 And Mayor Myers. Hi. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. Well, we caught up caught up on time real real fast there, you guys. Um, okay, now we're moving on to uh, item number 25 on our general business agenda. This is the emergency ordinance um, temporarily extending the moratorium preventing commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of economic losses related to, to the coronavirus pandemic. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. And I will go ahead and turn this over. Kathy, I'm assuming it's you since uh, I see you and not Tony. So, Hi. Kathy. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm going to be immediately passing it over to Stephanie Duck in our office who has prepared a short presentation. And I'm also aware that um, Bonnie Lipscomb is on the call and uh, she's available to answer questions as well. Great, thank you. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Um, I was gonna say good afternoon, but maybe good evening at this point. Um, I don't have a presentation, but as you just said, this is a proposed emergency ordinance to extend the city's temporary moratorium on commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of economic uh, losses related to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think most of the, the details and confusing executive order names and ordinances are all laid out in the staff report, but I just wanted to give you a brief kind of high level overview review and then see if you've had any uh, follow-up questions. Um, so as you are aware, the city previously adopted an emergency ordinance imposing a temporary moratorium on both residential and commercial evictions. Um, the city's authority to do this came from um, an ex executive order issued by Governor Newsom, which suspended state law that would preempt or restrict a local government from imposing limitations on commercial or residential evictions uh, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, on August 31st of last year, Governor Newsom signed into law Assembly Bill 3088, which imposed a temporary statewide eviction moratorium for non-payment of rent for residential tenancies, um, but was silent as to commercial tenancies. Um, AB 3088 preempts the city from either extending or adopting any new residential eviction moratorium ordinances. Um, However, on September 23rd of last year, Governor Newsom issued Executive Order Number 8020, um, which extended a local uh, local jurisdiction's authority to impose um, commercial eviction protections um, through March 31st of this year. He then um, extended this authority again in Executive Order Number 321, with the ability to impose commercial eviction protections through June 30th of this year. So um, while the commercial eviction moratorium adopted by council last year is um, has likely been extended by Governor Newsom's most recent executive order, our office recommends um, out of abundant, abundance of caution that the, um, the city council consider adopt, adopting this new emergency ordinance, um, imposing a temporary uh, moratorium on commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of economic losses related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So happy to answer any questions if needed. Um, like I said, I think there's a lot of ordinances and names in there, so happy to help clarify. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Bonnie, um, did you have anything to add, Bonnie Lips Lipscomb? Hi, no, a Mayor, um, I think Stephanie said it all. I, you know, in general, you know, we're supportive of this um, continuing through June, just to give that level of assurance um, to businesses um, in the midst of, of trying to get back on their feet as we hopefully move from the red tier to the orange tier, um, that this is a level of assurance that the city supports them. Um, their rent continues to be due, um, and so that's something that they'll need to negotiate with their landlord if they find themselves unable to pay at this time, but they won't have to worry about evictions, which is really critical. Thank you. Thank you. 
And thank you, um, Stephanie. I'll go ahead and see uh, if council members have questions. I see council member Cummings and council member Golder. Thank you, Mayor. I just had one question. I, I know there's a, a number of different timelines that were brought up, and I know that um, the residential eviction moratorium was mentioned. And so I was just wondering when the last date was for the executive orders at the state level and the timeline. So, so the the last date for the executive order, um, if you're talking about the one that that um, contains the language for residential moratoriums as as well as commercial eviction moratoriums, that expired um, September 30th, and that was through Executive Order 7120. But then, the governor in Executive Order 8020 continued to extend the, the initial executive order that this all stemmed from, but just left out the residential language. And so it, from, from moving forward from there, he only referred to commercial eviction protections, which were until March 31st, and then now June uh, 30th of this year. Thank you. Council Mayor, if, if I could just add to that, you know, separately at the state level, uh, the governor signed SB 90 or 91 into effect, um, which protects the residential. So I just wanted to make sure that we have presented um, as part of the city manager's report on a companion bill in the house a few months ago. And so there are um, pretty extensive protections for residential in place at this time, as well as funding. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, any other questions by council members? Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, for your work on this, appreciate it. I'll go ahead and take it out to the public now for comments. I am not seeing any hands up in the public. So I will go ahead and come back to the council. Um, council member Golder. I was just ready to make a motion. <laughs> That's why I raised my hands before. So, um, but I see people raising their hands. So maybe people have more comments. Um, yeah. Um, no? so the motion I was, uh, was going to uh, second. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So I can read that. Uh, uh, I make, make make a motion to adopt an emergency ordinance preventing commercial evictions for non-payment of rent as a result of economic losses related to the coronavirus pandemic, for so long as authorized by the governor. And a second by Council Member Watkins. Yep. And Bonnie will do a roll call vote unless there's any further questions by council members. I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay. Let's do a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Golder. Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, so we will move on to our final item. No, we've still got, nope, we do have a, this will be our final item of the evening. Um, next up is agenda item number 26, which is the Parks and Recreation Annual Report. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Um, the staff presenter tonight will be Lindsay Bass, our principal management analyst with our Parks and Recreation Department. And the item is a motion is to accept the fiscal year 2020 Parks and Recreation Annual Report. Welcome, Lindsay. I'm not sure. She's Lindsay. on there, but her video is not on. I can't see her in my queue. Uh, Lindsay, are you able to press star six to join us? 
see her. Yeah, there she is. Hi there. We we can't hear you though. We're not getting any. Um, there you go. Great. How about now? <laughs> hear you now. Welcome. Jeez, apologies. Sorry for the late technical difficulties. No I know up. Tony's here as well, and he's coming um, into the meeting. Um, okay, great. In a few moments. All right. Hi, I'm Mayor and City Council. Let me uh, share my screen here. my screen we can see it yes all right all right are we good to go go ahead and jump into it here yeah go ahead Tony all right thanks mayor all right well thank you um, yeah thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about the Parks and Recreation Department's uh, annual report uh, this is our uh, first one first attempt at this uh, so we're bringing this to the council this evening uh, to share with you and to share with the community uh, and get your feedback um, uh, on this report. Give us direction for future years and how this can be most helpful to the council uh, and for the community uh, looking toward uh, the future. So um, um, yeah, so really the purpose of this annual report, the reason that we are doing this uh, is to summarize the Parks and Recreation Services and the scope of our operations to the community. This is an opportunity for us to benchmark uh, the work that we're doing uh, for, um, uh, for the community, for the council, uh, and lend to uh, just a more informed discussion uh, on budget um, and discussions throughout uh, each year. Uh, it's also a mechanism um, for us to sort of provide a, a state of parks and rec uh, each each year uh, prior to budget discussions. And again, it'll help us lead into those budget uh, conversations and help shape priorities based on the different uh, situations that we are facing in a given year. So um, with that, I'll send it over to Lindsay, and then we'll just go through a short presentation here tonight and hope to open it up to council uh, for some feedback and, and discussion here tonight. I'll send it over to Lindsay for now. Uh, Lindsay, we can't hear you. I leave my mute button off, sorry. <laughs> Um, I was just going to add one of the um, important, I think, benefits of um, us going through this process of developing our first annual report was really to be able to um, have a moment for reflection, um, to look and assess kind of, you know, what, what did we say we were going to do? What were we able to deliver on? Where did we run into challenges and why was that? And so um, I think through this process, it's been a good opportunity uh, to reflect and I think um, as we do this uh, more year on year, uh, we want to make that a more robust process, um, both internally and with um, our advisory bodies and elected officials. So um, this is a, a first, first effort on our part. So uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks, Lindsay. All right, so just really quickly, again, we'll move uh, uh, relatively rapidly here, um, but wanted to just start quickly with our mission, uh, again, just primarily for the community here, which is providing environments, experiences, and programs that enrich the lives of residents and build a healthy community. So we're actually, this is something that Lindsay will talk about a little bit uh, later on, but want to work to refine our mission and vision and so forth. But for now, this is really summarizes uh, the work that we do in the department. In uh, 2020, you can see some of our key overarching goals here, um, but I wanted to just provide a bit of a snapshot on the Parks and Recreation Department um, as a whole. Uh, so uh, in fiscal year 2020, our budget uh, was just over 17 million. Uh, that includes the WARF budget as well. We had uh, 84 uh, full-time employees maintained over 1,700 acres of parks and open spaces and beaches. Uh, and maintained 34 miles of trails. Um, just some of the high points. This is a, a park system that is uh, easy and worth uh, bragging about. It's an amazing park system here in Santa Cruz and something we can all take great pride in and, and um, 
put a lot of love and, and care into certainly, but a couple of the high points, 96% uh, of our residents uh, in Santa Cruz are within a 10 minute walk of a park. Uh, that's among the highest in the, in the country. Uh, we have nearly three times the park acreage per capita than the national average. Uh, and as uh, everyone knows, we've got world-class surf breaks and skate parks and public spaces and amenities uh, such as West Cliff and the Santa Cruz Wharf and on and on. Um, I could talk about this a lot in terms of what Santa Cruz Parks and Rec is and what the park system is, what recreation does and services to the community. Um, but I would just summarize and say that really uh, Santa Cruz Parks and Rec uh, is really at the heart of the green economy and it's right at the heart of health and health policies as well. Our three pillars in parks and recreation are health and wellness, social equity and conservation. So it's almost identical to uh, health and all policies. It's right in line. The work that we do every day is right in line uh, with that. So uh, I'm very proud of that work. Um, I'll send it back over to Lindsay to talk a little bit about some of the department highlights that you will see captured in the annual report. Great, thanks, Tony. Um, so there were far too many achievements um, in a very challenging year um, to list here um, on this slide. Um, but we did want to highlight just a few from each of the major goal areas that Tony just um, uh, spoke to. Um, so among those included the fact that we were able to um, complete a multi-year CAL FIRE grant that resulted in 500 um, plantings and the inventory of more than 20,000 city trees. Um, we had a recreation department that we started calling them lightning in a bottle because um, in the most uh, critical moments of the onset of the pandemic, they did some amazing pivots um, to our work that really um, extended a hand to the community at a time when um, everybody was feeling very isolated and boy, did they, they were there for us. They brought us together in new and creative ways. One of which was the virtual recreation platform that they stood up um, in pretty um, rapid fashion, and that became a model for other area communities to look to for inspiration and as an example. Um, additionally, um, at a time when we didn't understand much about the COVID virus, um, they put together a working families um, child care program and provided essential child care um, so that people that needed to go to work but had kids that were home from school could continue to do so and bring home that paycheck. Um, in addition, uh, during a challenging year where most construction work came to a halt um, in the fourth quarter, um, we were still able to get um, over $300,000 of park improvements completed. You'll read a little bit more about those in the report. And then in addition, we had more than $15,000 in scholarships provided to our Friends of Parks and Recreation nonprofit group and over 2,700 hours donated by volunteers to maintain important parks, beach, and open spaces. Now, these are the achievements that we wanted to highlight for fiscal year 20, which was um, a very unique year. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that in a more normal year, we service over 130,000 people um, who benefit from our classes, camps, events, and sports leagues, um, not to mention um, the millions of people that visit our wharf, West Cliff, and our multitude of parks and amenities. Um, as you look at this list of achievements, one thing that we reflect on as we see this list, though, is you know some commonalities to our success, and um, those include the fact that we wouldn't be able to do these things and achieve um, these outcomes without dedicated, experienced, and skilled staff. Um, we would not be able to do these things without incredible community partners. Um, our work really does take a village, and so our successes depend on wonderful inspiration work and partnership from many. Um, to that end, uh, collective ingenuity and flexibility. This year was a great example of um, how we have earned that moniker of being the can-do department. Um, and finally, um, our collective ability to succeed and the achievements that are before you um, 
are, are important because they touch the community in very real ways. So this has very real direct impacts um, on people. And, and we saw that both in um, the work that I mentioned that our recreation department did, but also in the work that our parks teams did to maintain outdoor spaces that became essential refuges for people over um, the course and the onset of the pandemic. So um, I could go on uh, much longer than that, but I'll turn it back to Tony to um, tell you a little bit more about um, some of the challenges that we faced in 2020. All right, thanks, Lindsay. All right, so we wanted to use the annual report to, to also, again, as we're thinking about benchmarking, to, to think about and reflect on some of the challenges uh, that we faced uh, in 2020. And we'll use this, um, I hope to use this component uh, in our annual report moving forward just to reflect on the challenges that we're facing and, and hopefully address those so that in future annual reports we can say, hey, we, we resolved that, no problem. We moved on from that, um, uh, that crisis or that challenge. But uh, in the report, you'll see that we flagged um, and we really created a highlight uh, with respect to staff safety. So this was an item that the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, reviewed in 2020 and was a really critical item for us within the department. Uh, we've taken a lot of steps within the department, including working on a new uniform uh, policy. You'll see us uh, glowing neon yellow uh, in the coming uh, months as we move to different logo vests and different uniforms out in the field and the wharf and across the park system. Uh, to improve communications. We had um, kind of some old school flip phones across the department before, but now we've moved to uh, smartphones and that allows us to communicate better, but it also allows us to uh, document uh, and improve our work order system and incident tracking as well. So we're taking a lot of steps within the department, but that's an item that was a big priority uh, and a challenge for us. Um, and I would be remiss to not include that, that this isn't just staff safety, but this is really public safety. Uh, and so it's a broader discussion on how to make sure our parks are safe. And it's uh, a collaborative effort with the police department, um, neighborhood parks uh, team in particular, uh, to enhance staff and public safety. Um, the second item, um, Santa Cruz parks and open spaces continue uh, to be among uh, some of the most commonly used uh, spaces probably in the county uh, by individuals ex experiencing homelessness. And the city's outdoor living ordinance uh, has really begun to address challenges in, you know, with respect to this, uh, this factor. Um, but this will definitely uh, continue to be an issue both for the individuals living uh, in the parks and experiencing homelessness but also for a natural environment and the public uh, seeking to access parks. So identified that as, a, as an ongoing challenge uh, for the park system. Um, the third item, pandemic-driven impacts on the department. Um, the pandemic impacted the department in, in a number of ways. We canceled a lot of events. We've had to close parks. Um, uh, it's a number of, of different factors. And so Lindsay highlighted the way that we've used these challenges to create opportunities. So virtual uh, programming, for an example, was a way that we utilized the challenge or embraced the challenge to create uh, an opportunity. Um, I think on this, on this item in particular, um, you know, it, it's something that between the, the city manager and the council and the commission, this is an area I think as we continue to look at um, uh, impacts on resources, both financial um, and you know broader resources across the department, working very collaboratively and strategically with the council and commission uh, on how we address these impacts moving forward. And so that's really the core of the annual report, using this as a tool to work together uh, to uh, address the challenges we'll face uh, moving forward. Um, so I share, I provided a little bit of a brief summary of the scope of Parks and Recreation uh, and a brief snapshot of our annual budget and staffing. And uh, on number four, so it's operating and maintaining a diverse, extensive system with limited financial resources. So we've recently done within the department um, some analysis and looking at standards across the country and looking at standards across the state of California in terms of uh, park systems and, and uh, recreation systems, um, what is the right number, what's, 
what is the right number of staff or what are the right levels of resources to serve this, this scope of a parks and recreation department and system? Uh, and that analysis, and again, looking at comps from other communities uh, across the state, staff per acre, staff per capita, um, a lot of different ratios that we've measured, and some of this came from the work from management partners uh, that, the, um, that worked for the city uh, in the past months. Really the number of full-time staff that the Parks and Recreation Department needs to, to get by at a baseline level is about 100 FTEs. It's slightly over 100 FTEs. Um, and currently, currently we have 75 FTEs, but as we're looking at this annual report, at the time of the report, we had about 85, 84 FTEs. From a capital investment standpoint, uh, our capital investment um, is, is very minimal. We invest our impact fees, Quimby and Park Tax, uh, to, Lindsay shared the number, $300,000 that we invested into our system in 2020. But really that number needs to be in the ballpark of at least four to six million dollars per year to invest in our system. We currently have um, estimated 80 to 100 million dollars in deferred maintenance. And so having an annual investment of four to six million is really best practice uh, and most uh, common uh, across uh, parks and rec agencies in California and comparable communities uh, across the United States. So um, just a couple uh, sort of, again, benchmarks and goals for us as we think about really where we need to be in terms of uh, um, operating at an optimal level. Um, and then the last uh, item here, the ability to respond to new and emerging community needs. Um, this is where I think parks and recreation is really defined as this can-do department. And there's so many opportunities or needs that come up. And so in 2020 in particular, uh, with a variety of initiatives related to social justice, this is where Parks and Recreation was uh, stretched and challenged, but able to uh, step up in terms of the Mission Bell Project um, uh, or the London Nelson Community Center, Loudon Nelson Community Center initiative. So these will always come up and they're important for our community and part of what Parks and Rec does, but certainly a challenge in the capacity to uh, address these, work with the community and be really uh, a good partner and really strategic and working uh, together on these type of initiatives uh, here in Santa Cruz. So um, again, just a summary of some of the challenges and hope to use this plan um, to identify some of these that we can work uh, collaboratively with the council and commission uh, to address these on an annual basis. So with that, I'll shift it back over to Lindsay. And I'll just preface um, my quick comments here by saying this is our last slide. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we did want to share with you that um, through the process of creating the report and uh, sharing the report, beginning to get uh, feedback, we took this to the Parks and Recreation Commission in January and got really, really thoughtful feedback from both the commissioners and the public on aspects of the report. And that helped us in a number of ways, um, one of which was it kind of reaffirmed some of the things that we had been hearing from staff as well as some things that we had been thinking ourselves as a management team about the need to revisit our mission, vision, and values to make sure that they were aligned um, with our goals and objectives, to make sure that we really had a strong North Star for um, the department and our team um, to use in setting priorities but also in making hard decisions. Um, and so that is work that we have um, uh, advanced more quickly and prioritized um, and are trying to move that uh, forward um, in preparation um, in, in part for this fiscal year, but definitely um, we'll have things um, more fully developed for FY23. Um, I mentioned benchmarking um, before, um, but just the ability to begin to kind of look at um, comparable agencies. Um, Tony mentioned uh, management partners, so looking at a subset of agencies um, that they have assessed, as well as a subset of agencies that tend to have a, a, a park system or aspects of a department that um, uh, are closely aligned with our own here in Santa Cruz. And understanding where do we stack up? How do we, how do we measure up? And um, using that to really figure out, you know, what, 
where do we want to be in the future? You know, what are those goals and objectives um, and milestones that we need to be reaching for? So um, that's been hugely helpful. And finally, um, the process. Um, you know, no process is perfect, um, and we look to improve on our process of um, using this annual report to um, and the information that we receive from our elected officials through um, efforts like tonight, um, through conversations like those that we had with the Parks and Recreation Commission and the public um, to fine tune how we communicate um, the value of parks and recreation and the return on investment that the community and uh, the council are getting on an, on our department. Um, and that's something that is, is key to stakeholders and the community. And so um, over uh, uh, this process and um, the coming years, we hope to continue to have more and more robust um, dialogue and conversations with you all um, so that um, we are aligned and um, tackling these challenges and moving towards um, a North Star that will bring great things for our community. So with that, I'll hand it back to Tony and he'll uh, wrap this up. All right, thank you very much, Lindsay. And yeah, just to summarize here, our request for the City Council this evening uh, is to approve the Parks and Rec 2020 annual report. Uh, this could be formal action to, to approve it or uh, could just hear it really this evening, but we wanted to bring it on general business this evening so that we could have a, a broader conversation and give the council that opportunity uh, to give formal direction on this. And, and just wanted to give the community the opportunity as well uh, to weigh in. But I think a couple of the key questions, I think for us, uh, for the council, are what types of information would be most helpful to the council um, in this annual report um, in future years? And how can we ultimately make this a better tool um, uh, for the council's understanding of our, our department? And um, how can we use this as a tool for the council to help set strategic direction uh, for the department, whether it's related to budget or our operations. Um, so again, anything that could really help the council through this mechanism um, would be helpful in um, assisting us to tailor this in future years to make it most effective for you uh, and for the community uh, as a whole. So again, I just wanna thank uh, Mayor Myers and the council for the opportunity to, to share this report. Uh, it was fun to put it together, and uh, you know we're excited to be able to tell the story of Parks and Rec, and just appreciate your support and the community support, and uh, would love to open it up for any questions. Thank you, Tony and Lindsay, um, and uh, it looks like that might be a fire break there in Moore Creek, if I'm not uh, mistaken, since I've uh, I've crawled around though out there looking for Ohlone tiger be beetles over the years, um, so. Um, Great shot. Um, thank you for the report, and um, I will turn it over to council for comments and questions. Um, I, I'm gonna kind of cue myself here real quick, um, just to a few things out there. Uh, and then uh, Vice Mayor Bruner and Council Member Golder, I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, I'm just flabbergasted by what you guys do with the amount of people you have. <laughs> Um, and I think you impact, your department impacts our residents every single day, whether they take a walk to a park in the morning with their dog or they spend the afternoon with their kids in Frederick Street Park or um, you know they are using the skateboard park or what have you. Um, I think that you guys um, should think of yourself um, as just you're right, Tony. You are you're you're more than critical green infrastructure. I mean, you are critical infrastructure for our community. Period. Um, people live in Santa Cruz um, because of these extraordinary parks and open spaces that we have. And I can't um, not say that and recognize people who were visionary when they protected those open spaces. You know, people like Celia Scott. People like. Um, you know, the folks who saved Arana Gulch. Um, I remember living here when those things were happening and um, you don't really realize it, you know, as a young college student, but those were really forward thinking actions that really have created um, this place that we all love. Um, and you guys are stewarding those places and those resources moving forward. Um, I think having the annual report is a wonderful idea because I think your um, department is unfortunately the department that gets cut first when we go into crisis. 
um, you have some of the most important infrastructure that helps our community stay healthy and vibrant. Um, and I'm especially thinking about the pool and the work that um, uh, Council Member Watkins and Council Member Brown and I did with looking at, you know, how do we bring that back to life? It's an important part of not just for people to be healthy, but literally for people to learn how to swim in a community that where they live next to the ocean. So it's a critical piece of infrastructure for, for our families to have access to um, and for people to, to remain healthy. I mean, I've done master swimming there and I've watched 85 and 90 year old people go back and forth in that pool over the last 30 years. So um, it's a really critical and important thing to the community. So I think this report is really, really um, a great idea to really let the council know what's happening with the department because you are sort of the silent, um, you know, the silent giant amongst other, um, other departments. Um, I have one question for you guys. Um, is the department engaged with the Bay Area Open, Sp Open Space Council at all? Um, Santa Cruz County is considered part of the Bay Area Open Space Council area. It's a nine county, but we're the special 10th county. Um, that group especially um, has done just outstanding work over the last really 15, 20 years in really under helping, you know, what parks mean to people, you know, they're the ones that have, with East Bay Regional Parks, you know, they're the ones that sort of started the prescription for parks or parks for prescription programs, things like that, that really make a difference in people's lives. Are, are you, are we members of that or do we engage in that effort at all? We're engaged with a lot of different groups. I'd say through the pandemic in particular, engagement has increased definitely throughout the region. Uh, but that's a group that, to my knowledge, we have not connected with. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that. that yeah, I, I would, um, because I think that they have um, a number of dashboards and community um, wellness measurements and other ways that they're looking at the value of parks. Uh, they've done some green infrastructure work, they've done green economy work, um, Bay Area Open Space Council. They're out of Berkeley, but again, Santa Cruz County is part of their region, and they, I think they have some of the most forward people, thinking people in, in the United States literally involved in that organization. Um, and they have an amazing annual conference that is really, really great. So um, mostly compliments. Um, I, think, um, I think some forecasting when you say things like um, you have a deferred, uh, deferred uh, capital improvement program that's 80 to $100 million. That sort of doesn't, in a sense, it's terrifying, but also in a way doesn't mean anything, right? So, you know, looking at how do we, you know, in the next 10 years, what is in that capital improvement program? Is it rebuilding our pool? Is it rebuilding Civic Auditorium? Is it building a new basketball court? You know, um, so trying to trying to put a face to that number is really important because there is a lot of value in what you provide to the community. So that would be one thing that I would um, uh, look. And then I think the Quimby tax and some of the things where you guys get your money is a big black box for a lot of our community. Um, and you're eligible for those things, and a lot of those things are tied to development. Um, and, and, and a lot of the projects that we're kind of queuing up on may provide those resources to you. So I think um, trying to figure out how to convey that boring Quimby calculation, all of that, really helping people understand that investing in our community by building housing, by building commercial, by building the things that help a community grow, actually also helps our parks department. So, you know, these are investments that we require and that the state requires when the state sees a community providing, you know, opportunity for people to expand their businesses or bring in a hotel or maybe, you know, bring in some housing. That benefit actually by state law goes to our local recreation and parks department. So that's a really important relationship that I think is really important to also convey in the report. Those are my main, main comments. So thank you for doing it very well, well worthwhile. Um, I'll call on Vice Mayor Bruner and then Council Member Golder and then Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, uh, thank you, Tony and Lindsay. I see you. Great work. Great report.
support. Uh, your crews are just out there, and this past year I know has been challenging. Um, thank you for all that you contribute and, and have done. Um, this report really um, does a great job highlighting uh, some of the stats and, and, and the work. On my question is that page 12, um, the fast facts, I found that really helpful as a glance. And I think one other tool that might be considered would be a map. Um, a map of the city parks and where the volleyball courts are and where the tennis courts are, um, instead of just saying that there are six tennis courts, for example. So um, for future consideration, I think that would be a really helpful tool for council, for the public, to uh, consider a um, parks and recreations map at least uh, you know, uh, yeah. So that fast facts is great, um, and you know, I the really essential public services, your programs, your parks, your open spaces, and um, you know, for the well-being of our community. Thank you for putting this together and really showcasing everything that you do do. Great comment, thank you. I got uh, Council Member Colder. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I completely echo everything that the mayor and vice mayor uh, said. And I, I was thinking, um, and it's kind of a question, but I know we talked to at one meeting about how the, and I've seen it with my own eyes, how many people are using our trails and our outdoor recreation facilities, especially in, um, you know, um, during the pandemic. And so one thing that I was curious about, has there, and I know that budgets are tight, but we are, we are moving forward with some of these development. Has there been any talk about acquiring new property for potential, you know, parks or or sports fields, or or um, maybe building additional trails and things like that for people to use, um, and so maybe like just one thing that you could add in a future report is you know things that you're planning to do in the future. I guess instead of kind of echoing what the mayor said, but I just think um, our outdoor facilities are are so well used and I think, I don't know, I'm sure you probably have numbers about how many more people are using the trails, especially during this time. Um, it would just be great to see more. <laughs> Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yes to everything that was said. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Tony, for the presentation and all the work that your department does. Really, really um, just in true gratitude for um, what your department provides to our community. Um, it's really amazing to see all the components of health and all policies in here. And I think this is such a great department and a great um, uh, uh, this, this report is a great opportunity to show how we operationalize this framework. Um, and it can be used as a model for our city as a whole and other departments. I mean, I just, I see it everywhere here around environmental sustainability, equity, well-being. Um, so I think to explicitly draw that out will be really wonderful um, as a model for the rest of our departments and, and our city in general. Um, you know, you mentioned, somebody mentioned um, partnerships. I think you did, Tony, that, that this work has a lot of partnership. That's, that's another um, tenant of health and all policies is that collaboration and partnerships is how we move forward with these pillars of equity. Um, excuse me, equity, well-being, and sustainability. And um, I think one further step is to think about partnerships in terms of generating further revenue um, and using this as a launching point for grant prospecting. There's so much that we do around um, youth prevention, uh, substance use prevention, criminal justice system involvement. Um, so, so I think there's, there's, we can think of furthering partnerships with these systems, with you know maybe the child welfare system, the education system. So there are a lot of state grants and federal grants out there that are particular to those systems and may not necessarily at a, um, 
at a first glance seem like it's a fit for a city parks and rec department. But I think we can absolutely make the case that we do so much work that interrelates and crosses over to these other systems that we would be primed for some um, additional revenue for the amazing work that you do. So thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I appreciate, obviously, the report was wonderful and the work that you're, you and your team is doing in our community is, is more than essential, but is just what contributes to making Santa Cruz as special a place as it is. I want to echo a lot of the comments that have been made by my colleagues. On the kind of the last comment that Councilmember Kalantari Johnson brought up in regards to partnerships, I do think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I know we talked about it with some of the workforce development stuff and things that you already really have in place. I, uh, I really recognize just the challenges around um, quantifying the work, right? Because prevention is really hard to quantify, and we know how much it costs when things are um, going to be fixed, but it's really hard to say how much we saved when we do things right. And however we can start shifting that narrative around parks as public safety, around youth engagement and community engagement as public safety, as uh, social uh, engagement and responsibility of our environment, the more we sort of shift that narrative and, and recognize the essential components of our community. Um, I really want to share what was mentioned around sort of the potential for using parks as a prescription for health and the equity conversation around how to continue to ensure that all members of our community have access to our incredible facilities. And, you know, I really want to see personally how we can have more diversity in our junior lifeguards program with a number of the students in the beach flex community and potentially supporting them getting to the harvey west pool if they need um, swimming lessons and, and learning how to um learning how to swim so that they can feel comfortable and confident going into the program um, but diversity in that program would be incredible and it's something i, I aspire to see move forward i also just will add um kind of an affirm affirming kind of response around thinking about forecasting and financial um, opportunities around other revenue options. I know, Tony, you've brought these up in the past in terms of really looking at sort of these equity fee scales, but also impact bonds and such like that to really ensure that we can kind of just keep in mind how I think what, you know, the mayor brought up in terms of just our overall community, um, longstanding community investment in, in these natural resources. And then, um, just, you know, appreciation and acknowledgement of how nimble you were and your team was this last year. Your report really showed that. And um, also just highlighting the stories in the, in the quotes that you brought up. It's about how you feel. And I was looking at that last slide and I was thinking about my daughter, like, going crazy through the, like, Arana Gulch Bridge on her scooter. And I'm like, no, knock people over. And, and it's like this incredible feeling that you have when you experience our parks, right? And so how to just really incite that as we tell our stories. But, um, yeah, thank you for bringing this item to us today and, and, and offering us an ability to provide some feedback and, and response. Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings. Yeah, I'll just echo my colleague's comments. I mean, everything that's been said, I totally agree. I, um, I'm always amazed by the work that you all do and, um, and the way that um, you are um you do it in a way that um that makes it it's it just it just um it just reflects the the commitment that you all have and that you know and and what santa cruz is that you are really really a huge part in making that possible um and so you know i and i want to also just thank all of the parks workers the frontline workers who are um, out there every day and you know, we kind of take it for granted that um, things are going to be there and, you know, we will be able to use the parks and we'll be able, the trails will be cleared and all of these things. And, um, and I know that it's challenging to do that um, with, especially with constrained resources. And so I think that the work that, that folks do out in the field is just amazing and I want to really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you are, you know, working on ways to address the, um, the safety issues, the concerns that were raised earlier um, last year. And um, I, in terms, of, and the document itself is great. I'm excited to, you know, be able to draw from it. To, you know, when I'm talking about the parks pro and um, open space with uh, with folks out in our community and, and beyond, really, um, and you know, to really highlight what it, what you know, the treasure our system is. Um, 
And then just following on the um, comments made around forecasting and potential for additional revenues, um, you know, I know you're, um, Tony you're, and, and Lindsay, but Tony, when you're talking about the challenges, you're very delicate about um, saying that, you know, we don't have enough resources. I mean, I want to put an exclamation mark on the fact that we really need to, as a community, invest in our parks system. And um, and we aren't going to have the general fund, you know, a robust, sufficiently robust general fund to, you know, to provide all of the funding that um, we, we really deserve. So um, I think that maybe in um, in the and I think in the future, so forecasting and, and giving people like uh, helping them see what um, is what's coming and what they can be a part of, and you know, trying to set up for some. You know, additional fundraising from within our community. Um, I know we've met, talked briefly about a capital campaign, and I think that maybe including some of that, those details around um, the capital investment needs, um, and then also um, perhaps just referencing uh, ways that people can get involved in either through Adopted Park, which I recently did, and it's it's been great, and you know, so so those kinds of ways that. that involved and be supportive, um, even if it's not a financial contribution, that they're part of our parks um, program. And um, so I think that was all I had for, yes, I think that's it. So, but thank you, really, it, this is so great. I'm, I love it. I'm going to use it a lot. I've got Council Member Cummings and then uh, City Manager Martine Bernal, and it looks like we do have one person in the audience that would like to speak tonight as well. Thanks, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Tony and Lindsay, for this presentation. This is great. Um, I'm not gonna, well, I'll just say I agree with all my colleagues, so I don't have to repeat everything they said, um, but you all do amazing work, and our parks are probably one of our number one assets here in Santa Cruz that people come here for from all over, and people really appreciate, I mean, um, Tony and I, we got to go out to the disc golf course recently and just being able to appreciate some of the world-class outdoor space that we have here. And just really, I mean, through the pandemic, um, having uh, gone to college in the Midwest and spent time in other places in the country where I wouldn't have imagined uh, how it would have been like to not have access to these amazing spaces, like how fortunate we are to be able to live in a place with so many um, outlets for being able to get out and enjoy nature and to be in healthy environments. And so just, you know, constantly I'm grateful for all the work that's been done over the years so that we can enjoy these spaces in our community. Um, I think the report is, is great. I think one thing worth keeping uh, in mind potentially is when we have, you know, as this report gets developed over years, um, it might be worth, you know, when we have, um, you know, the those, when we, sorry, maybe incorporating like a, a additional graphs, so like line graphs that could show revenues versus expenditures and how that changes over time. And then that might be able to give the community a sense of, you know, how has, how have our revenues improved, how have our uh, expenditures changed, and then, you know, really getting the community to kind of think about that as well so that there are opportunities for um, revenue generation that we can think creatively about that together. And like pie charts are great, but I, I feel like, you know, being able to see how things change over time really give people a sense of, you know, where have we come from and where are we currently at so we can kind of project where we're going moving forward. And then um, I also, um, in response to Councilmember Bruner's comment regarding uh, including maps, I wonder if it would be good, um, you know, moving forward to consider, you know, putting some – if we're you know, thinking about maps, maybe putting even maps online where people, if they wanted to see where the parks were, they could see you know, where all the parks are in the city, where the bocce ball courts are. And I think as well for people who are considering um, coming to Santa Cruz, being able to see like, oh, they have all these skate parks. Where are the skate parks at? You know, like they've got bocce ball courts. I mean, I just learned about the bocce ball court at the wharf, which is great, um, but really 
uh, having spent a lot of time out there, wasn't aware that that was out there. Or maybe you know, it's more recent than I've, than the last few times I've been out there. But just seeing these these things, you know, in our community and opportunities for um, recreating outside is just um, it's great. And then. Um, and then, yeah, to Council Member Brown's point, you know, we can include ways people can get involved. And then if there's any changes to the website and what new resources on our digital platforms are available so that, you know, people can, can see that um, there is a place where you can go to find out this information online. And, you know, and, and hopefully that will uh, get people motivated and more engaged to check out the parks website more frequently so they can be up to date with everything that's kind of going on and the new programs that become available. And so with that, I'll just end right there. And just again, thank you all for your hard work and for keeping our parks beautiful. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, City Manager Bernal. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to just briefly comment on the topic of fiscal sustainability uh, as it relates to uh, parks. Uh, one of the things that uh, everyone's mentioned is the tremendous assets that we have, which they are in our park system, and uh, the fact that obviously we have to invest quite a bit to maintain them uh, and enhance them, um, and, uh, and they're used quite a bit, so they take quite a bit of ongoing investment. And as you know, with, uh, with the pandemic uh, in particular, it, it really has been uh, a challenge for us to be able to uh, uh, balance our budget generally in the city. Uh, and also it's had a really tremendous impact on the parks uh, uh, department as well, uh, particularly because uh, in addition to having uh, a smaller staff than is the national standard, as was pointed out, we also have had quite a few positions that have been frozen. And so that's had an additional impact. So the level of staffing that we have there is really not sustainable moving forward. And so we really do need to, to come up with a, a fiscal sustainability plan for our general fund, but also our parks department. And in the spirit of that, as we uh, start the process of preparing the budget for next year, uh, and as you know, we did receive some uh, stimulus funding, but that is one time in nature and will help us and gives us time to prepare for the future, but it's not gonna solve our ongoing of fiscal uh, structural deficit. Uh, so in the spirit of, of getting ready for the budget uh, as that's being prepared now for the council to consider, one of the things that we're proposing is to do a, a joint meeting with the Parks and Recreation Commission to uh, really delve and dive into the budget, uh, the parks budget, since the commission also reviews that. So just an opportunity, more of a study session to uh, understand the budget uh, and some of the issues and challenges that the department has and some of the options, uh, again, so that uh, you have the background uh, and knowledge as we uh, uh, move into the budget. And also, as you consider options for revenue enhancements uh, uh, and the community also, I think, would be, uh, it'd be good for the community to also be uh, informed and aware of all the budgetary issues uh, that the Parks Department faces as it is such a critical infrastructure that we have in our community. So that's being scheduled, I think we're looking at April 20th, uh, just tacking that on to the, there's already a, a, an item on the uh, green economy. So we're just gonna add uh, some time to that session to, uh, if we can, to focus uh, uh, on uh, the, the parks budget with the parks commission. So I just wanna point that out. Thank you, Martine. Okay, I will go ahead and bring uh, the, uh, bring this out to the public. Uh, we have one person in the, audience tonight who would like to speak to this item uh, and your phone number ends in 1705. And if you press star six, you'll be unmuted. Thank you, Mayor Myers. This is Eric Rodberg and I want to echo what all councilmen have said of my love of the Parks Department and I appreciate the work of all staff from Director Elliott down to the LUN staff. One thing that hasn't been mentioned is that um, I think the frontline staff has really endured way more than they bargained for this year. And, um, you know, from batteries and, uh, you know, let's, let's just say it straight up. Dealing with the, the homeless situation is, you know, it's bad enough for law enforcement who gets at least paid really good professional wages to the frontline staff and, and they didn't sign up for that. So I just I just wanted to put that out there. But I do appreciate all the hard work that they've done and uh, I do love the parks. I, there is one glaring deficiency, not the pool. And uh, Councilmember Watkins mentioned it. 
we really need a public pool. And uh, if you can't get Harvey West going, could you please talk to the uh, the schools? We support the schools. We have special assessments. We've got parcel taxes. Um, you had an earlier item on your agenda tonight about housing. They have a pool. Um, San Lorenzo Valley High School, they, they allow their pool to be used by the community. Please get something to go in the pool. We, we need a public pool. That is a real basic thing for a community of our size and wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, I will turn it back to um, council members, uh, council member Cummings, and then council member, or vice mayor Bruner. Yeah, I'm happy to move the staff's recommendation, uh, which is to adopt, oops, that's the wrong one, it was the last item, uh, to accept the fiscal year 2020 Parks and Rec annual report. And vice mayor Bruner? I will second that motion. Great. Okay, so we have a motion to accept the 2020 Parks and Recreation Annual Report. And Bonnie, what, why don't we go ahead and take a roll call vote on that? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? An enthusiastic aye. We're all pirates tonight, so that's good. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. And thanks again, Tony and Lindsay, great job. Um, and with that, uh, we are adjourned for the evening. Thank you everyone. Have a um, no, 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 we have public comment, or we have oral communication. Oh, Sorry. Thank you for catching that. I'm used to that coming to four in the uh, at the end. Okay. We have oral communication still to go. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to vote on items that are not on today's agenda. If you're interested in please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comment so that we can accurately capture in the meeting minutes. However, stating your name is not required. So I'll go ahead and take, take this out to public comment. I see two callers in the audience. The first caller is ending in number 5383, please press stars, star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead, please. Good evening, council members. This is Krista Corwin. I would like to talk to you today about your conflict of interest code. And this is in reference to a letter I sent to you on March 3rd, which is a part of the public record. And by the way, anyone can ask to read it. Section eight of the conflict of interest code says, no designated employee shall make or participate in making any governmental decision, which he or she knows will have a reasonably foreseeable material financial effect, distinguishable from its effect on the public generally, on any real property and any source of income. Well, I'm a reasonable person, and it's pretty foreseeable to me that banning camping from residential zones and from the downtown business district will have a financial impact on real property owners and on the downtown business association where Vice Mayor Bruner works. Council members Myers, Bruner, Golder, Kalantari, Johnson, Watkins, and city employees Bernal and Butler, you have read my letter, and you know as well as anybody that enacting the TOLO will have an impact on your personal finances. The good news is that you have a graceful exit strategy at your disposal. It's a very common tool, which could save the city from an expensive lawsuit. You don't need anyone's permission to use it. All you need to do is state for the record that you recuse yourself from the TOLO discussions due to a conflict of interest and sign off of Zoom. At this time, I have two questions for the city's attorney. I believe it's Ms. Bronson. One, has the FP, FPPC 
three, been in contact with the city regarding this issue, and two, what is your opinion on the defensibility of the council members' actions on February 23rd and March 3rd in regards to the TOLO? Thank you. Okay, we have a phone number ending in 1810. Press star six. Yeah, vulnerable children will soon be going to leftist public school indoctrination centers. I'm shocked. The opening paragraph of hundreds of pages of newly proposed as required for graduation ethnic studies classes of K-1 through 12 goals and course outline says it all. Quote, races very broadly break down as people of color and white people. Unquote. Wow. That race division permeates every aspect of a student's indoctrination into various ethnic studies. One guess, which of those two so-called races are fingered as the oppressor, which the victim, in studies of marginalized peoples, institutionalized systems of advantage, bigotry, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, designed to help students acquire a leftist educated social activism dictated by a focus on highlighted concepts such as civic pursuit of justice, equity, race, ethnicity, indigeneity, diversity, inclusivity, discrimination, intersectionality, systems of oppression known as the four eyes, gender and sexuality studies, cultivating racial empathy, cultural perpetuity, placing a high and center value on native people and black indigenous people of color's pre-colonial experiences, critiquing white supremacy, white male power oppression, and challenge imperialist colonial beliefs, never mind those did cease to exist long ago. The focus of teaching goals is justice warrioring and stirring up as many, one guess, white straight male hate divisions they can think of. Devalued are critical thinking and valuable skills needed, and instead students are required to master regurgitation of Marxist-like woke victimology, dogma, air quote, to race or gender studies with selective interpretations of stale history where the real reality is a declining relevance or legitimacy. What could possibly go wrong with that? And when is the mayor's proclamation of straight white male appreciation day? Thanks. Next up is a caller with phone number ending in 1705. Uh, good evening, Mayor Myers. This is Eric Grogberg again. Thank you for taking my comments. Um, I'm sorry to sound like a broken record. On March 17th, the UC Regents approved the Student Housing West project, which uh, will, um, well, a number of Regents at the meeting expressed skepticism over the affordability issue. The only reason they approved it was on Chancellor Reeves a personal guarantee that the prices would be 30% below market. That is a gross misrepresentation. As I've provided on numerous occasions to council, documentation from the city's own housing demand study, I mean the university's own housing demand study, the prices are actually two to 300% above market values uh, rates. For example, a one bedroom, one bath is projected for 2018 prices to come in at $3,540 a month. A five bedroom, two bath is projected to come in at $10,220 a month. Um, let me repeat that, $10,220 a month. Now you might think because we need housing so much and I mean I definitely support more housing on campus. You might think that any housing on campus is great, but what will happen is that the students, because the housing is so expensive on campus, they will not, not occupy it fully. So they'll put more demand on the community housing. And um, like I said, the only reason the, the reasons approved it was on Chancellor Marie's personal representation that would come in 30% below market. So I really urge you to um, press the university on this. I've, I've sent you the, the documentation. Um, if you, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, I will bring it back. Um, Councilmember Cummings, did you have a question about oral communications? Yeah, I just wanted to see if um, Cassie or somebody from the city attorney's office might be able to comment on the questions that the one member of the public brought up. And so just wanted to ask those questions on her behalf. Okay. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm 
happy to give a quick explanation. Um, um, generally, um, with respect to conflict of interest, there's an exception um, or non-applicability for items that are applicable to the public generally. And so uh, that's the determination that we've made, which is that um, the action in question, uh, the TOLO was um, reached a high enough threshold to be applicable to the public generally to where there would be uh, no conflict of interest um, under the law. So that's the high level. I'm happy to um, give you some more information offline. Okay, thank you, Kathy. And with that, um, I will adjourn the meeting and uh, we'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Goodbye.